Chapter 1 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 1 The World Outside and the Pictures in Our Heads. There is an island in the ocean where in 1914 a few Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Germans lived. No cable reaches that island, and the British mail steamer comes but once in sixty days. In September it had not yet come, and the islanders were still talking about the latest newspaper, which told about the approaching trial of Madame Caillot for the shooting of Gaston Comet. It was, therefore, with more than usual eagerness, that the whole colony assembled at the quay on a day in mid-September to hear from the captain what the verdict had been. They learned that for over six weeks now those of them who were English and those of them who were French had been fighting on behalf of the sanctity of treaties against those of them who were Germans. For six strange weeks they had acted as if they were friends when in fact they were enemies. But their plight was not so different from that of most of the population of Europe. They had been mistaken for six weeks. On the continent the interval may have been only six days or six hours. There was an interval. There was a moment when the picture of Europe on which men were conducting their business as usual did not in any way correspond to the Europe which was about to make a jumble of their lives. There was a time for each man when he was still adjusted to the environment that no longer existed. All over the world, as late as July 25th, men were making goods that they would not be able to ship, buying goods that they would not be able to import, careers were being planned, enterprises contemplated, hopes and expectations entertained, all in the belief that the world as known was the world as it was. Men were writing books describing that world. They trusted the picture in their heads. And then, over four years later, on a Thursday morning, came the news of an armistice, and people gave vent to their unutterable relief that the slaughter was over. Yet in the five days before the real armistice came, though the end of the war had been celebrated, several thousand young men died on the battlefields. Looking back, we can see how indirectly we know the environment in which nevertheless we live. We can see that the news of it comes to us now fast, now slowly, but whatever we believe to be a true picture, we treat it as if it were the environment itself. It is harder to remember that about the beliefs upon which we are now acting, but in respect to other peoples and other ages, we flatter ourselves that it is easy to see when they were in deadly earnest about ludicrous pictures of the world. We insist because of our superior hindsight, that the world as they needed to know it, and the world as they did know it, were often two quite contradictory things. We can see, too, that while they governed and fought, traded and reformed in the world as they imagined it to be, they produced results, or failed to produce any, in the world as it was. They started for the Indies and found America. They diagnosed evil and hanged old women. They thought they could grow rich by always selling and never buying. A caliph, obeying what he conceived to be the will of Allah, burned the library at Alexandria. Writing about the year 389, St. Ambrose stated the case for the prisoner in Plato's cave, who resolutely declines to turn his head. Quote, to discuss the nature and position of the earth does not help us in our hope of the life to come. It is enough to know what scripture states. Quote, that he hung up the earth upon nothing. End quote. Job 26.7 why then argue whether he hung it up in the air or upon the water, and raise a controversy as to how the thin air could sustain the earth, or why, if upon the waters, the earth does not go crashing down to the bottom? Not because the earth is in the middle, as if suspended on even balance, but because the majesty of God constrains it by the law of his will, does it endure stable upon the unstable and the void. End quote. Footnote. Hexameron. 1. 6. Quoted in the medieval mind, by Henry Osborne Taylor, Volume 1, page 73. It does not help us in our hope of the life to come. It is enough to know what Scripture states. Why then argue? But a century and a half after St. Ambrose, opinion was still troubled, on this occasion, by the problem of the antipodes. A monk named Cosmas, famous for his scientific attainments, was therefore deputed to write a Christian topography, or, quote, Christian opinion concerning the world, end quote. Footnote, Lecky, Rationalism in Europe, Volume 1, pages 276 to 278. It is clear that he knew exactly what was expected of him, 
for he based all his conclusions on the scriptures as he read them. It appears, then, that the world is a flat parallelogram, twice as broad from east to west as it is long from north to south. In the center is the earth surrounded by ocean, which is in turn surrounded by another earth where men lived before the deluge. This other earth was Noah's port of embarkation. In the north is a high conical mountain around which revolve the sun and moon. When the sun is behind the mountain, it is night. The sky is glued to the edges of the outer earth. It consists of four high walls, which meet in a concave roof, so that the earth is the floor of the universe. There is an ocean on the other side of the sky, constituting the waters that are above the firmament. The space between the celestial ocean and the ultimate roof of the universe belongs to the blessed. The space between the earth and the sky is inhabited by the angels. Finally, since St. Paul said that all men are made to live upon the face of the earth, how could they live on the back, where the antipodes are supposed to be? With such a passage before his eyes, a Christian, we are told, should not even speak of the antipodes. Footnote, cited above. Far less should he go to the antipodes, nor should any Christian prince give him a ship to try, nor would any pious mariner wish to try. For Cosmos, there was nothing in the least absurd about his map. Only by remembering his absolute conviction that this was the map of the universe, can we begin to understand how he would have dreaded Magellan, or Peary, or the aviator who risked a collision with the angels and the vault of heaven by flying seven miles up in the air. In the same way we can best understand the furies of war and politics, by remembering that almost the whole of each party believes absolutely in its picture of the opposition, that it takes as fact, not what is, but what is supposed to be the fact, and that, therefore, like Hamlet, it will stab Polonius behind the rustling curtain, thinking him the king, and perhaps, like Hamlet, add, quote, Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool, farewell. I took thee for thy better, take thy fortune. End quote. Great men, even during their lifetime, are usually known to the public only through a fictitious personality. Hence the modicum of truth in the old saying that no man is a hero to his valet. There is only a modicum of truth, for the valet and the private secretary are often immersed in the fiction themselves. Royal personages are, of course, constructed personalities. Whether they themselves believe in their public character, or whether they merely permit the Chamberlain to stage-manage it, there are at least two distinct selves, the public and regal self, the private and human. The biographies of great people fall more or less readily into the histories of these two selves. The official biographer reproduces the public life, the revealing memoir, the other. The Charnwood Lincoln, for example, is a noble portrait, not of an actual human being, but of an epic figure, replete with significance, who moves on much the same level of reality as Aeneas or St. George. Oliver's Hamilton is a majestic abstraction, the sculpture of an idea, an essay, as Mr. Oliver himself calls it, on American Union. It is a formal monument to the statecraft of federalism, hardly the biography of a person. Sometimes people create their own facade when they think they are revealing the interior scene. The Reppington Diaries and Margot Asquith's are a species of self-portraiture, in which the intimate detail is most revealing as an index of how the authors like to think about themselves. But the most interesting kind of portraiture is that which arises spontaneously in people's minds. When Victoria came to the throne, says Mr. Strachey, footnote, Lydon Strachey, Queen Victoria, page 72, quote, among the outside public there was a great wave of enthusiasm. Sentiment and romance were coming into fashion, and the spectacle of the little girl queen, innocent, modest, with fair hair and pink cheeks, driving through her capital, filled the hearts of the beholders with raptures of affectionate loyalty. What above all struck everybody with overwhelming force was the contrast between Queen Victoria and her uncles. The nasty old men, debauched and selfish, pig-headed and ridiculous, with their perpetual burden of debts, confusions, and disreputabilities, they had vanished like the snows of winter and here at last, crowned and radiant, was the spring. End quote. Jean de Pierrefeu, footnote, three years at general headquarters, pages 94 to 95, saw hero worship at first hand, for he was an officer on Joffre's staff at the moment of the soldier's greatest fame. Quote, for two years, the entire world paid an almost divine homage to the victor of the main. 
The baggage master literally bent under the weight of the boxes, of the packages, and letters, which unknown people sent him with a frantic testimonial of their admiration. I think that outside of General Joffre, no commander in the war has been able to realize a comparable idea of what glory is. They sent him boxes of candy from all the great confectioners of the world, boxes of champagne, fine wines of every vintage, fruits, game, ornaments and utensils, clothes, smoking materials, inkstands, and paperweights. Every territory sent its specialty. The painter sent his picture, the sculpture his statuette, the dear old lady a comforter or socks, the shepherd in his hut carved a pipe for his sake. All the manufacturers of the world who were hostile to Germany shipped their products, Havana its cigars, Portugal its port wine. I have known a hairdresser who had nothing better to do than to make a portrait of the general out of hair, belonging to persons who were dear to him. A professional penman had the same idea, but the features were composed of thousands of little phrases in tiny characters, which sang the praise of the general. As to letters, he had them in all scripts, from all countries, written in every dialect, affectionate letters, grateful, overflowing with love, filled with adoration. They called him savior of the world, father of his country, agent of God, benefactor of humanity, etc., and not only Frenchmen, but Americans, Argentinians, Australians, etc., etc. Thousands of little children, without their parents' knowledge, took pen in hand and wrote to tell him their love. Most of them called him our father. And there was poignancy about their effusions, their adoration, these sighs of deliverance that escaped from thousands of hearts at the defeat of barbarism. To all these naif little souls, Joffre seemed like St. George crushing the dragon. Certainly he incarnated for the conscience of mankind the victory of good over evil, of light over darkness. Lunatics, simpletons, the half-crazy and the crazy, turned their darkened brains toward him as toward reason itself. I have read the letter of a person living in Sydney, who begged the general to save him from his enemies. Another, a New Zealander, requested him to send some soldiers to the house of a gentleman who owed him ten pounds and would not pay. Finally, some hundreds of young girls, overcoming the timidity of their sex, asked for engagements, their families not to know about it, others wished only to serve him. End quote. The ideal Joffre was compounded out of the victory won by him, his staff and his troops, the despair of the war, the personal sorrows, and the hope of future victory. But beside hero worship there is the exorcism of devils. By the same mechanism through which heroes are incarnated, devils are made. If everything good was to come from Joffre, Foch, Wilson, or Roosevelt, everything evil originated in the Kaiser Wilhelm, Lenin, and Trotsky. They were as omnipotent for evil as the heroes were omnipotent for good. To many simple and frightened minds, there was no political reverse, no strike, no obstruction, no mysterious death or mysterious conflagration anywhere in the world, to which the causes did not wind back to these personal sources of evil. Worldwide concentration of this kind on a symbolic personality is rare enough to be clearly remarkable, and every author has a weakness for the striking and irrefutable example. The vivisection of war reveals such examples, but it does not make them out of nothing. In a more normal public life, symbolic pictures are no less governant of behavior, but each symbol is far less inclusive because there are so many competing ones. Not only is each symbol charged with less feeling, because at most, it represents only a part of the population, but even within that part, there is infinitely less suppression of individual difference. The symbols of public opinion, in times of moderate security, are subject to check and comparison and argument. They come and go, coalesce, and are forgotten, never organizing perfectly the emotion of the whole group. There is, after all, just one human activity left in which the whole populations accomplish the Union Sacre. It occurs in those middle phases of a war when fear, pugnacity, and hatred have secured complete dominion of the spirit, either to crush every other instinct or to enlist it, and before wariness is felt. At almost all other times, even in war when it is deadlocked, a sufficiently greater range of feelings is aroused to establish conflict, choice, hesitation, and compromise. The symbolism of public opinion usually bears, as we shall see, footnote, see part 5, the marks of this balancing of interest. Think, for example, of how rapidly after the armistice, the precarious and by no means successfully established symbol of allied unity disappeared, how it was followed almost immediately 
by the breakdown of each nation's symbolic picture of the other, Britain, the defender of public law, France, watching at the frontier of freedom, America, the crusader. And think, then, of how within each nation the symbolic picture of itself frayed out, as party and class conflict and personal ambition began to stir postponed issues. And then of how the symbolic pictures of the leaders gave way, as one by one, Wilson, Clemenceau, Lloyd George, ceased to be the incarnation of human hope, and became merely the negotiators and administrators for a disillusioned world. Whether we regret this as one of the soft evils of peace, or applaud it as a return to sanity, is obviously no matter here. Our first concern with fictions and symbols is to forget their value to the existing social order, and to think of them simply as an important part of the machinery of human communication. Now in any society that is not completely self-contained in its interests, and so small that everyone can know all about everything that happens, ideas deal with events that are out of sight and hard to grasp. Miss Sherwin of Gopher Prairie, footnote, C. Sinclair Lewis, Main Street, is aware that a war is raging in France and tries to conceive it. She has never been to France, and certainly she has never been along what is now the battlefront. Pictures of French and German soldiers she has seen, but it is impossible for her to imagine three million men. No one, in fact, can imagine them, and the professionals do not try. They think of them as, say, two hundred divisions. But Miss Sherwin has no access to the order of battle maps, so if she is to think about the war, she fastens upon Joffre and the Kaiser, as if they were engaged in a personal duel. Perhaps, if you could see what she sees with her mind's eye, the image in its composition might be not unlike an eighteenth-century engraving of a great soldier. He stands there boldly, unruffled, and more than life-size, with a shadowy army of tiny little figures winding off into the landscape behind. Nor, it seems, are great men oblivious to these expectations. Pierre Fou tells of a photographer's visit to Joffre. The general was in his, quote, middle-class office, before the work table without papers, where he sat down to write his signature. Suddenly it was noticed that there were no maps on the walls. But since according to popular ideas, it is not possible to think of a general without maps, a few were placed in position for the picture, and removed soon afterwards. End quote. Footnote, cited above, page 99. The only feeling that anyone can have about an event he does not experience is the feeling aroused by his mental image of that event. That is why, until we know what others think they know, we cannot truly understand their acts. I have seen a young girl, brought up in a Pennsylvania mining town, plunged suddenly from entire cheerfulness into a paroxysm of grief, when a gust of wind cracked the kitchen window pane. For hours she was inconsolable, and to me incomprehensible. But when she was able to talk, it transpired that if a window pane broke, it meant that a close relative had died. She was, therefore, mourning for her father, who had frightened her into running away from home. The father was, of course, quite thoroughly alive, as a telegraphic inquiry soon proved. But until the telegram came, the cracked glass was an authentic message to that girl. Why it was authentic only a prolonged investigation by a skilled psychiatrist could show. But even the most casual observer could see that the girl, enormously upset by her family troubles, had hallucinated a complete fiction out of one external fact, a remembered superstition, and a turmoil of remorse, and fear and love for her father. Abnormality in these instances is only a matter of degree. When an attorney general, who has been frightened by a bomb exploded on his doorstep, convinces himself by the reading of revolutionary literature that a revolution is to happen on the 1st of May, 1920, we recognize that much the same mechanism is at work. The war, of course, furnished many examples of this pattern, the casual fact, the creative imagination, the will to believe, and out of these three elements, a counterfeit of reality to which there was a violent instinctive response. For it is clear enough that under certain conditions, men respond as powerfully to fictions as they do to realities, and that in many cases they help to create the very fictions to which they respond. Let him cast the first stone who did not believe in the Russian army that passed through England in August, 1914, did not accept any tale of atrocities without direct proof, and never saw a plot, a traitor, or a spy, where there was none. Let him cast a stone who never passed on as the real inside truth, what he had heard someone say who knew no more than he did. In all these instances we must note particularly one common factor. 
It is the insertion between man and his environment of a pseudo-environment. To that pseudo-environment his behavior is a response. But because it is behavior, the consequences, if they are acts, operate not in the pseudo-environment where the behavior is stimulated, but in the real environment where action eventuates. If the behavior is not a practical act, but what we call roughly thought and emotion, it may be a long time before there is any noticeable break in the texture of the fictitious world. But when the stimulus of the pseudo fact results in action on things or other people, contradiction soon develops. Then comes the sensation of butting one's head against a stone wall, of learning by experience, and witnessing Herbert Spencer's tragedy of the murder of a beautiful theory by a gang of brutal facts, the discomfort in short of a maladjustment. For certainly, at the level of social life, what is called the adjustment of man to his environment takes place through the medium of fictions. By fictions I do not mean lies, I mean a representation of the environment, which is in lesser or greater degree made by man himself. The range of fiction extends all the way from complete hallucination to the scientist's perfectly self-conscious use of a schematic model, or his decision that for his particular problem, accuracy beyond a certain number of decimal places is not important. A work of fiction may have almost any degree of fidelity, and so long as the degree of fidelity can be taken into account, fiction is not misleading. In fact, human culture is very largely the selection, the rearrangement, the tracing of patterns upon, and the stylizing of, what William James called, quote, the random irradiations and resettlements of our ideas, end quote. Footnote, James, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, page 638. The alternative to the use of fictions is direct exposure to the ebb and flow of sensation. That is not a real alternative, for however refreshing it is to see at times with a perfectly innocent eye, innocence itself is not wisdom, though a source and corrective of wisdom. For the real environment is altogether too big, too complex, and too fleeting for direct acquaintance. We are not equipped to deal with so much subtlety, so much variety, so many permutations and combinations. And although we have to act in that environment, we have to reconstruct it on a simpler model before we can manage with it. To traverse the world, men must have maps of the world. Their persistent difficulty is to secure maps on which their own need, or someone else's need, has not been sketched on the coast of Bohemia. The analyst of public opinion must begin, then, by recognizing the triangular relationship between the scene of action, the human picture of that scene, and the human response to that picture working itself out upon the scene of action. It is like a play suggested to the actors by their own experience, in which the plot is transacted in the real lives of the actors, and not merely in their stage parts. The moving picture often emphasizes with great skill this double drama of interior motive and external behavior. Two men are quarreling, ostensibly about some money, but their passion is inexplicable. Then the picture fades out, and what one or the other of the two men sees with his mind's eye is reenacted. Across the table they were quarreling about money. In memory they are back in their youth, when the girl jilted him for the other man. The exterior drama is explained. The hero is not greedy, the hero is in love. A scene not so different was played out in the United States Senate. At breakfast on the morning of September 29, 1919, some of the senators read a news dispatch in the Washington Post about the landing of American Marines on the Dalmatian coast. The newspaper said, Facts now established. Quote, the following important facts appear already established. The orders to Rear Admiral Andrews commanding the American naval forces in the Adriatic came from the British Admiralty via the War Council and Rear Admiral Knapps in London. The approval or disapproval of the American Navy Department was not asked. Without Daniels' knowledge. Quote, Mr. Daniels was admittedly placed in a peculiar position when cables reached here stating that the forces over which he is presumed to have exclusive control were carrying on what amounted to naval warfare without his knowledge. It was fully realized that the British Admiralty might desire to issue orders to Rear Admiral Andrews to act on behalf of Great Britain and her allies because the situation required sacrifice on the part of some nation if Denunzio's followers were to be held in check. It was further realized that under the new League of Nations plan, Foreigners would be in a position to direct American naval forces in emergencies, with or without the consent of the American Navy Department, end quote, etc. The first senator to comment is Mr. Knox of Pennsylvania. Indignantly, he demands investigation. 
In Mr. Brandegy of Connecticut, who spoke next, indignation has already stimulated credulity. Where Mr. Knox indignantly wishes to know if the report is true, Mr. Brandegy, a half minute later, would like to know what would have happened if Marines had been killed. Mr. Knox, interested in the question, forgets that he asked for an inquiry, and replies, If American Marines had been killed, it would be war. The mood of the debate is still conditional. Debate proceeds. Mr. McCormick of Illinois reminds the Senate that the Wilson administration is prone to the waging of small unauthorized wars. He repeats Theodore Roosevelt's quip about waging peace. More debate. Mr. Brandegy notes that the Marines acted, quote, under orders of a Supreme Council sitting somewhere, end quote, but he cannot recall who represents the United States on that body. The Supreme Council is unknown to the Constitution of the United States. Therefore, Mr. New of Indiana submits a resolution calling for the facts. So far, the senators still recognize, vaguely, that they are discussing a rumor. Being lawyers, they still remember some of the forms of evidence. But as red-blooded men, they already experience all the indignation which is appropriate to the fact that American Marines have been ordered into war by a foreign government and without the consent of Congress. Emotionally, they want to believe it, because they are Republicans fighting the League of Nations. This arouses the Democratic leader, Mr. Hitchcock of Nebraska. He defends the Supreme Council. It was acting under the war powers. Peace has not yet been concluded because the Republicans are delaying it. Therefore, the action was necessary and legal. Both sides now assume that the report is true, and the conclusions they draw are the conclusions of their partisanship. Yet this extraordinary assumption is in a debate over a resolution to investigate the truth of the assumption. It reveals how difficult it is, even for trained lawyers, to suspend response until the returns are in. The response is instantaneous. The fiction is taken for truth because the fiction is badly needed. A few days later, an official report showed that the Marines were not landed by order of the British government or of the Supreme Council. They had not been fighting the Italians. They had been landed at the request of the Italian government to protect Italians, and the American commander had been officially thanked by the Italian authorities. The Marines were not at war with Italy. They had acted according to an established international practice, which had nothing to do with the League of Nations. The scene of action was the Adriatic. The picture of that scene in the senators' heads at Washington was furnished, in this case, probably with intent to deceive, by a man who cared nothing about the Adriatic, but much about defeating the League. To this picture the Senate responded by a strengthening of its partisan differences over the League. Whether in this particular case, the Senate was above or below its normal standard, it is not necessary to decide. Nor whether the Senate compares favorably with the House, or with other parliaments. At the moment, I should like to think only about the worldwide spectacle of men acting upon their environment, moved by stimuli from their suedo environments. For in full allowance has been made for deliberate fraud, political science has still to account for such facts as two nations attacking one another, each convinced that it is acting in self-defense, or two classes at war, each certain that it speaks for the common interest. They live, as we are likely to say, in different worlds. More accurately, they live in the same world, but they think and feel in different ones. It is to these special worlds, it is to these private or group, or class, or provincial, or occupational, or national, or sectarian artifacts, that the political adjustment of mankind in the great society takes place. Their variety and complication are impossible to describe. Yet these fictions determine a very great part of men's political behavior. We must think of perhaps 50 sovereign parliaments consisting of at least a 100 legislative bodies. With them belong at least 50 hierarchies of provincial and municipal assemblies, with which their executive, administrative, and legislative organs constitute formal authority on earth. But that does not begin to reveal the complexity of political life. For in each of these innumerable centers of authority there are parties, and these parties are themselves hierarchies with their roots in classes, sections, cliques, and clans, and within these are the individual politicians, each the personal center of a web of connection and memory and fear and hope. Somehow or another, for reasons often necessarily obscure, as the result of domination or compromise or a log roll, there emerge from these political bodies commands, which set armies in motion or make peace, conscript life, tax, exile, imprison, 
protect property or confiscate it, encourage one kind of enterprise and discourage another, facilitate immigration or obstruct it, improve communication or censor it, establish schools, build navies, proclaim policies and destiny, raise economic barriers, make property or unmake it, build one people under the rule of another, or favor one class as against another. For each of these decisions, some view of the facts is taken to be conclusive, some view of the circumstances is accepted as the basis of interference and as the stimulus of feeling. What view of the facts, and why that one? And yet even this does not begin to exhaust the real complexity. The formal political structure exists in a social environment where there are innumerable large and small corporations and institutions, voluntary and semi-voluntary associations, national, provincial, urban and neighborhood groupings, which often as not make the decision that the political body registers. On what are these decisions based? Quote, modern society, says Mr. Chesterton, is intrinsically insecure because it is based on the notion that all men will do the same thing for different reasons, and as within the head of any convict may be the hell of a quite solitary crime, so in the house or under the hat of any suburban clerk may be the limbo of a quite separate philosophy. The first man may be a complete materialist and feel his own body as a horrible machine, manufacturing his own mind. He may listen to his thoughts as to the dull ticking of a clock. The man next door may be a Christian scientist, and regard his own body as somehow rather less substantial than his own shadow. He may come to regard his own arms and legs as delusions, like moving serpents in the dream of delirium tremens. The third man in the street may not be a Christian scientist, but, on the contrary, a Christian. He may live in a fairy tale, as his neighbors would say, a secret but solid fairy tale full of the faces and presences of unearthly friends. The fourth man may be a theosophist, and only too probably a vegetarian, and I do not see why I should not gratify myself with the fancy that the fifth man is a devil worshipper. Now whether or not this sort of variety is valuable, this sort of unity is shaky. To expect that all men for all time will go on thinking different things, and yet doing the same things, is doubtful speculation. It is not founding society on a communion, or even on a convention, but rather on a coincidence. Four men may meet under the same lamppost, one to paint it pea green as part of a great municipal reform, one to read his breviary in the light of it, one to embrace it with accidental ardor in a fit of alcoholic enthusiasm, and the last merely because the pea green post is a conspicuous point of rendezvous with his young lady. But to expect this to happen night after night is unwise. End quote. Footnote, G. K. Chesterton, The Mad Hatter and the Sane Householder, Vanity Fair, January, 1921, page 54. For the four men at the lamppost substitute the governments, the parties, the corporations, the societies, the social sets, the trades and professions, universities, sects, and nationalities of the world. Think of the legislator voting a statute that will affect distant peoples, a statesman coming to a decision. Think of the peace conference, reconstituting the frontiers of Europe, an ambassador in a foreign country, trying to discern the intentions of his own government and of the foreign government, a promoter working a concession in a backward country, an editor demanding a war, a clergyman calling on the police to regulate amusement, a club lounging room making up its mind about a strike, a sewing circle preparing to regulate the schools, nine judges deciding whether a legislature in Oregon may fix the working hours of women, a cabinet meeting to decide on the recognition of a government, a party convention choosing a candidate and writing a platform, 27 million voters casting their ballots, an Irishman in Cork thinking about an Irishman in Belfast, a third international planning to reconstruct the whole of human society, a board of directors confronted with a set of their employees' demands, a boy choosing a career, a merchant estimating supply and demand for the coming season, a speculator predicting the course of the market, a banker deciding whether to put credit behind a new enterprise, the advertiser, the reader of advertisements. Think of the different sorts of Americans thinking about their notions of the British Empire, or France, or Russia, or Mexico. It is not so different from Mr. Chesterton's four men at the pea gris lamppost. And so, before we involve ourselves in the jungle of obscurities about the innate differences of men, we shall do well to fix our attention upon the extraordinary differences in what men know of the world. Footnote, C. Wallace, Our Social Heritage, page 77, and the following. I do not doubt that there are important biological differences. Since man is an animal, it would be strange if there were not. 
But as rational beings, it is worse than shallow to generalize at all about comparative behavior until there is a measurable similarity between the environments to which behavior is a response. The pragmatic value of this idea is that it introduces a much-needed refinement into the ancient controversy about nature and nurture, innate quality and environment. For the pseudo-environment is a hybrid, compounded of human nature and conditions. To my mind it shows the uselessness of pontificating about what man is, and always will be, from what we observe man to be doing, or about what are the necessary conditions of society. For we do not know how men would behave, in response to the facts of the great society. All that we really know is how they behave, in response to what can fairly be called a most inadequate picture of the great society. No conclusion about man, or the great society, can honestly be made on evidence like that. This, then, will be the clue to our inquiry. We shall assume that what each man does is based not on direct and certain knowledge, but on pictures made by himself or given to him. If his atlas tells him that the world is flat, he will not sail near what he believes to be the edge of our planet, for fear of falling off. If his maps include a fountain of eternal youth, a Ponce de Leon will go in quest of it. If someone digs up yellow dirt that looks like gold, he will for a time act exactly as if he had found gold. The way in which the world is imagined determines at any particular moment what men will do. It does not determine what they will achieve. It determines their effort, their feelings, their hopes, not their accomplishments and results. The very men who most loudly proclaim their materialism and their contempt for ideologues, the Marxian communists, place their entire hope on what? On the formation by propaganda of a class-conscious group. But what is propaganda, if not the effort to alter the picture by which men respond, to substitute one social pattern for another? What is class consciousness but a way of realizing the world? National consciousness but another way? And Professor Gidding's consciousness of kind, but a process of believing that we recognize among the multitude, certain ones marked as our kind. Try to explain social life as the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. You will soon be saying that the hedonist begs the question, for even supposing that man does pursue these ends, the crucial problem of why he thinks one course rather than another likely to produce pleasure is untouched. Does the guidance of man's conscience explain? How then does he happen to have the particular conscience which he has? The theory of economic self-interest? But how do men come to conceive their interest in one way rather than another? The desire for security, or prestige, or domination, or what is vaguely called self-realization? How do men conceive their security? What do they consider prestige? How do they figure out the means of domination? Or what is the notion of self which they wish to realize? Pleasure, pain, conscience, acquisition, protection, enhancement, mastery, are undoubtedly names for some of the ways people act. There may be instinctive dispositions which work towards such ends. But no statement of the end, or any description of the tendencies to seek it, can explain the behavior which results. The very fact that men theorize at all is proof of their pseudo environments, their interior representations of the world, are a determining element in thought, feeling, and action. For if the connection between reality and human response were direct and immediate, rather than indirect and inferred, indecision and failure would be unknown, and if each of us fitted as snugly into the world as the child in the womb, Mr. Bernard Shaw would not have been able to say that except for the first nine months of its existence, no human being manages its affairs as well as a plant. The chief difficulty in adapting the psychoanalytic scheme to political thought arises in this connection. The Freudians are concerned with the maladjustment of distinct individuals to other individuals and to concrete circumstances. They have assumed that if internal derangements could be straightened out, there would be little or no confusion about what is the obviously normal relationship. But public opinion deals with indirect, unseen, and puzzling facts and there is nothing obvious about them. The situations to which public opinions refer are known only as opinions. The psychoanalyst, on the other hand, almost always assumes that the environment is knowable, and if not knowable then at least bearable, to any unclouded intelligence. This assumption of his is the problem of public opinion. Instead of taking for granted an environment that is readily known, the social analyst is most concerned in studying how the larger political environment is conceived, and how it can be conceived more successfully. The psychoanalyst examines the adjustment to an X, called by him the environment. The social analyst examines the X, called by him the pseudo-environment. 
He is, of course, permanently and constantly in debt to the new psychology, not only because when rightly applied it so greatly helps people to stand on their own feet, come what may, but because the study of dreams, fantasy, and realization has thrown light on how the pseudo environment is put together. But he cannot assume as his criterion either what is called a normal biological career, footnote, Edward J. Kempf, Psychopathology, page 116, within the existing social order, or a career, quote, freed from religious suppression and dogmatic conventions, end quote, outside, footnote, cited above, page 151. What for a sociologist is a normal social career? Or one freed from suppressions and conventions? Conservative critics do, to be sure, assume the first, and romantic ones the second. But in assuming them, they are taking the whole world for granted. They are saying, in effect, either that society is the sort of thing which corresponds to their idea of what is normal, or the sort of thing which corresponds to their idea of what is free. Both ideas are merely public opinions, and while the psychoanalyst as physician may perhaps assume them, the sociologist may not take the products of existing public opinion as criteria by which to study public opinion. The world that we have to deal with politically is out of reach, out of sight, out of mind. It has to be explored, reported, and imagined. Man is no Aristotelian god contemplating all existence at one glance. He is the creature of an evolution who can just about span a sufficient portion of reality to manage his survival and snatch what, on a scale of time, are but a few moments of insight and happiness. Yet this same creature has invented ways of seeing what no naked eye could see, of hearing what no ear could hear, of weighing immense masses and infinitesimal ones, of counting and separating more items than he could individually remember. He is learning to see with his mind vast portions of the world that he could never see, touch, smell, hear, or remember. Gradually he makes for himself a trustworthy picture inside his head of the world beyond his reach. Those features of the world outside which have to do with the behavior of other human beings, insofar as that behavior crosses ours, is dependent upon us, or is interesting to us, we call roughly public affairs. The pictures inside the heads of these human beings, the pictures of themselves, of others, of their needs, purposes, and relationship, are their public opinions. Those pictures which are acted upon by groups of people, or by individuals acting in the name of groups, are public opinion with capital letters. And so, in the chapters which follow, we shall inquire first into some of the reasons why the picture inside so often misleads men in their dealings with the world outside. Under this heading, we shall consider first the chief factors which limit their access to the facts. They are the artificial censorships, the limitations of social contract, the comparatively meager time available in each day for paying attention to public affairs, the distortion arising because events have to be compressed into very short messages, the difficulty of making a small vocabulary express a complicated world, and finally the fear of facing those facts which would seem to threaten the established routine of men's lives. The analysis then turns from these more or less external limitations to the question of how this trickle of messages from the outside is affected by the stored-up images, the preconceptions, and prejudices which interpret, fill them out, and in their turn, powerfully direct the play of our attention and our vision itself. From this, it proceeds to examine how, in the individual person, the limited messages from outside, formed into a pattern of stereotypes, are identified with his own interests as he feels and conceives them. In the succeeding sections, it examines how opinions are crystallized into what is called public opinion, how a national will, a group mind, a social purpose, or whatever you choose to call it, is formed. The first five parts constitute the descriptive section of the book. There follows an analysis of the traditional democratic theory of public opinion. The substance of the argument is that democracy in its original form never seriously faced the problem which arises, because the pictures inside people's heads do not automatically correspond with the world outside. And then, because the democratic theory is under criticism by socialist thinkers, there follows an examination of the most advanced and coherent of these criticisms, as made by the English Guild Socialists. My purpose here is to find out whether these reformers take into account the main difficulties of public opinion. My conclusion is that they ignore the difficulties, as completely as did the original Democrats, because they, too, assume, and in a much more complicated civilization, that somehow mysteriously there exists in the hearts of men a knowledge of the world beyond their reach. I argue that representative government, either in what is ordinarily called politics, 
or an industry, cannot be worked successfully, no matter what the basis of election, unless there is an independent, expert organization for making the unseen facts intelligible to those who have to make the decisions. I attempt, therefore, to argue that the serious acceptance of the principle that personal representation must be supplemented by representation of the unseen facts would alone permit a satisfactory decentralization and allow us to escape from the intolerable and unworkable fiction that each of us must acquire a competent opinion about all public affairs. It is argued that the problem of the press is confused because the critics and the apologists expect the press to realize this fiction, expect it to make up for all that was not foreseen in the theory of democracy, and that the readers expect this miracle to be performed at no cost or trouble to themselves. The newspapers are regarded by Democrats as a panacea for their own defects, whereas analysts of the nature of news and of the economic basis of journalism seems to show that the newspapers necessarily and inevitably reflect, and therefore, in greater or lesser measure, intensify, the defective organization of public opinion. My conclusion is that public opinions must be organized for the press, if they are to be sound, not by the press as is the case today. This organization I conceive to be the first instance, the task of a political science that has won its proper place as formulator, in advance of real decision, instead of apologist, critic, or reporter, after the decision has been made. I try to indicate that the perplexities of government and industry are conspiring to give political science this enormous opportunity to enrich itself and to serve the public. And, of course, I hope that these pages will help a few people to realize that opportunity more vividly, and therefore to pursue it more consciously. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Chapter 2 Censorship and Privacy. The picture of a general presiding over an editorial conference at the most terrible hour of one of the great battles of history seems more like a scene from the chocolate soldier than a page from life. Yet we know at first hand from the officer who edited the French communiques that these conferences were a regular part of the business of war, that in the worst moment of Verdun, General Joffre and his cabinet met and argued over the nouns, adjectives, and verbs that were to be printed in the newspapers the next morning. Quote, the evening communique of the 23rd, February, 1916, end quote, says M. D. Pierre Fou, footnote, GQG, pages 126 to 129, quote, was edited in a dramatic atmosphere. M. Berthelot, of the Prime Minister's office, had just telephoned by order of the minister, asking General Pelle to strengthen the report and to emphasize the proportions of the enemy's attack. It was necessary to prepare the public for the worst outcome in case the affair turned into a catastrophe. This anxiety showed clearly that neither at GHQ nor at the Ministry of War had the government found reason for confidence. As M. Berthelot spoke, General Pelle made notes. He handed me the paper on which he had written the government's wishes, together with the order of the day issued by General von Deimling and found on some prisoners, in which it was stated that this attack was the supreme offensive to secure peace. Skillfully used, all this was to demonstrate that Germany was letting loose a gigantic effort, an effort without precedent, and that from its success she hoped for the end of the war. The logic of this was that nobody needed to be surprised at our withdrawal. When, a half hour later, I went down with my manuscript, I found gathered together in Colonel Claudel's office, he being away, the Major General, General Janine, Colonel Dupont, and Lieutenant Colonel Renard. Fearing that I would not succeed in giving the desired impression, General Pelle had himself prepared a proposed communique. I read what I had just done. It was found to be too moderate. General Pelle's, on the other hand, seemed too alarming. I had purposely omitted von Deimling's order of the day. To put it into the communique would be to break with the formula to which the public was accustomed, would be to transform it into a kind of pleading. It would seem to say, how do you suppose we can resist? 
there was reason to fear that the public would be distracted by this change of tone, and would believe that everything was lost. I explained my reasons and suggested giving Daimling's text to the newspapers in the form of a separate note. Quote, Opinion being divided, General Pelle went to ask General de Castelnau to come and decide finally. The general arrived smiling, quiet and good-humored, said a few pleasant words about this new kind of literary council of war, and looked at the texts. He chose the simpler one, gave more weight to the first phrase, inserted the words, as had been anticipated, which supply a reassuring quality, and was flatly against inserting von Deimling's order, but was for transmitting it to the press in a special note. End quote. General Joffre that evening read the communique carefully and approved it. Within a few hours, those two or three hundred words would be read all over the world. They would paint a picture in men's minds of what was happening on the slopes of Verdun, and in front of that picture, people would take heart or despair. The shopkeeper in Brest, the peasant in Lorraine, the deputy in the Palais Bourbon, the editor in Amsterdam or Minneapolis had to be kept in hope, and yet prepared to accept possible defeat without yielding to panic. They are told, therefore, that the loss of ground is no surprise to the French command. They are taught to regard the affair as serious, but not strange. Now, as a matter of fact, the French general staff was not fully prepared for the German offensive. Supporting trenches had not been dug, alternative roads had not been built, barbed wire was lacking. But to confess that would have aroused images in the heads of civilians that might well have turned a reverse into a disaster. The high command could be disappointed and yet pull itself together, the people at home and abroad, full of uncertainties, and with none of the professional man's singleness of purpose, might on the basis of a complete story have lost sight of the war, in a melee of faction and counterfaction about the competence of the officers. Instead, therefore, of letting the public act on all the facts which the generals knew, the authorities presented only certain facts, and these only in such a way as would be most likely to steady the people. In this case, the men who arranged the Suedo environment knew what the real one was. But a few days later an incident occurred, about which the French staff did not know the truth. The Germans announced, footnote, on February 26, 1916, Pierre Fou, GQG, pages 133, et sequins, that on the previous afternoon they had taken Fort Dumont by assault. At French headquarters in Chantilly, no one could understand this news. For on the morning of the 25th, after the engagement of the 20th Corps, the battle had taken a turn for the better. Reports from the front said nothing about Dumont. But inquiry showed that the German report was true, though no one as yet knew how the fort had been taken. In the meantime, the German communique was being flashed around the world, and the French had to say something. So headquarters explained, quote, in the midst of total ignorance at Chantilly about the way the attack had taken place, we imagined, in the evening communique of the 26th, a plan of the attack which certainly had a thousand to one chance of being true. End quote. The communique of this imaginary battle read, quote, A bitter struggle is taking place around Fort de Dumont, which is an advance post of the old defensive organization of Verdun. The position taken this morning by the enemy, after several unsuccessful assaults that cost him very heavy losses, has been reached again, and passed by our troops whom the enemy has not been able to drive back. End quote. Footnote. This is my own translation. The English translation from London published in the New York Times of Sunday, February 27th, is as follows. London, February 26th, 1916. A furious struggle has been in progress around Fort de Dumont, which is an advance element of the old defensive organization of Verdun fortresses. The position captured this morning by the enemy, after several fruitless assaults which cost him extremely heavy losses, footnote, the French text says, quote, Pertus tres elevis, end quote. Thus, the English translation exaggerates the original text, was reached again, and gone beyond by our troops, which all the attempts of the enemy have not been able to push back, end quote. What had actually happened differed from both the French and German accounts. While changing troops in the line, the position had somehow been forgotten in a confusion of orders. Only a battery commander and a few men remained in the fort. 
some German soldiers, seeing the door open, had crawled into the fort and taken everyone inside prisoner. A little later, the French who were on the slopes of the hill were horrified at being shot at from the fort. They had seen no battle at Dumont and no losses. Nor had the French troops advanced beyond it, as the communiques seemed to say. They were beyond it on either side, to be sure, but the fort was in enemy hands. Yet from the communique everyone believed that the fort was half surrounded. The words did not explicitly say so, but, quote, the press, as usual, forced the pace, end quote. Military writers concluded that the Germans would soon have to surrender. In a few days, they began to ask themselves why the garrison, since it lacked food, had not yet surrendered. Quote, it was necessary through the press bureau to request them to drop the encirclement theme, end quote. Footnote, Pierre Fou, cited above, page 134 to 135. The editor of the French communique tells us that as the battle dragged out, his colleagues and he set out to neutralize the pernacity of the Germans by continual insistence on their terrible losses. It is necessary to remember that at this time, and in fact until late in 1917, the orthodox view of the war for all the Allied peoples was that it would be decided by attrition. Nobody believed in a war of movement. It was insisted that strategy did not count, or diplomacy. It was simply a matter of killing Germans. The general public more or less believed the dogma, but it had constantly to be reminded of it, in face of spectacular German successes. Quote, Almost no day passed but the communique, ascribed to the Germans with some appearance of justice heavy losses, extremely heavy, spoke of bloody sacrifices, heaps of corpses, hecatombs. Likewise, the wireless constantly used the statistics of the intelligence bureau at Verdun, whose chief, Major Cointet, had invented a method of calculating German losses, which obviously produced marvelous results. Every fortnight the figures increased a hundred thousand or so. These three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand casualties put out, divided into daily, weekly, monthly losses, repeated in all sorts of ways, produced a striking effect. Our formula varied little. Quote, According to prisoners, the German losses in the course of the attack have been considerable. It is proved that the losses. The enemy exhausted by his losses has not renewed the attack. End quote. Certain formula, later abandoned because they had been overworked, were used each day. Quote, Under our artillery and machine gun fire. Mowed down by our artillery and machine gun fire. End quote. Constant repetition impressed the neutrals and Germany itself, and helped to create a bloody background in spite of the denials from Nowen, the German wireless, which tried vainly to destroy the bad effect of this perpetual repetition. End quote. Footnote, cited above, pages 138 to 139. The thesis of the French command, which it wished to establish publicly by these reports, was formulated as follows for the guidance of the censors. Quote, this offensive engages the active forces of our opponent, whose manpower is declining. We have learned that the class of 1916 is already at the front. There will remain the 1917 class already being called up, and the resources of the third category, men above 45, or convalescents. In a few weeks, the German forces exhausted by this effort will find themselves confronted with all the forces of the coalition, 10 millions against 7 millions, end quote. Footnote, cited above, page 147. According to M. D. Pierrefou, the French command had converted itself to this belief. Quote, By an extraordinary aberration of mind, only the attrition of the enemy was seen. It appeared that our forces were not subject to attrition. General Nivelle shared these ideas. We saw the result in 1917. End quote. We have learned to call this propaganda. A group of men who can prevent independent access to the event, arrange the news of it to suit their purpose. That the purpose was, in this case, patriotic, does not affect the argument at all. They used their power to make the Allied public see affairs as they desired them to be seen. The casualty figures of Major Cointet which were spread around the world are of the same order. They were intended to provoke a particular kind of inference, namely that the war of attrition was going in favor of the French but the inference is not drawn in the form of argument. It results almost automatically from the creation of a mental picture 
of endless Germans slaughtered on the hills about Verdun. By putting the dead Germans in the focus of the picture, and by omitting to mention the French dead, a very special view of the battle was built up. It was a view designed to neutralize the effects of German territorial advances, and the impression of power which the persistence of the offensive was making. It was also a view that tended to make the public acquiesce in the demoralizing defensive strategy imposed upon the Allied armies. For the public, accustomed to the idea that war consists of great strategic movements, flank attacks, encirclements, and dramatic surrenders, had gradually to forget that picture in favor of the terrible idea that by matching lives the war would be won. Through its control over all news from the front, the general staff substituted a view of the facts that comported with this strategy. The general staff of an army in the field is so placed that within wide limits it can control what the public will perceive. It controls the selection of correspondents who go to the front, controls their movements at the front, reads and centers their messages from the front, and operates the wires. The government behind the army, by its command of cables and passports, mails and custom houses, and blockades, increases the control. It emphasizes it by legal power over publishers, over public meetings, and by its secret service. But in the case of an army, the control is far from perfect. There is always the enemy's communique, which in these days of wireless cannot be kept away from neutrals. Above all, there is the talk of the soldiers, which blows back from the front, and is spread about when they are on leave. Footnote. For weeks prior to the American attack at St. Miel and in the Argonne Moss, everybody in France told everybody else the deep secret. An army is an unwieldy thing. And that is why the naval and diplomatic censorship is almost always much more complete. Fewer people know what is going on, and their acts are more easily supervised. Without some form of censorship, propaganda in the strict sense of the word is impossible. In order to conduct a propaganda, there must be some barrier between the public and the event. Access to the real environment must be limited before anyone can create a pseudo environment that he thinks wise or desirable. For while people who have direct access can misconceive what they see, no one else can decide how they shall misconceive it, unless he can decide where they shall look and at what. The military censorship is the simplest form of barrier, but by no means the most important, because it is known to exist, and is therefore in certain measure agreed to and discounted. At different times, and for different subjects, some men impose and other men accept a particular standard of secrecy. The frontier between what is concealed because publication is not, as we say, quote, compatible with the public interest, end quote, fades gradually into what is concealed because it is believed to be none of the public's business. The notion of what constitutes a person's private affairs is elastic. Thus, the amount of a man's fortune is considered a private affair, and careful provision is made in the income tax law to keep it as private as possible. The sale of a piece of land is not private, but the price may be. Salaries are generally treated as more private than wages, incomes as more private than inheritances. A person's credit rating is given only a limited circulation. The profits of big corporations are more public than those of small firms. Certain kinds of conversation, between man and wife, lawyer and client, doctor and patient, priest and communicant, are privileged. Directors' meetings are generally private. So are many political conferences. Most of what is said at a cabinet meeting, or by an ambassador to the Secretary of State, or at private interviews, or dinner tables, is private. Many people regard the contract between employer and employee as private. There was a time when the affairs of all corporations were held to be as private as a man's theology is today. There was a time before that when his theology was held to be as public a matter as the color of his eyes. But infectious diseases, on the other hand, were once as private as the processes of a man's digestion. The history of the notion of privacy would be an entertaining tale. Sometimes the notions violently conflict, as they did when the Bolsheviks published the secret treaties, or when Mr. Hughes investigated the life insurance companies, or when somebody's scandal exudes from the pages of town topics to the front pages of Mr. Hearst's newspapers. Whether the reasons for privacy are good or bad, the barriers exist. Privacy is insisted upon at all kinds of places in the area of what is called public affairs. 
It is often very illuminating, therefore, to ask yourself how you got at the facts on which you base your opinion. Who actually saw, heard, felt, counted, named the thing, about which you have an opinion? Was it the man who told you, or the man who told him, or someone else still further removed? And how much was he permitted to see? When he informs you that France thinks this and that, what part of France did he watch? How was he able to watch it? Where was he when he watched it? What Frenchman was he permitted to talk to? What newspapers did he read? And where did they learn what they say? You can ask yourself these questions, but you can rarely answer them. They will remind you, however, of the distance which often separates your public opinion from the event with which it deals. And the reminder is itself a protection. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 3 Contact and Opportunity. While censorship and privacy intercept much information at its source, a very much larger body of fact never reaches the whole public at all or only very slowly. For there are very distinct limits upon the circulation of ideas. A rough estimate of the effort it takes to reach everybody can be had by considering the government's propaganda during the war. Remembering that the war had run over two years and a half before America entered it, that millions upon millions of printed pages had been circulated, and untold speeches had been delivered, let us turn to Mr. Creel's account of his fight, quote, for the minds of men, for the conquest of their convictions, end quote, in order that, quote, the gospel of Americanism might be carried to every corner of the globe, end quote. Footnote, George Creel, How We Advertised America. Mr. Creel had to assemble machinery which included a division of news that issued, he tells us, more than 6,000 releases, had to enlist 75,000 four-minute men, who delivered at least 755,190 speeches, to an aggregate of over 300 million people. Boy Scouts delivered annotated copies of President Wilson's addresses to the householders of America. Fortnightly periodicals were sent to 600,000 teachers. 200,000 lantern slides were furnished for illustrated lectures. 1,438 different designs were turned out for posters, window cards, newspaper advertisements, cartoons, seals, and buttons. The chambers of commerce, the churches, fraternal societies, schools, were used as channels of distribution. Yet Mr. Creel's effort, to which I have not begun to do justice, did not include Mr. McAdoo's stupendous organization for the Liberty Loans, nor Mr. Hoover's far-reaching propaganda about food, nor the campaigns of the Red Cross, the YMCA, Salvation Army, Knights of Columbus, Jewish Welfare Board, not to mention the independent work of patriotic societies, like the League to Enforce Peace, the League of Free Nations Association, the National Security League, nor the activity of the publicity bureaus of the Allies and of the submerged nationalities. Probably this is the largest and most intensive effort to carry quickly a fairly uniform set of ideas to all the people of a nation. The older proselytizing worked more slowly, perhaps more surely, but never so inclusively. Now, if it required such extreme measures to reach everybody in time of crisis, how open are the more normal channels to men's minds? The administration was trying, and while the war continued it very largely succeeded, I believe, in creating something that might almost be called one public opinion all over America. But think of the dogged work, the complicated ingenuity, the money and the personnel that were required. Nothing like that exists in time of peace, and as a corollary there are whole sections, there are vast groups, ghettos, enclaves and classes that hear only vaguely about much that is going on. They live in grooves, are shut in among their own affairs, barred out of larger affairs, meet few people not of their own sort, read little. Travel and trade, the mails, the wires, and radio, railroads, highways, ships, motor cars, and in the coming generation airplanes are, of course, of the utmost influence on the circulation of ideas. Each of these affects the supply and the quality of information and opinion in the most intricate way. Each is itself affected by technical, by economic, by political conditions. 
Every time a government relaxes the passport ceremonies or the customs inspection, every time a new railway or a new port is opened, a new shipping line established, every time rates go up or down, the mails move faster or more slowly, the cables are uncensored and made less expensive, highways built or widened or improved, the circulation of ideas is influenced. Tariff schedules and subsidies affect the direction of commercial enterprise and therefore the nature of human contracts. And so it may well happen, as it did, for example, in the case of Salem, Massachusetts, that a change in the art of shipbuilding will reduce a whole city from a center where international influences converge to a genteel provincial town. All the immediate effects of a more rapid transit are not necessarily good. It would be difficult to say, for example, that the railroad system of France, so highly centralized upon Paris, has been an unmixed blessing to the French people. It is certainly true that problems arising out of the means of communication are of the utmost importance, and one of the most constructive features of the program of the League of Nations has been the study given to railroad transit and access to the sea. The monopolizing of cables, footnote, hence the wisdom of taking yap seriously, of ports, fuel stations, mountain passes, canals, straits, river courses, terminals, marketplaces, means a good deal more than the enrichment of a group of businessmen or the prestige of a government. It means a barrier upon the exchange of news and opinion. But monopoly is not the only barrier. Cost and available supply are even greater ones, for if the cost of traveling and trading is prohibitive, if the demand for facilities exceeds the supply, the barriers exist even without monopoly. The size of a man's income has considerable effect on his access to the world beyond his neighborhood. With money he can overcome almost every tangible obstacle of communication. He can travel, buy books and periodicals, and bring within the range of his attention almost any known fact of the world. The income of the individual and the income of the community determine the amount of communication that is possible. But men's ideas determine how that income shall be spent and that in turn affects in the long run the amount of income they will have. Thus, also there are limitations, none the less real, because they are often self-imposed and self-indulgent. There are portions of the sovereign people, who spend most of their spare time and spare money on motoring and comparing motor cars, on bridge whist and post-mortems, on moving pictures and potboilers, talking always to the same people with minute variations on the same old themes. They cannot really be said to suffer from censorship or secrecy, the high cost, or the difficulty of communication. They suffer from anemia, from lack of appetite and curiosity for the human scene. Theirs is no problem of access to the world outside. Worlds of interests are waiting for them to explore, and they do not enter. They move, as if on a leash, within a fixed radius of acquaintances according to the law and the gospel of their social set. Among men... The circle of talk in business and at the club, and in the smoking car, is wider than the set to which they belong. Among women the social set and the circle of talk are frequently almost identical. It is in the social set that ideas derived from reading and lectures, and from the circle of talk converge, are sorted out, accepted, rejected, judged, and sanctioned. There it is finally decided in each phase of a discussion which authorities and which sources of information are admissible and which not. Our social set consists of those who figure as people in the phrase, people are saying, they are the people whose approval matters most intimately to us. In big cities among men and women of wide interests, and with the means for moving about, the social set is not so rigidly defined. But even in big cities, there are quarters and nests of villages containing self-sufficing social sets. In smaller communities, there may exist a freer circulation, a more genuine fellowship from after breakfast to before dinner. But few people do not know, nevertheless, which set they really belong to and which not. Usually the distinguishing mark of a social set is the presumption that the children may intermarry. To marry outside the set involves, at the very least, a moment of doubt before the engagement can be approved. Each social set has a fairly clear picture of its relative position in the hierarchy of social sets. Between sets at the same level, association is easy, individuals are quickly accepted, hospitality is normal and unembarrassed. But in contact between sets that are higher or lower, there is always reciprocal hesitation, a faint malaise, and a consciousness of difference. To be sure, in a society like that of the United States, individuals move somewhat freely out of one set into another, 
especially where there is no racial barrier, and where economic position changes so rapidly. Economic position, however, is not measured by the amount of income. For in the first generation, at least, it is not income that determines social standing, but the character of a man's work, and it may take a generation or two before this fades out of the family tradition. Thus banking, law, medicine, public utilities, newspapers, the church, large retailing, brokerage, manufacture, are rated at a different social value from salesmanship, superintendents, expert technical work, nursing, school teaching, shopkeeping, and those in turn are rated as differently from plumbing, being a chauffeur, dressmaking, subcontracting, or stenography, as these are from being a butler, ladies' maid, a moving picture operator, or a locomotive engineer. And yet the financial return does not necessarily coincide with these gradations. Whatever the tests of admission, the social set when formed is not a mere economic class, but something which more nearly resembles a biological clan. Membership is intimately connected with love, marriage, and children, or, to speak more exactly, with the attitudes and desires that are involved. In the social set, therefore, opinions encounter the canons of family tradition, respectability, propriety, dignity, taste and form, which make up the social set's picture of itself, a picture assiduously implanted in the children. In this picture, a large space is tacitly given to an authorized version of what each set is called upon inwardly, to accept as the social standing of the others. The more vulgar press for an outward expression of the deference do, the others are decently and sensitively silent about their own knowledge that such deference invisibly exists. But that knowledge, becoming overt when there is a marriage, a war, or a social upheaval, is the nexus of a large bundle of dispositions classified by Trotter, footnote, Wilfred Trotter, instincts of the herd in war and peace, under the general term instinct of the herd, Within each social set there are augurs like the van der Leidens and Mrs. Manson Mingott in The Age of Innocence, footnote, Edith Wharton, The Age of Innocence, who are recognized as the custodians and the interpreters of its social pattern. You are made, they say, if the van der Leidens take you up. The invitations to their functions are the high sign of arrival and status. The elections to college societies, carefully graded and the gradations universally accepted, determine who is who in college. The social leaders, weighted with the ultimate eugenic responsibility, are particularly sensitive. Not only must they be watchfully aware of what makes for the integrity of their set, but they have to cultivate a special gift for knowing what other social sets are doing. They act as a kind of ministry of foreign affairs. Where most of the members of a set live complacently within the set, regarding it, for all practical purposes, as the world, the social leaders must combine an intimate knowledge of the anatomy of their own set with a persistent sense of its place in the hierarchy of sets. The hierarchy, in fact, is bound together by the social leaders. At any one level there is something which might almost be called a social set of the social leaders. But vertically the actual binding together of society, insofar as it is bound together at all by social contact, is accomplished by those exceptional people, frequently suspect, who, like Julius Beaufort and Ellen Olenska, in the Age of Innocence, move in and out. Thus there come to be established personal channels from one set to another, through which Tard's laws of imitation operate. But for large sections of the population, there are no such channels. For them, the patented accounts of society and the moving pictures of high life have to serve. They may develop a social hierarchy of their own, almost unnoticed, as have the Negroes and the foreign element, but among that assimilated mass which always considers itself the nation, there is, in spite of the great separateness of sets, a variety of personal contacts through which a circulation of standards takes place. Some of the sets are so placed that they become what Professor Ross has called radiant points of conventionality. Footnote, Ross, Social Psychology, Chapters 9, 10, and 11. Thus, the social superior is likely to be imitated by the social inferior, the holder of power is imitated by subordinates, the more successful by the less successful, the rich by the poor, the city by the country. But imitation does not stop at frontiers. The powerful, socially superior, successful, rich, urban social set is fundamentally international throughout the Western Hemisphere, and in many ways London is its center. It counts among its membership the most influential people in the world, containing as it does the diplomatic set, high finance, the upper circles of the army and the navy, 
some princes of the church, a few great newspaper proprietors, their wives and mothers and daughters, who wield the scepter of invitation. It is at once a great circle of talk and a real social set. But its importance comes from the fact that here at last, the distinction between public and private affairs practically disappears. The private affairs of this set are public matters, and public matters are its private, often its family affairs. The confinements of Margot Asquith like the confinements of royalty are, as the philosophers say, in much the same universe of discourse as a tariff bill or a parliamentary debate. There are large areas of government in which this social set is not interested, and in America, at least, it has exercised only a fluctuating control over the national government. But its power in foreign affairs is always very great, and in wartime its prestige is enormously enhanced. That is natural enough because these cosmopolitans have a contact with the outer world that most people do not possess. They have dined with each other in the capitals, and their sense of national honor is no mere abstraction. It is a concrete experience of being snubbed or approved by their friends. To Dr. Kennicott of Gopher Prairie, it matters mighty little what Winston thinks and a great deal what Ezra Stobody thinks, but to Mrs. Mingott with a daughter married to the Earl of Swithin, it matters a lot when she visits her daughter or entertains Winston himself. Dr. Kennicott and Mrs. Mingott are both socially sensitive, but Mrs. Mingott is sensitive to a social set that governs the world, while Dr. Kennicott's social set governs only in Gopher Prairie. But in matters that affect the larger relationships of the great society, Dr. Kennicott will often be found holding what he thinks is purely his own opinion, though, as a matter of fact, it has trickled down to Gopher Prairie from high society, transmuted on its passage through the provincial social sets. It is no part of our inquiry to attempt an account of the social tissue. We need only to fix in mind how big is the part played by the social set in our spiritual contact with the world, how it tends to fix what is admissible, and to determine how it shall be judged. Affairs within its immediate competence, each set more or less determines for itself. Above all, it determines the detailed administration of the judgment. But the judgment itself is formed on patterns, footnote, see part three, that may be inherited from the past, transmitted, or imitated from other social sets, the highest social set consists of those who embody the leadership of the great society. As against almost every other social set, where the bulk of the opinions are first-hand only about local affairs, in this highest society the big decisions of war and peace, of social strategy and the ultimate distribution of political power, are intimate experiences within a circle of what, potentially at least, are personal acquaintances. Since position and contact play so big a part in determining what can be seen, heard, read, and experienced, as well as what is permissible to see, hear, read, and know, it is no wonder that moral judgment is so much more common than constructive thought. Yet in truly effective thinking, the prime necessity is to liquidate judgments, regain an innocent eye, disentangle feelings, be curious and open-hearted. Man's history being what it is, political opinion on the scale of the great society requires an amount of selfless equanimity rarely attainable by anyone for any length of time. We are concerned in public affairs, but immersed in our private ones. The time and attention are limited that we can spare, for the labor of not taking opinions for granted, and we are subject to constant interruption. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 4 Time and Attention. Naturally, it is possible to make a rough estimate only of the amount of attention people give each day to informing themselves about public affairs. Yet it is interesting that three estimates that I have examined agree tolerably well, though they were made at different times, in different places, and by different methods. Footnote, July 1900, D. F. Wilcox, The American Newspaper, A Study in Social Psychology, Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, Volume 16, page 56. The statistical tables are reproduced in James Edward Rogers, The American Newspaper. 1916. Walter D. Scott, The Psychology of Advertising, pages 226 to 248. 
See also Henry Foster Adams, Advertising and Its Mental Laws, Chapter 4. 1920, Newspaper Reading Habits of College Students, by Professor George Burton Hotchkiss and Richard B. Franken, published by the Association of National Advertisers, Incorporated, 15 East 26th Street, New York City. A questionnaire was sent by Hotchkiss and Franken to 1,761 men and women, college students in New York City, and answers came from all but a few. Scott used a questionnaire on 4,000 prominent business and professional men in Chicago and received replies from 2,300. Between 70 and 75% of all those who replied to either inquiry thought they spent a quarter of an hour a day reading newspapers. Only 4% of the Chicago group guessed at less than this, and 25% guessed at more. Among the New Yorkers, a little over 8% figure their newspaper reading at less than 15 minutes, and 17 and a half at more. Very few people have an accurate idea of 15 minutes, so the figures are not to be taken literally. Moreover, businessmen, professional people, and college students are, most of them, liable to a curious little bias against appearing to spend too much time over the newspapers, and perhaps also to a faint suspicion of a desire to be known as rapid readers. All that the figures can justly be taken to mean is that over three-quarters of those in selected groups rate rather low the attention they give to printed news of the outer world. These time estimates are fairly well confirmed by a test that is less subjective. Scott asked his Chicagoans how many papers they read each day, and was told that, 14% read but one paper, 46% two papers, 21% three papers, 10% four papers, 3% five papers, 2% six papers, 3% all the papers, eight at the time of this inquiry. The two and three paper readers are 67%, which comes fairly close to the 71% in Scott's group, who rate themselves at 15 minutes a day. The omnivorous readers of from four to eight papers coincide roughly with the 25% who rated themselves at more than 15 minutes. It is still more difficult to guess how the time is distributed. The college students were asked to name the five features which interest you most. Just under 20% voted for general news, just under 15% for editorials, just under 12% for politics, a little over 8% for finance, not two years after the armistice, a little over 6% for foreign news, 3.5% for local, nearly 3% for business, and a quarter of 1% for news about labor. A scattering said they were most interested in sports, special articles, the theater, advertisements, cartoons, book reviews, accuracy, music, ethical tone, society, brevity, art, stories, shipping, school news, current news, and print. Disregarding these, about 67.5% picked as the most interesting features, news and opinion that dealt with public affairs. This was a mixed college group. The girls professed greater interest than the boys in general news, foreign news, local news, politics, editorials, the theater, music, art, stories, cartoons, advertisements, and ethical tone. The boys, on the other hand, were more absorbed in finance, sports, business page, accuracy, and brevity. These discriminations correspond a little too closely with the ideals of what is cultured and moral, manly and decisive, not to make one suspect the utter objectivity of the replies. Yet they agree fairly well with the replies of Scott's Chicago business and professional men. They were asked not what features interest them the most, but why they preferred one newspaper to another. Nearly 71% based their conscious preference on local news, 17.8%, political news, 15.8%, financial news, 11.3%, or foreign news, 9.5%, general news, 7.2%, or editorials, 9%. The other 31% decided on grounds not connected with public affairs. They ranged from not quite 7%, who decided for ethical tone, down to one twentieth of one percent who cared most about humor. How do these preferences correspond with the space given by newspapers to various subjects? Unfortunately, there are no data collected on this point, for the newspapers read by the Chicago and New York groups at the time the questionnaires were made. But there is an interesting analysis made over twenty years ago by Wilcox. He studied 110 newspapers in 14 large cities and classified the subject matter of over 9,000 columns. Average for the whole community, 
the various newspaper matter was found to fill. 1. News, 55.3%. News is broken down as war news, 17.9%. General news, 21.8%. Special news, 15.6%. General news is broken down as foreign news, 1.2%. Politics, 6.4%. Crime, 3.1%. Miscellaneous, 11.1%. Special news is broken down as business, 8.2%, sports, 5.1%, society, 2.3%. 2. Illustrations, 3.1%. 3. Literature, 2.4%. 4. Opinion, 7.1%. Opinion is broken down as editorials, 3.9%. Letters in exchange, 3.2%. 5. Advertisements, 32.1%. In order to bring this table into a fair comparison, it is necessary to exclude the space given to advertisements and recompute the percentages. For the advertisements occupied only an infinitesimal part of the conscious preference of the Chicago group or the college group. I think this is justifiable for our purposes because the press prints what advertisements it can get. Footnote, except those which it regards as objectionable, and those which, in rare instances, are crowded out, whereas the rest of the paper is designed to the taste of its readers. The table would then read, 1. News, 81.4%. News is broken down as war news, 26.4%. General news, 32%. Special news, 23%. General news is broken down as foreign news, 1.8%. Politics, 9.4%. Crime, 4.6%. Miscellaneous, 16.3%. Special news is broken down as business, 12.1%. Sports, 7.5%. Society, 3.3%. 2. Illustrations, 4.6%. 3. Literature, 3.5%. 4. Opinion, 10.5%. Opinion is broken down as editorials, 5.8%. Letters in exchange, 4.7%. In this revised table, if you add up the items which may be supposed to deal with public affairs, that is to say, war, foreign, political, miscellaneous, business news, and opinion, you find a total of 76.5% of the edited space, devoted in 1900 to the 70.6% of reasons given by Chicago businessmen in 1916 for preferring a particular newspaper, and to the five features which most interested 67.5% of the New York College students in 1920. This would seem to show that the tastes of businessmen and college students in big cities today still correspond more or less to the average judgments of newspaper editors in big cities 20 years ago. Since that time the proportion of features to news has undoubtedly increased, and so has the circulation and the size of newspapers. Therefore, if today you could secure accurate replies from the more typical groups than college students or business and professional men, you would expect to find a smaller percentage of time devoted to public affairs, as well as a smaller percentage of space. On the other hand, you would expect to find that the average man spends more than the quarter of an hour on his newspaper, and that while the percentage of space given to public affairs is less than 20 years ago, the net amount is greater. No elaborate deductions are to be drawn from these figures. They help merely to make somewhat more concrete our notions of the effort that goes day by day into acquiring the data of our opinions. The newspapers are, of course, not the only means, but they are certainly the principal ones. Magazines, the public forum, the Chautauqua, the church, political gatherings, trade union meetings, women's clubs, and news serials in the moving picture houses supplement the press. But taking it all at the most favorable estimate, the time each day is small when any of us is directly exposed to information from our unseen environment. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 5. Speed, Words, and Clearness. 
The unseen environment is reported to us chiefly by words. These words are transmitted by wire or radio from the reporters to the editors who fit them into print. Telegraphy is expensive, and the facilities are often limited. Press service news is, therefore, usually coded. Thus a dispatch which reads, quote, Washington, D.C., June 1st. The United States regards the question of German shipping seized in this country at the outbreak of hostilities as a closed incident, end quote, may pass over the wires in an abbreviated form. A news item saying, quote, Berlin, June 1st. Chancellor Wirth told the Reichstag today in outlining the government's program that restoration and reconciliation would be the keynote of the new government's policy. He added that the cabinet was determined, disarmament should be carried out loyally, and that disarmament would not be the occasion of the imposition of further penalties by the Allies, end quote, may be cabled in a similar form. In this second item, the substance has been culled from a long speech in a foreign tongue, translated, coded, and then decoded. The operators who receive the messages transcribe them as they go along, and I am told that a good operator can write 15,000 or even more words per eight-hour day, with a half an hour out for lunch and two ten-minute periods for rest. A few words must often stand for a whole succession of acts, thoughts, feelings, and consequences. We read, quote, Washington, December 23rd, a statement charging Japanese military authorities with deeds more frightful and barbarous than anything ever alleged to have occurred in Belgium during the war, was issued here today by the Korean Commission, based, the Commission said, on authentic reports received by it from Manchuria, end quote. Here, eyewitnesses, their accuracy unknown, report to the makers of authentic reports. They, in turn, transmit these to a commission 5,000 miles away. It prepares a statement, probably much too long for publication, from which a correspondent calls an item of print three and a half inches long. The meaning has to be telescoped in such a way as to permit the reader to judge how much weight to give to the news. It is doubtful whether a supreme master of style could pack all the elements of truth that complete justice would demand into a hundred-word account of what happened in Korea during the course of several months. For language is by no means a perfect vehicle of meanings. Words, like currency, are turned over and over again, to evoke one set of images today, another tomorrow. There is no certainty whatever that the same word will call out exactly the same idea in the reader's mind as it did in the reporter's. Theoretically, if each fact and each relation had a name that was unique, and if everyone had agreed on the names, it would be possible to communicate without misunderstanding. In the exact sciences there is an approach to this ideal, and that is part of the reason why, of all forms of worldwide cooperation, Scientific inquiry is the most effective. Men command fewer words than they have ideas to express, and language, as John Paul has said, is a dictionary of faded metaphors, footnote, cited by White, mechanisms of character formation. The journalist addressing half a million readers of whom he has only a dim picture, the speaker whose words are flashed to remote villages and overseas, cannot hope that a few phrases will carry the whole burden of their meaning. Quote, the words of Lloyd George, badly understood and badly transmitted, end quote, said M. Briand of the Chamber of Deputies, footnote, special cable to the New York Times, May 25, 1921, by Edwin L. James, quote, seemed to give the pan-Germanists the idea that the time had come to start something, end quote. A British prime minister, speaking in English to the whole attentive world, speaks his own meaning in his own words to all kinds of people, who will see their meaning in those words. No matter how rich or subtle, or rather, the more rich and the more subtle that which he has to say, the more his meaning will suffer as it is sluiced into standard speech, and then distributed again among alien minds. Footnote. In May of 1921, relations between England and France were strained by the insurrection of M. Corfanti in Upper Silesia. The London correspondence of the Manchester Guardian, May 20th, 1921, contained the following item. Quote. The Franco-English Exchange in Words In quarters well acquainted with French ways and character, I find a tendency to think that undue sensibility has been shown by our press and public opinion in the lively and at times intemperate language of the French press through the present crisis. The point was put to me by a well-informed neutral observer in the following manner. Words, like money, are tokens of value. They represent meaning, therefore, and just as money, 
their representative value goes up and down. The French word atuono was used by Bossuet with a terrible weight of meaning, which it has lost today. A similar thing can be observed with the English word awful. Some nations constitutionally tend to understate, others to overstate. What the British Tommy called an unhealthy place could only be described by an Italian soldier, by means of a rich vocabulary aided with an exuberant mimicry. Nations that understate keep their word currency sound. Nations that overstate suffer from inflation in their language. Expressions such as a distinguished scholar, a clever writer, must be translated into French as a great savant, an exquisite master. It is a mere matter of exchange, just as in France one pound pays 46 francs, and yet no one knows that that does not increase its value at home. Englishmen reading the French press should endeavor to work out a mental operation similar to that of the banker who puts back francs into pounds, and not forget in so doing that while in normal times the change was 25, it is now 46 on account of the war. For there is a war fluctuation on word exchanges as well as money exchanges. The argument, one hopes, works both ways, and Frenchmen do not fail to realize that there is as much value behind English reticence as behind their own exuberance of expression. End quote. Millions of those who are watching him can read hardly at all. Millions more can read the words, but cannot understand them. Of those who can both read and understand, a good three quarters, we may assume, have some part of half an hour a day to spare for the subject. To them the words so acquired are the cue for a whole train of ideas, on which ultimately a vote of untold consequences may be based. Necessarily, the ideas which we allow the words we read to evoke form the biggest part of the original data of our opinions. The world is vast, the situations that concern us are intricate, the messages are few, the biggest part of opinion must be constructed in the imagination. When we use the word Mexico, what picture does it evoke in a resident of New York? Likely as not, it is some composite of sand, cactus, oil wells, greasers, rum-drinking Indians, testy old cavaliers flourishing whiskers in sovereignty, or perhaps an idyllic pleasantry a la Jean-Jacques, assailed by the prospect of smoky industrialism and fighting for the rights of man. What does the word Japan evoke? Is it a vague horde of slant-eyed yellow men, surrounded by yellow perils, picture brides, fans, samurai, bonsais, art, and cherry blossoms? Or the word alien? According to a group of New England college students, writing in the year 1920, an alien was the following. Footnote, The New Republic, December 29, 1920, page 142. A person hostile to this country. A person against the government. A person who is on the opposite side. A native of an unfriendly country. A foreigner at war. A foreigner who tries to do harm to the country he is in. An enemy from a foreign land. A person against a country, etc. Yet the word alien is an unusually exact legal term, far more exact than words like sovereignty, independence, national honor, rights, defense, aggression, imperialism, capitalism, socialism, about which we so readily take sides for or against. The power to dissociate superficial analogies, attend to differences, and appreciate variety is lucidity of mind. It is a relative faculty. Yet the differences in lucidity are extensive, say as between a newly born infant and a botanist examining a flower. To the infant there is precious little difference between his own toes, his father's watch, the lamp on the table, the moon in the sky, and a nice bright yellow edition of Guy de Maupassant. To many a member of the Union League Club, there is no remarkable difference between a Democrat, a socialist, an anarchist, and a burglar, while to a highly sophisticated anarchist there is a whole universe of difference between Bakunin, Tolstoy, and Kropotkin. These examples show how difficult it might be to secure a sound public opinion about de Maupassant among babies, or about Democrats in the Union League Club. A man who merely rides in other people's automobiles may not rise to finer discrimination than between a Ford, a taxicab, and an automobile. But let that same man own a car and drive it. Let him, as the psychoanalyst would say, project his libido upon the automobiles, and he will describe a difference in carburetors by looking at the rear end of a car a city block away. That is why it is often such a relief when the talk turns from general topics to a man's own hobby.
It is like turning from the landscape in the parlor to the plowed field outdoors. It is a return to the three-dimensional world, after a sojourn in the painter's portrayal of his own emotional response to his own inattentive memory, of what he imagines he ought to have seen. We easily identify, says Ferenzi, two only partially similar things. Footnote. International Zeitschrift Art Psychoanalysts, 1913. Translated and republished by Dr. Ernest Jones in Sandor Ferenzi. Contributions to Psychoanalysis, Chapter 8. Stages in the Development of a Sense of Reality. The child more easily than the adult, the primitive or arrested mind, more readily than the mature. As it first appears in the child, consciousness seems to be an unmanageable mixture of sensations. The child has no sense of time, and almost none of space. It reaches for the chandelier with the same confidence that it reaches for its mother's breast, and at first with almost the same expectation. Only very gradually does function define itself. To complete an experience this is a coherent and undifferentiated world, in which, as someone has said of a school of philosophers, all facts are born free and equal. Those facts, which belong together in the world, have not yet been separated from those which happen to lie side by side in the stream of consciousness. At first, says Ferenzi, the baby gets some of the things it wants by crying for them. This is, quote, the period of magical hallucinatory omnipotence, end quote. In its second phase, the child points to the things it wants, and they are given to it. Quote, omnipotence by the help of magic gestures, end quote. Later, the child learns to talk, asks for what it wishes, and is partially successful. Quote, the period of magic thoughts and magic words, end quote. Each phase may persist for certain situations, though overlaid and only visible at times, as for example, and the little harmless superstitions from which few of us are wholly free. In each phase, partial success tends to confirm that way of acting, while failure tends to stimulate the development of another. Many individuals, parties, and even nations, rarely appear to transcend the magical organization of experience. But in the more advanced sections of the most advanced peoples, trial and error after repeated failure has led to the invention of a new principle. The moon, they learn, is not moved by baying at it. Crops are not raised from the soil by spring festivals or republican majorities, but by sunlight, moisture, seeds, fertilizer, and cultivation. Footnote. Forenzi, being a pathologist, does not describe this maturer period where experience is organized as equations, the phase of realism on the basis of science. Allowing for the purely schematic value of Forenzi's categories of response, the quality which we note as critical, is the power to discriminate among crude perceptions and vague analogies. This power has been studied under laboratory conditions. Footnote. See, for example, Diagnostische Association Studien, conducted at the Psychiatric University Clinic in Zurich, under the direction of Dr. Carl G. Jung. These tests were carried on, principally, under the so-called kraepelin aschaffenberg classification. They show reaction time, classify response to the stimulant word as inner, outer, and clang, show separate results for the first and second hundred words, for reaction time and reaction quality, when the subject is distracted by holding an idea in mind, or when he replies while beating time with a metronome. Some of the results are summarized in Jung, Analytical Psychology, Chapter 2, translated by Dr. Constance E. Long. The Zurich Association studies indicate clearly that slight mental fatigue, an inner disturbance of attention, or an external distraction, tend to flatten the quality of the response. An example of the very flat type is the clang association, cat hat, a reaction to the sound and not to the sense of the stimulant word. One test, for example, shows a 9% increase of clang in the second series of a 100 reactions. Now the clang is almost a repetition, a very primitive form of analogy. If the comparatively simple conditions of a laboratory can so readily flatten out discrimination, what must be the effect of city life? In the laboratory, the fatigue is slight enough, the distraction rather trivial. Both are balanced and measured by the subject's interest and self-consciousness. Yet if the beat of a metronome will depress intelligence, what do eight or twelve hours of noise, odor, and heat in a factory, or day upon day among chattering typewriters and telephone bells and slamming doors, due to the political judgments formed on the basis of newspapers, read in streetcars and subways. 
Can anything be heard in the hubbub that does not shriek, or can be seen in the general glare that does not flash like an electric sign? The life of the city dweller lacks solitude, silence, ease. The nights are noisy and ablaze. The people of a big city are assaulted by incessant sound, now violent and jagged, now falling into unfinished rhythms, but endless and remorseless. Under modern industrialism, thought goes on in a bath of noise. If its discriminations are often flat and foolish, here at least is some small part of the reason. The sovereign people determines life and death and happiness under conditions where experience and experiment alike show thought to be most difficult. Quote, the intolerable burden of thought, end quote, is a burden when the conditions make it burdensome. It is no burden when the conditions are favorable. It is as exhilarating to think as it is to dance, and just as natural. Every man whose business it is to think knows that he must for part of the day create about himself a pool of silence. But in that helter-skelter which we flatter by the name of civilization, the citizen performs the perilous business of government under the worst possible conditions. A faint recognition of this truth inspires the movement for a shorter workday, for longer vacations, for light, air, order, sunlight and dignity in factories and offices. But if the intellectual quality of our life is to be improved, that is only the merest beginning. So long as so many jobs are an endless, and for the worker, an aimless routine, a kind of automatism using one set of muscles in one monotonous pattern, his whole life will tend towards an automatism in which nothing is particularly to be distinguished from anything else, unless it is announced with a thunderclap. So long as he is physically imprisoned in crowds by day, and even by night, his attention will flicker and relax. It will not hold fast and define clearly where he is the victim of all sorts of pother, in a home which needs to be ventilated of its welter and drudgery, shrieking children, raucous assertions, indigestible food, bad air, and suffocating ornament. Occasionally, perhaps, we enter a building which is composed and spacious, we go to a theater where modern stagecraft has cut away distraction, or go to sea, or into a quiet place, and we remember how cluttered, how capricious, how superfluous and clamorous is the ordinary urban life of our time. We learn to understand why our addled minds seize so little with precision, why they are caught up and tossed about, in a kind of tarantella by headlines and catchwords, why so often they cannot tell things apart or discern identity in apparent differences. But this external disorder is complicated further by internal. Experiment shows that the speed, the accuracy, and the intellectual quality of association is deranged by what we are taught to call emotional conflicts. Measured in fifths of a second, a series of a hundred stimuli containing both neutral and hot words may show a variation as between five and thirty-two, or even a total failure to respond at all. Footnote, Jung, Clark Lectures. Obviously, our public opinion is an intermittent contact with complexes of all sorts, with ambition and economic interest, personal animosity, racial prejudice, class feeling, and what not. They distort our reading, our thinking, our talking, and our behavior in a great variety of ways. And finally, since opinions do not stop at the normal members of society, since for the purposes of an election, a propaganda, a following, numbers constitute power, the quality of attention is still further depressed. The mass of absolutely illiterate, a feeble-minded, grossly neurotic, undernourished and frustrated individuals is very considerable, much more considerable there is reason to think than we generally suppose. Thus, a wide popular appeal is circulated among persons who are mentally children or barbarians, people whose lives are a morass of entanglements, people whose vitality is exhausted, shut-in people, and people whose experience has comprehended no factor in the problem under discussion. The stream of public opinion is stopped by them in little eddies of misunderstanding, where it is discolored with prejudice and far-fetched analogy. A broad appeal takes account of the quality of association, and is made to those susceptibilities which are widely distributed. A narrow or special appeal is one made to those susceptibilities which are uncommon. But the same individual may respond with very different quality to different stimuli, or to the same stimuli at different times. Human susceptibilities are like an alpine country. There are isolated peaks, there are extensive but separated plateaus, and there are deeper strata which are quite continuous for nearly all mankind. 
Thus the individuals whose susceptibilities reach the rarefied atmosphere of those peaks, where there exists an exquisitive difference between Friga and Peano, or between Sesetta's earlier and later periods, may be good staunch Republicans at another level of appeal, and when they are starving and afraid, indistinguishable from any other starving and frightened person. No wonder that the magazines with the large circulations prefer the face of a pretty girl to any other trademark, a face pretty enough to be alluring, but innocent enough to be acceptable. For the psychic level on which the stimulus acts determines whether the public is to be potentially a large or a small one. Thus the environment with which our public opinions deal is refracted in many ways, by censorship and privacy at the source, by physical and social barriers at the other end, by scanty attention, by the poverty of language, by distraction, by unconscious constellations of feeling, by wear and tear, violence, and monotony. These limitations upon our access to that environment combine with the obscurity and complexity of the facts themselves to thwart clearness and justice of perception, to substitute misleading fictions for workable ideas, and to deprive us of adequate checks upon those who consciously strive to mislead. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter Six Stereotypes. Each of us lives and works on a small part of the Earth's surface, moves in a small circle, and of these acquaintances knows only a few intimately. Of any public event that has wide effects, we see at best only a phase and an aspect. This is as true of the eminent insiders who draft treaties, make laws, and issue orders, as it is of those who have treaties framed for them, laws promulgated to them, orders given at them. Inevitably our opinions cover a bigger space, a longer reach of time, a greater number of things, than we can directly observe. They have, therefore, to be pieced together out of what others have reported and what we can imagine. Yet even the eyewitness does not bring back a naive picture of the scene. Footnote. See Edmund Locard, Criminal Investigation and Scientific Methods. A great deal of interesting material has been gathered in late years on the credibility of the witness, which shows, as an able viewer of Dr. Locard's book says in the Times of London, Literary Supplement, August 18, 1921, that credibility varies as to classes of witnesses and classes of events, and also as to the type of perception. Thus, perceptions of touch, odor, and taste have low evidential value. Our hearing is defective and arbitrary when it judges the source and direction of sound, and in listening to the talk of other people, quote, words which are not heard will be supplied by the witness in all good faith. He will have a theory of the purport of the conversation, and will arrange the sounds he heard to fit it, end quote. Even visual perceptions are liable to great error, as in identification, recognition, judgment of distance, estimates of numbers, for example, the size of a crowd. In the untrained observer, the sense of time is highly variable. All these original weaknesses are complicated by tricks of memory and the incessant creative quality of the imagination. See also Sherrington, The Integrative Action of the Nervous System, pages 318 to 327. The late Professor Hugo Munsterberg wrote a popular book on this subject called On the Witness Stand, for experience seems to show that he himself brings something to the scene, which later he takes away from it, that oftener than not what he imagines to be the account of an event is really a transfiguration of it. Few facts in consciousness seem to be merely given. Most facts in consciousness seem to be partly made. A report is the joint product of the knower and known, in which the role of the observer is always selective and usually creative. The facts we see depend on where we are placed, and the habits of our eyes. An unfamiliar scene is like the baby's world, quote, one great, blooming, buzzing confusion, end quote. Footnote, William James, Principles of Psychology, Volume 1, page 488. This is the way, says Mr. John Dewey, footnote, John Dewey, How We Think, page 121, that any new thing strikes an adult, so far as the thing is really new and strange. Quote, Foreign languages that we do not understand always seem gibberings, babblings, 
in which it is impossible to fix a definite, clear-cut, individualized group of sounds. The countryman in the crowded street, the landlubber at sea, the ignoramus in sport at a contest between experts in a complicated game, are further instances. Put an inexperienced man in a factory, and at first the work seems to him a meaningless medley. All strangers of another race proverbially look alike to the visiting stranger. Only gross differences of size or color are perceived by an outsider in a flock of sheep, each of which is perfectly individualized to the shepherd. A diffusive blur and an indiscriminately shifting suction characterize what we do not understand. The problem of the acquisition of meaning by things, or, stated in another way, of forming habits of simple apprehension, is thus the problem of introducing, one, definiteness and distinction, and, two, consistency or stability of meaning, into what is otherwise vague and wavering, end quote. But the kind of definiteness and consistency introduced depends upon who introduces them. In a later passage, footnote, cited above, page 133, Dewey gives an example of how differently an experienced layman and a chemist might define the word metal. Quote, smoothness, hardness, glossiness, and brilliancy, heavy weight for its size, the serviceable properties of capacity for being hammered and pulled without breaking, of being softened by heat and hardened by cold, of retaining the shape and form given, of resistance to pressure and decay, would probably be included, end quote, in the layman's definition. But the chemist would likely as not ignore these aesthetic and utilitarian qualities, and define a metal as, quote, any chemical element that enters into combination with oxygen, so as to form a base, end quote. For the most part, we do not first see, and then define. We define first, and then see. In the great blooming, buzzing confusion of the outer world, we pick out what our culture has already defined for us, and we tend to perceive that which we have picked out in the form stereotyped for us by our culture. Of the great men who assembled at Paris to settle the affairs of mankind, how many were there who were able to see much of the Europe about them rather than their commitments about Europe? Could anyone have penetrated the mind of Clemenceau? Would he have found there images of the Europe of 1919, or a great sediment of stereotyped ideas accumulated and hardened in a long and pugnacious existence? Did he see the Germans of 1919, or the German type as he had learned to see it since 1871? He saw the type, and among the reports that came to him from Germany, he took to heart those reports, and, it seems, those only, which fitted the type that was in his mind. If a junker blustered, that was an authentic German. If a labor leader confessed the guilt of the empire, he was not an authentic German. At a Congress of Psychology in Göttingen, an interesting experiment was made with a crowd of presumably trained observers. Footnote, Arnold von Genep, Training of Legends, pages 158 to 159. Cited by Ferdinand von Langenhove, The Growth of a Legend, pages 120 to 122. Not far from the hall in which the Congress was sitting, there was a public fate with a masked ball. Suddenly, the door of the hall was thrown open and a clown rushed in madly, pursued by a negro, revolver in hand. They stopped in the middle of the room, fighting. The clown fell. The negro leapt upon him, fired, and then both rushed out of the hall. The whole incident hardly lasted twenty seconds. The president asked those present to write immediately a report, since there was sure to be a judicial inquiry. Only one had less than twenty percent of mistakes in regard to the principal facts, 14 had 20 to 40 percent of mistakes, 12 from 40 to 50 percent, 13 more than 50 percent. Moreover, in 24 accounts, 10 percent of the details were pure inventions, and this proportion was exceeded in 10 accounts and diminished in 6. Briefly, a quarter of the accounts were false. It goes without saying that the whole scene had been arranged and even photographed in advance. The ten false reports may then be relegated to the category of tales and legends. Twenty-four accounts are half legendary, and six have a value approximating to exact evidence. End quote. Thus, out of forty trained observers writing a responsible account of a scene that had just happened before their eyes, more than a majority saw a scene that had not taken place. What then did they see? One would suppose it was easier to tell what had occurred than to invent something which had not occurred. They saw their stereotype of such a brawl. 
All of them had, in the course of their lives, acquired a series of images of brawls, and these images flickered before their eyes. In one man, these images displaced less than 20% of the actual scene, in 13 men more than half. In 34 out of the 40 observers, the stereotypes preempted at least one-tenth of the scene. A distinguished art critic has said, footnote, Bernard Berenson, The Central Italian Painters of the Renaissance, page 60, and the following, that, quote, what with the almost numberless shapes assumed by an object, with our insensitiveness and inattention, things scarcely would have for us, features and outlines so determined and clear that we could recall them at will, but for the stereotyped shapes art has lent them, end quote. The truth is even broader than that, for the stereotyped shapes lent to the world come not merely from art, in the sense of painting and sculpture and literature, but from our moral codes and our social philosophies, and our political agitations as well. Substitute in the following passage of Mr. Berenson's the words politics, business, and society for the word art, and the sentences will be no less true. Quote, Unless years devoted to the study of all schools of art have taught us also to see with our own eyes, we soon fall into the habit of molding whatever we look at into the forms borrowed from the one art with which we are acquainted. There is our standard of artistic reality. Let anyone give us shapes and colors, which we cannot instantly match in our paltry stock of hackneyed forms and tints, and we shake our heads at his failure to reproduce things as we know they certainly are, or we accuse him of insincerity. End quote. Mr. Berenson speaks of our displeasure when a painter, quote, does not visualize objects exactly as we do, end quote, and of the difficulty of appreciating the art of the Middle Ages, because since then, quote, our manner of visualizing forms has changed in a thousand ways, end quote. Footnote. See also his comment on Dante's visual images and his early illustrators in The Study and Criticism of Italian Art, first series, page 13. Quote, we cannot help dressing Virgil as a Roman and giving him a classical profile and statuesque carriage, but Dante's visual image of Virgil was probably no less medieval, no more based on a critical reconstruction of antiquity than his entire conception of the Roman poet. Fourteenth century illustrators make Virgil look like a medieval scholar, dressed in cap and gown, and there is no reason why Dante's visual image of him should have been other than this. End quote. He goes on to show how in regard to the human figure, we have been taught to see what we do see. Quote, Created by Donatello and Masaccio, and sanctioned by the humanists, the new canon of the human figure, the new cast of figures, presented to the ruling classes of that time, the type of human being most likely to win the day in the combat of human forces, who had the power to break through this new standard of vision, and, out of the chaos of things, to select shapes more definitely expressive of reality, than those fixed by men of genius. No one had such power. People had perforce to see things in that way and in no other, and to see only the shapes depicted, to love only the ideals presented. End quote. Footnote. The Central Italian Painters, pages 66 to 67. If we cannot fully understand the acts of other people, until we know what they think they know, then in order to do justice, we have to appraise not only the information which has been at their disposal, but the minds through which they have filtered it. For the accepted types, the current patterns, the standard versions, intercept information on its way to consciousness. Americanization, for example, is, superficially at least, the substitution of American for European stereotypes. Thus the peasant, who might see his landlord as if he were the lord of the manor, his employer as he saw the local magnate, is taught by Americanization to see the landlord and employer, according to American standards. This constitutes a change of mind, which is, in effect, when the inoculation succeeds, a change of vision. His eye sees differently. One kindly gentlewoman has confessed that the stereotypes are of such overweening importance that when hers are not indulged, she is at least unable to accept the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. Quote, we are strangely affected by the clothes we wear. Garments create a mental and social atmosphere. What can be hoped for the Americanism of a man who insists on employing a London tailor? One's very food affects his Americanism. What kind of American consciousness can grow in the atmosphere of sauerkraut and Limburger cheese? 
or what can you expect of the Americanism of a man whose breath always reeks of garlic? End quote. Footnote, cited by Mr. Edward Hale Beierstadt, New Republic, June 1, 1921, page 21. This lady might well have been the patron of a pageant which a friend of mine once attended. It was called the Melting Pot, and it was given on the 4th of July, in an automobile town where many foreign-born workers are employed. In the center of the baseball park at second base stood a huge wooden canvas pot. There were flights of steps up to the rim on two sides. After the audience had settled itself, and the band had played, a procession came through an opening at one side of the field. It was made up of men of all the foreign nationalities employed in the factories. They wore their native costumes, they were singing their national songs, they danced their folk dances, and carried the banners of all Europe. The master of ceremonies was the principal of the grade school dressed as Uncle Sam. He led them to the pot. He directed them up the steps of the rim and inside. He called them out again on the other side. They came dressed in derby hats, coats, pants, vest, stiff collar and polka dot tie. Undoubtedly, said my friend, each with an ever sharp pencil in his pocket and all singing the star spangled banner. To the promoters of this pageant, and probably to most of the actors, it seemed as if they had managed to express the most intimate difficulty to friendly association between the older peoples of America and the newer. The contradiction of their stereotypes interfered with the full recognition of their common humanity. The people who change their names know this. They mean to change themselves and the attitude of strangers toward them. There is, of course, some connection between the scene outside and the mind through which we watch it, just as there are some long-haired men and short-haired women in radical gatherings. But to the hurried observer, a slight connection is enough. If there are two bobbed heads and four beards in the audience, it will be a bobbed and bearded audience to the reporter who knows beforehand that such gatherings are composed of people with these tastes in the management of their hair. There is a connection between our vision and the facts, but it is often a strange connection. A man has rarely looked at a landscape, let us say, except to examine its possibilities for division into building lots, but he has seen a number of landscapes hanging in the parlor. And from them he has learned to think of a landscape as a rosy sunset, or as a country road with a church steeple and a silver moon. One day he goes to the country, and for hours he does not see a single landscape. Then the sun goes down looking rosy. At once he recognizes a landscape, and exclaims that it is beautiful. But two days later, when he tries to recall what he saw, the odds are that he will remember chiefly some landscape in a parlor. Unless he was drunk or dreaming or insane, he did see a sunset, but he saw it, and above all remembers from it, more of what the oil painting taught him to observe, than what an impressionist painter, for example, or a cultivated Japanese, would have seen and taken away with him. And the Japanese, and the painter, in turn, would have seen and remembered more of the form they had learned, unless they happened to be very rare people, who find fresh sight for mankind. In untrained observation, we pick recognizable signs out of the environment. The signs stand for ideas, and these ideas we fill out with our stock of images. We do not so much see this man and that sunset, rather we notice that the thing is man or sunset, and then we chiefly see what our mind is already full of on those subjects. There is economy in this. For the attempt to see all things freshly and in detail, rather than as types and generalities, is exhausting, and among busy affairs, practically out of the question. In a circle of friends, and in relation to close associates or competitors, there is no shortcut through, and no substitute for, an individualized understanding. Those whom we love and admire most, are the men and women whose consciousness is peopled thickly with persons, rather than with types, who know us rather than the classification into which we might fit. For even without phrasing it to ourselves, we feel intuitively that all classification is in relation to some purpose, not necessarily our own, that between two human beings, no association has final dignity in which each does not take the other as an end in himself. There is a taint on any contact between two people which does not affirm as an axiom the personal inviolability of both. But modern life is hurried and multifarious. Above all, physical distance separates men who are often in vital contact with each other, such as employer and employee, official and voter. 
there is neither time nor opportunity for intimate acquaintance. Instead, we notice a trait which marks a well-known type, and fill in the rest of the picture, by means of the stereotypes we carry about in our heads. He is an agitator. That much we notice, or are told. Well, an agitator is this sort of person, and so he is this sort of person. He is an intellectual. He is a plutocrat. He is a foreigner. He is a South European. He is from Back Bay. He is a Harvard man. How different from the statement, he is a Yale man, he is a regular fellow, he is a West Pointer, he is an old army sergeant, he is a Greenwich villager, what we don't know about him then, and about her. He is an international banker, he is from Main Street. The subtlest and most pervasive of all influences are those which create and maintain the repertory of stereotypes. We are told about the world before we see it. We imagine most things before we experience them. And those preconceptions, unless education has made us acutely aware, govern deeply the whole process of perception. They mark out certain objects as familiar or strange, emphasizing the difference, so that the slightly familiar is seen as very familiar, and the somewhat strange is sharply alien. They are aroused by small signs, which may vary from a true index to a vague analogy. Aroused, they flood fresh vision with older images, and project into the world what has been resurrected in memory. Were there no practical uniformities in the environment, there would be no economy and no error in the human habit of accepting foresight for sight. But there are uniformities sufficiently accurate, and the need of economizing attention is so inevitable that the abandonment of all stereotypes for a wholly innocent approach to experience would impoverish human life. What matters is the character of the stereotypes and the gullibility with which we employ them. And these, in the end, depend upon those inclusive patterns which constitute our philosophy of life. If, in that philosophy, we assume that the world is codified according to a code which we possess, we are likely to make our reports of what is going on describe a world run by our code. But if our philosophy tells us that each man is only a small part of the world, that his intelligence catches at best only phases and aspects in a coarse net of ideas, then, when we use our stereotypes, we tend to know that they are only stereotypes, to hold them lightly, to modify them gladly. We tend, also, to realize more and more clearly when our ideas started, where they started, how they came to us, why we accepted them. All useful history is antiseptic in this fashion. It enables us to know what fairy tale, what school book, what tradition, what novel, play, picture, phrase, planted one preconception in this mind, another in that mind. Those who wish to censor art do not at least underestimate this influence. They generally misunderstand it, and almost always, they are absurdly bent on preventing other people from discovering anything not sanctioned by them. But at any rate, like Plato in his argument about the poets, they feel vaguely that the types acquired through fiction tend to be imposed on reality. Thus, there can be little doubt that the moving picture is steadily building up imagery, which is then evoked by the words people read in their newspapers. In the whole experience of the race, there has been no aid to visualization comparable to the cinema. If a Florentine wished to visualize the saints, he could go to the frescoes in his church, where he might see a vision of saints standardized for his time by Giotto. If an Athenian wished to visualize the gods, he went to the temples, but the number of objects which were pictured was not great. And in the East, where the spirit of the second commandment was widely accepted, the portraiture of concrete things was even more meager, and for that reason, perhaps, the faculty of practical decision was by so much reduced. In the Western world, however, during the last few centuries, there has been an enormous increase in the volume and scope of secular description, the word picture, the narrative, the illustrated narrative, and finally the moving picture and, perhaps, the talking picture. Photographs have the kind of authority over imagination today, which the printed word had yesterday, and the spoken word before that. They seem utterly real. They come, we imagine, directly to us without human meddling, and they are the most effortless food for the mind conceivable. Any description in words, or even any inert picture, requires an effort of memory before a picture exists in the mind. But on the screen, 
the whole process of observing, describing, reporting, and then imagining, has been accomplished for you. Without more trouble than is needed to stay awake, the result which your imagination is always aiming at is reeled off on the screen. The shadowy idea becomes vivid, your hazy notion, let us say, of the Ku Klux Klan, thanks to Mr. Griffiths, takes vivid shape when you see the birth of a nation. Historically it may be the wrong shape, morally it may be a pernicious shape, but it is a shape, and I doubt whether anyone who has seen the film, and does not know more about the Ku Klux Klan than Mr. Griffiths, will ever hear the name again without seeing those white horsemen. And so when we speak of the mind of a group of people, of the French mind, the militarist mind, the Bolshevik mind, we are liable to serious confusion, unless we agree to separate the instinctive equipment from the stereotypes, the patterns, and the formula which play so decisive a part, in building up the mental world to which the native character is adapted and responds. Failure to make this distinction accounts for oceans of loose talk about collective minds, national souls, and race psychology. To be sure, a stereotype may be so consistently and authoritatively transmitted in each generation from parent to child, that it seems almost like a biological fact. In some respects, we may indeed have become, as Mr. Wallace says, footnote, Graham Wallace, Our Social Heritage, page 17, biologically parasitic upon our social heritage. But certainly there is not the least scientific evidence which would enable anyone to argue that men are born with the political habits of the country in which they are born. Insofar as political habits are alike in a nation, the first places to look for an explanation are the nursery, the school, the church, not in that limbo inhabited by group minds and national souls. Until you have thoroughly failed to see tradition being handed on from parents, teachers, priests, and uncles, it is a solecism of the worst order to ascribe political differences to the germplasm. It is possible to generalize tentatively and with a decent humility about comparative differences within the same category of education and experience. Yet even this is a tricky enterprise. For almost no two experiences are exactly alike, not even of two children in the same household. The older son never does have the experience of being the younger. And therefore, until we are able to discount the difference in nurture, we must withhold judgment about differences of nature. As well, judge the productivity of two soils by comparing their yield, before you know which is in Labrador and which in Iowa, whether they have been cultivated and enriched, exhausted, or allowed to run wild. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Public Opinion」by Walter Littman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion by Walter Littman. Chapter 7. Stereotypes as Defense. There is another reason, besides economy of effort, why we so often hold to our stereotypes when we might pursue a more disinterested vision. The systems of stereotypes may be the core of our personal tradition, the defenses of our position in society. They are an ordered, more or less consistent picture of the world, to which our habits, our tastes, our capacities, our comforts and our hopes have adjusted themselves. They may not be a complete picture of the world, but they are a picture of a possible world to which we are adapted. In that world people and things have their well-known places, and do certain expected things. We feel at home here. We fit in. We are members. We know the way around. There we find the charm of the familiar, the normal, the dependable. Its grooves and shapes are where we are accustomed to find them. And though we have abandoned much that might have tempted us before we creased ourselves into that mold, once we are firmly in, it fits as snugly as an old shoe. No wonder, then, that any disturbance of the stereotype seems like an attack upon the foundations of the universe. It is an attack upon the foundations of our universe, and, where big things are at stake, we do not readily admit that there is any distinction between our universe and the universe. A world which turns out to be one, in which those we honor are unworthy, and those we despise are noble, is nerve-wracking. There is anarchy if our order of precedence is not the only possible one. For if the meek should inherit the earth, 
if the first should be last, if those who are without sin alone may cast a stone, if to Caesar you render only the things that are Caesar's, then the foundations of self-respect would be shaken for those who have arranged their lives as if these maxims were not true. A pattern of stereotypes is not neutral. It is not merely a way of substituting order for the great blooming, buzzing confusion of reality. It is not merely a shortcut. It is all these things and something more. It is the guarantee of our self-respect. It is the projection upon the world of our own sense of our own value, our own position, and our own rights. The stereotypes are, therefore, highly charged with the feelings that are attached to them. They are the fortress of our tradition, and behind its defenses we can continue to feel ourselves safe in the position we occupy. When, for example, in the 4th century B.C., Aristotle wrote his defense of slavery in the face of increasing skepticism, footnote, Zimmern, Greek Commonwealth, see his footnote, page 383. The Athenian slaves were in great part indistinguishable from free citizens. Mr. Zimmern quotes an amazing passage from the old oligarch explaining the good treatment of the slaves. Quote, Suppose it were legal for a slave to be beaten by a citizen, it would frequently happen that an Athenian might be mistaken for a slave, or an alien, and receive a beating. Since the Athenian people is not better clothed than a slave or alien, nor in personal appearance is there any superiority. End quote. This absence of distinction would naturally tend to dissolve the institution. If freemen and slaves looked alike, what basis was there for treating them so differently? It was this confusion which Aristotle set himself to clear away in the first book of his politics. With unerring instinct, he understood that to justify slavery, he must teach the Greeks a way of seeing their slaves that comported with the continuance of slavery. So, said Aristotle, there are beings who are slaves by nature. Footnote, Politics, Book 1, Chapter 5. Quote, he then is by nature formed a slave, who is fitted to become the chattel of another person, and on that account is so. End quote. All this really says is that whoever happens to be a slave is by nature intended to be one. Logically, the statement is worthless, but in fact it is not a proposition at all, and logic has nothing to do with it. It is a stereotype, or rather, it is a part of a stereotype. The rest follows almost immediately. After asserting that slaves perceive reason, but are not endowed with the use of it, Aristotle insists that, quote, it is the intention of nature to make the bodies of slaves and freemen different from each other, that the one should be robust for their necessary purposes, but the other erect, useless indeed for such servile labors, but fit for civil life. It is clear, then, that some men are free by nature, and others are slaves, end quote. If we ask ourselves what is the matter with Aristotle's argument, we find that he has begun by erecting a great barrier between himself and the facts. When he said that those who are slaves are by nature intended to be slaves, he at one stroke excluded the fatal question whether those particular men who happened to be slaves were the particular men intended by nature to be slaves. For that question would have tainted each case of slavery with doubt. And since the fact of being a slave was not evidence that a man was destined to be one, no certain test would have remained. Aristotle, therefore, excluded entirely that destructive doubt. Those who are slaves are intended to be slaves. Each slaveholder was to look upon his chattels as natural slaves. When his eye had been trained to see them that way, he was to note, as confirmation of their servile character, the fact that they performed servile work, that they were competent to do servile work, and that they had the muscles to do servile work. This is the perfect stereotype. Its hallmark is that it precedes the use of reason, is a form of perception, imposes a certain character on the data of our senses before the data reach the intelligence. The stereotype is like the lavender window panes on Beacon Street, like the doorkeeper at a costume ball, who judges whether the guest has an appropriate masquerade. There is nothing so obdurate to education or to criticism as the stereotype. It stamps itself upon the evidence in the very act of securing the evidence. That is why the accounts of returning travelers are often an interesting tale, 
of what the traveler carried abroad with him on his trip. If he carried chiefly his appetite, a zeal for tiled bathrooms, a conviction that the Pullman car is the acme of human comfort, and a belief that it is proper to tip waiters, taxicab drivers, and barbers, but under no circumstances station agents and ushers, then his odyssey will be replete with good meals and bad meals, bathing adventures, compartment train escapades, and voracious demands for money. Or if he is a more serious soul, he may, while on tour, have found himself at celebrated spots. Having touched base, and cast one furtive glance at the moment, he buried his head in Baedeker, read every word through, and moved on to the next celebrated spot, and thus returned with the compact and orderly impression of Europe, rated one star or two. In some measure, stimuli from the outside, especially when they are printed or spoken words, evoke some part of a system of stereotypes, so that the actual sensation and the preconception occupy consciousness at the same time. The two are blended, much as if we looked at red through blue glasses and saw green. If what we are looking at corresponds successfully with what we anticipated, the stereotype is reinforced for the future, as it is in a man who knows in advance that the Japanese are cunning and has had the bad luck to run across two dishonest Japanese. If the experience contradicts the stereotype, one of two things happens. If the man is no longer plastic, or if some powerful interest makes it highly inconvenient to rearrange his stereotypes, he pooh-poohs the contradiction as an exception that proves the rule, discredits the witness, finds a flaw somewhere, and manages to forget it. But if he is still curious and open-minded, the novelty is taken into the picture and allowed to modify it. Sometimes, if the incident is striking enough, and if he has felt a general discomfort with his established theme, he may be shaken to such an extent as to distrust all accepted ways of looking at life, and to expect that normally a thing will not be what it is generally supposed to be. In the extreme case, especially if he is literary, he may develop a passion for inverting the moral canon by making Judas, Benedict Arnold, or Caesar Borgia the hero of his tale. The role played by the stereotype can be seen in the German tales about Belgian snipers. Those tales, curiously enough, were first refuted by an organization of German Catholic priests known as Pax. Footnote. Fernand von Langenhove, The Growth of a Legend. The author is a Belgian sociologist. The existence of atrocity stories is itself not remarkable, nor that the German people gladly believed them. But it is remarkable that a great conservative body of patriotic Germans should have set out as early as August 16, 1914, to contradict a collection of slanders on the enemy, even though such slanders were of the utmost value in soothing the troubled conscience of their fellow countrymen. Why should the Jesuit order in particular have set out to destroy a fiction so important to the fighting morale of Germany? I quote from Langenhove's account, quote, Hardly had the German armies entered Belgium when strange rumors began to circulate. They spread from place to place, they were reproduced by the press, and they soon permeated the whole of Germany. It was said that the Belgian people, instigated by the clergy, had intervened perfidiously in the hostilities, had attacked by surprise isolated detachments, had indicated to the enemy the positions occupied by the troops, that old men, and even children, had been guilty of horrible atrocities upon wounded and defenseless German soldiers, tearing out their eyes and cutting off fingers, noses, or ears, that priests from their pulpits had exhorted the people to commit these crimes, promising them as a reward the kingdom of heaven, and had even taken the lead in this barbarity. Public credulity accepted these stories. The highest powers in the state welcomed them without hesitation, and endorsed them with their authority. In this way public opinion in Germany was disturbed, and a lively indignation manifested itself, directed especially against the priests, who were held responsible for the barbarities attributed to the Belgians. By a natural diversion, the anger to which they were a prey, was directed by the Germans against the Catholic clergy generally. Protestants allowed the old religious hatred to be relighted in their minds, and delivered themselves to attacks against Catholics. A new culture conf was let loose. The Catholics did not delay in taking action against this hostile attitude. End quote. Footnote, pages 5-7. to seven. There may have been some sniping. 
It would be extraordinary if every angry Belgian had rushed to the library, opened a manual of international law, and had informed himself whether he had a right to take a pot shot at the infernal nuisance trampling through his streets. It would be no less extraordinary if an army that had never been under fire did not regard every bullet that came its way as unauthorized, because it was inconvenient, and indeed as somehow a violation of the rules of the Kriegspiel, which then constituted its only experience of war. One can imagine the more sensitive bent on convincing themselves that the people to whom they were doing such terrible things must be terrible people. And so the legend may have been spun until it reached the censors and propagandists, who, whether they believed it or not, saw its value and let it loose on the German civilians. They, too, were not altogether sorry to find that the people that they were outraging were subhuman. And, above all, since the legend came from their heroes, they were not only entitled to believe it, they were unpatriotic if they did not. But where so much is left to the imagination because the scene of action is lost in the fog of war, there is no check and no control. The legend of the ferocious Belgian priests soon tapped an old hatred. For in the minds of most patriotic Protestant Germans, especially of the upper classes, the picture of Bismarck's victories included a long quarrel with the Roman Catholics. By a process of association, Belgian priests became priests, and hatred of Belgians a vent for all their hatreds. These German Protestants did what some Americans did when under the stress of war. They created a compound object of hatred out of the enemy abroad, and all their opponents at home. Against this synthetic enemy, the Hun in Germany and the Hun within the gate, they launched all the animosity that was in them. The Catholic resistance to the atrocity tales was, of course, defensive. It was aimed at those particular fictions which aroused animosity against all Catholics rather than against Belgian Catholics alone. The information's packs, says von Langenhove, had only an ecclesiastical bearing and, quote, confined their attention almost exclusively to the reprehensible acts attributed to the priests, end quote. And yet one cannot help wondering a little about what was set in motion in the minds of German Catholics by this revelation of what Bismarck's empire meant in relation to them, and also whether there was any obscure connection between that knowledge and the fact that the prominent German politician, who was willing in the armistice to sign the death warrant of the empire, was Erzberger, the leader of the Catholic Center Party. Footnote. Since this was written, Erzberger has been assassinated. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion. Chapter 8 blind spots in their value. I have been speaking of stereotypes rather than ideals, because the word ideal is usually reserved for what we consider the good, the true, and the beautiful. Thus it carries the hint that there is something to be copied or attained. But our repertory of fixed impressions is wider than that. It contains ideal swindlers, ideal Tammany politicians, ideal jingos, ideal agitators, and ideal enemies. Our stereotyped world is not necessarily the world we should like it to be. It is simply the kind of world we expect it to be. If events correspond, there is a sense of familiarity, and we feel that we are moving with the movement of events. Our slave must be a slave by nature if we are Athenians who wish to have no qualms. If we have told our friends that we do 18 holes of golf in 95, we tell them after doing the course in 110 that we are not ourselves today. That is to say, we are not acquainted with the duffer who foozled fifteen strokes. Most of us would deal with affairs through a rather haphazard and shifting assortment of stereotypes if a comparatively few men in each generation were not constantly engaged in arranging, standardizing, and improving them into logical systems known as the laws of political economy, the principles of politics, and the like. Generally, when we write about culture, tradition, and the group mind, we are thinking of these systems perfected by men of genius. 
Now, there is no disputing the necessity of constant study and criticism of these idealized versions, but the historian of people, the politician, and the publicity man cannot stop there. For what operates in history is not the systematic idea as a genius formulated it, but shifting imitations, replicas, counterfeits, analogies, and distortions in individual minds. Thus, Marxism is not necessarily what Karl Marx wrote in Das Kapital, but whatever it is that all the warring sects believe, who claim to be the faithful. From the Gospels, you cannot deduce the history of Christianity, nor from the Constitution, the political history of America. It is Das Kapital as conceived, the Gospels as preached, and the preachment as understood, the Constitution as interpreted and administered, to which you have to go. For while there is a reciprocating influence between the standard version and the current versions, it is these current versions as distributed among men which affect their behavior. Footnote. But unfortunately, it is ever so much harder to know this actual culture than it is to summarize and to comment upon the works of genius. The actual culture exists in people far too busy to indulge in the strange trade of formulating their beliefs. They record them only incidentally, and the student rarely knows how typical are his data. Perhaps the best he can do is to follow Lord Bryce's suggestion, Modern Democracies, page 156, that he move freely, quote, among all sorts and conditions of men, end quote, to seek out the unbiased persons in every neighborhood who have skill in sizing up. Quote, there is a flair which long practice and sympathetic touch bestow. The trained observer learns how to profit by small indications, as an old sailor discerns, sooner than the landsman, the signs of coming storm. End quote. There is, in short, a vast amount of guesswork involved, and it is no wonder that scholars, who enjoy precision, so often confine their attentions to the neater formulations of other scholars. Quote, the theory of relativity, end quote, says a critic whose eyelids, like the Lady Lisa's, are a little weary, quote, promises to develop into a principle as adequate to universal application as was the theory of evolution. This latter theory, from being a technical biological hypothesis, became an inspiring guide to workers in practically every branch of knowledge, manners and customs, morals, religions, philosophies, arts, steam engines, and electric tramways. Everything had evolved. Evolution became a very general term. It also became imprecise until, in many cases, the original definite meaning of the word was lost, and the theory it had been evoked to describe was misunderstood. We are hardly enough to prophesy a similar career and fate for the theory of relativity. The technical physical theory, at present imperfectly understood, would become still more vague and dim. History repeats itself, and relativity, like evolution, after receiving a number of intelligible but somewhat inaccurate popular expositions in its scientific aspect, will be launched on a world-conquering career. We suggest that by that time it will probably be called relativismus. Many of these larger applications will doubtless be justified. Some will be absurd and a considerable number will, we imagine, reduce to truisms. And the physical theory, the mere seed of this mighty growth, will become once more the purely technical concern of scientific men. End quote. Footnote. The Times of London. Literary Supplement. June 2nd, 1921. Page 352. Professor Einstein said that when he was in America in 1921, that people tended to overestimate the influence of his theory and to underestimate its certainty. But for such a world-conquering career, an idea must correspond, however imprecisely, to something. Professor Berry shows for how long a time the idea of progress remained a speculative toy. Quote, it is not easy, end quote, he writes, footnote, J.B. Berry, The Idea of Progress, page 324. Quote, for a new idea of the speculative order to penetrate and inform the general consciousness of a community until it has assumed some external and concrete embodiment or is recommended by some striking material evidence. In the case of progress, both these conditions were fulfilled, in England, in the period 1820 to 1850, end quote. The most striking evidence was furnished by the mechanical revolution. Quote, men who were born at the beginning of the century had seen, before they had passed the age of 30, 
the rapid development of steam navigation, the illumination of towns and houses by gas, and the opening of the first railway. End quote. In the consciousness of the average householder, miracles like these form the pattern of his belief in the perfectibility of the human race. Tennyson, who was in philosophical matters a fairly normal person, tells us that when he went by the first train from Liverpool to Manchester, 1830, he thought that the wheels ran in grooves. Then he wrote this line, quote, Let the great world spin forever down the ringing grooves of change. End quote. Footnote, Tennyson, Memoir by His Son, Volume 1, page 195, cited by Barry, page 326. And so a notion more or less applicable to a journey between Liverpool and Manchester was generalized into a pattern of the universe, quote, forever, end quote. This pattern, taken up by others, reinforced by dazzling inventions, imposed an optimistic turn upon the theory of evolution. The theory, of course, is, as Professor Berry says, neutral between pessimism and optimism. But it promised continual change, and the changes visible in the world marked such extraordinary conquests of nature that the popular mind made a blend of the two. Evolution first in Darwin himself, and then more elaborately in Herbert Spencer, was a, quote, progress towards perfection, end quote. The stereotype represented by such words as progress and perfection was composed fundamentally of mechanical inventions. And mechanical it has remained, on the whole, to this day. In America more than anywhere else, the spectacle of mechanical progress has made so deep an impression that it has suffused the whole moral code. An American will endure almost any insult except the charge that he is not progressive. Be he of long native ancestry, or a recent immigrant, the aspect that has always struck his eye is the immense physical growth of American civilization. That constitutes a fundamental stereotype through which he views the world. The country village will become the great metropolis, the modest building a skyscraper. What is small shall be big, what is slow shall be fast. What is poor shall be rich, what is few shall be many, whatever is shall be more so. Not every American, of course, sees the world this way. Henry Adams didn't, and William Allen White doesn't. But those men do, who in the magazines devoted to the religion of success, appear as makers of America. They mean just about that when they preach evolution, progress, prosperity, being constructive, and the American way of doing things. It is easy to laugh, but, in fact, they are using a very great pattern of human endeavor. For one thing, it adopts an impersonal criterion. For another, it adopts an earthly criterion. For a third, it is habituating men to think quantitatively. To be sure, the ideal confuses excellence with size, happiness with speed, and human nature with contraption. Yet the same motives are at work which have ever actuated any moral code, or ever will. The desire for the biggest, the fastest, the highest, or if you are a maker of wristwatches or microscopes, the smallest, the love, in short, of the superlative and the peerless, is, in essence and possibility, a noble passion. Certainly, the American version of progress has fitted an extraordinary range of facts in the economic situation and in human nature. It turned an unusual amount of pugnacity, acquisitiveness, and lust of power into productive work. Nor has it until more recently, perhaps, seriously frustrated the active nature of the active members of the community. They have made a civilization which provides them, who made it, with what they feel to be ample satisfaction in work, mating and play, and the rush of their victory over mountains, wildernesses, distance, and human competition, has even done duty for that part of religious feeling, which is a sense of communion with the purpose of the universe." The pattern has been a success so nearly perfect in the sequence of ideals, practice, and results that any challenge to it is called un-American. And yet this pattern is a very partial and inadequate way of representing the world. The habit of thinking about progress as development has meant that many aspects of the environment were simply neglected. With the stereotype of progress before their eyes, Americans have, in the mass, seen little that did not accord with that progress. They saw the expansion of cities, but not the accretion of slums. They cheered the census statistics, but refused to consider overcrowding. They pointed with pride to their growth, 
but would not see the drift from the land or the unassimilated immigration. They expanded industry furiously at reckless cost to their natural resources. They built up gigantic corporations without arranging for industrial relations. They grew to be one of the most powerful nations on earth without preparing their institutions or their minds for the ending of their isolation. They stumbled into world war morally and physically unready, and they stumbled out again, much disillusioned, but hardly more experienced. In the world war, the good and the evil influence of the American stereotype was plainly visible. The idea that the war could be won by recruiting unlimited armies, raising unlimited credits, building an unlimited number of ships, producing unlimited munitions, and concentrating without limit on these alone, fitted the traditional stereotype and resulted in something like a physical miracle. Footnote. I have in mind the transportation and supply of two million troops overseas. Professor Wesley Mitchell points out that the total production of goods after our entrance into the war did not greatly increase in volume over that of the year of 1916, but that production for war purposes did increase. End footnote. But among those most affected by the stereotype, there was no place for the consideration of what the fruits of victory were, or how they were to be attained. Therefore, aims were ignored, or regarded as automatic, and victory was conceived because the stereotype demanded it, as nothing but an annihilating victory in the field. In peacetime you did not ask what the fastest motor car was for, and in war you did not ask what the completest victory was for. Yet in Paris the pattern did not fit the facts. In peace you can go on endlessly supplanting small things with big ones, and big ones with smaller ones. In war, when you have won absolute victory, you cannot go on to a more absolute victory. You have to do something on an entirely different pattern. And if you lack such a pattern, the end of the war is to you what it was to so many good people, an anticlimax in a dreary and savorless world. This marks the point where the stereotype and the facts that cannot be ignored definitely part company. There is always such a point, because our images of how things behave are simpler and more fixed than the ebb and flow of affairs. There comes a time, therefore, when the blind spots come from the edge of vision into the center. Then, unless there are critics who have the courage to sound an alarm, and leaders capable of understanding the change, and a people tolerant by habit, the stereotype, instead of economizing effort, and focusing energy as it did in 1917 and 1918, may frustrate effort and waste men's energy by blinding them, as it did for those people who cried for a Carthaginian peace in 1919 and deplored the Treaty of Versailles in 1921. Uncritically held, the stereotype not only censors out much that needs to be taken into account, but when the day of reckoning comes, and the stereotype is shattered, likely as not that which it did wisely take into account is shipwrecked with it. That is the punishment assessed by Mr. Bernard Shaw against free trade, free contract, free competition, natural liberty, laissez-faire, and Darwinism. A hundred years ago, when he would surely have been one of the tardest advocates of these doctrines, he would not have seen them as he sees them today, in the infidel half-century, footnote, back to Methuselah, preface, to be excuses for, quote, doing the other fellow down with impunity, all interference by a guiding government, all organization except police organization to protect legalized fraud against fisticuffs, all attempts to introduce human purpose, design, and forethought into the industrial welter being, quote, contrary to the laws of political economy, end quote. He would have seen then, as one of the pioneers of the march to the plains of heaven, footnote, the quintessence of Ibsenism, that of the kind of human purpose and design and forethought to be found in a government like that of Queen Victoria's uncles, the less the better. He would have seen, not the strong doing the weak down, but the foolish doing the strong down. He would have seen purposes, designs and forethoughts at work, obstructing invention, obstructing enterprise, obstructing what he would infallibly have recognized as the next move of creative evolution. Even now, Mr. Shaw is none too eager for the guidance of any guiding government he knows, but in theory he has turned a full loop against laissez-faire. Most advanced thinking before the war had made the same turn against the established notion that if you unloosed everything, wisdom would bubble up and establish harmony. Since the war, with its definite demonstration of guiding governments, 
assisted by censors, propagandists, and spies, Roebuck, Ramsden, and Natural Liberty have been readmitted to the company of serious thinkers. One thing is common to these cycles. There is, in each set of stereotypes, a point where effort ceases, and things happen of their own accord, as you would like them to. The progressive stereotype, powerful to incite work, almost completely obliterates the attempt to decide what work, and why that work. Laissez-faire, a blessed release from stupid officialdom, assumes that men will move by spontaneous combustion towards a pre-established harmony. Collectivism, an antidote to ruthless selfishness, seems, in the Marxist mind, to suppose an economic determinism towards efficiency and wisdom on the part of socialist officials. Strong government, imperialism at home and abroad, at its best deeply conscious of the price of disorder, relies at last on the notion that all matters to the governed will be known by the governors. In each theory there is a spot of blind automatism. That spot covers up some fact, which if it were taken into account, would check the vital movement that the stereotype provokes. If the progressive had to ask himself, like the Chinaman in the joke, what he wanted to do with the time he saved by breaking the record, if the advocate of laissez-faire had to contemplate not only free and exuberant energies of men, but what some people call their human nature, if the collectivist let the center of his attention be occupied with the problem of how he is to secure his officials, if the imperialist dared to doubt his own inspiration, you would find more Hamlet and less Henry V. For these blind spots keep away distracting images, which, with their attendant emotions, might cause hesitation and infirmity of purpose. Consequently, the stereotype not only saves time in a busy life and is a defense of our position in society, but tends to preserve us from all the bewildering effect of trying to see the world steadily and see it whole. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion by Walter Littman. Chapter Nine: Codes and Their Enemies. Anyone who has stood at the end of a railroad platform waiting for a friend will recall what queer people he mistook for him. The shape of a hat, a slightly characteristic gait, evoked the vivid image in his mind's eye. In sleep, a tinkle may sound like the pealing of a great bell, the distant stroke of a hammer like a thunderclap. For our constellations of imagery will vibrate to a stimulus that is perhaps but vaguely similar to some aspect of them. They may, in hallucination, flood the whole consciousness. They may enter very little into perception, though I am inclined to think that such an experience is extremely rare and highly sophisticated, as when we gaze blankly at a familiar word or object, and it gradually ceases to be familiar. Certainly for the most part, the way we see things is a combination of what is there and of what we expected to find. The heavens are not the same to an astronomer as to a pair of lovers, a page of Kant will start a different train of thought in a Kantian and in a radical empiricist. The Tahitian Bell is a better-looking person to her Tahitian suitor than to the readers of the National Geographic magazine. Expertness in any subject is, in fact, a multiplication of the number of aspects we are prepared to discover, plus the habit of discounting our expectations. Where to the ignoramus all things look alike, and life is just one thing after another, to the specialist, things are highly individual. For a chauffeur, an epicure, a connoisseur, a member of the president's cabinet, or a professor's wife, there are evident distinctions and qualities, not at all evident to the casual person who discusses automobiles, wines, old masters, republicans, and college faculties. But in our public opinions, few can be expert, while life is, as Mr. Bernard Shaw has made plain, so short. Those who are expert are so on only a few topics. Even among the expert soldiers, as we learned during the war, expert cavalrymen were not necessarily brilliant with trench warfare and tanks. Indeed, sometimes a little expertness on a small topic may simply exaggerate our normal human habit of trying to squeeze into our stereotypes all that can be squeezed, and of casting into outer darkness that which does not fit. 
Whatever we recognize as familiar we tend, if we are not very careful, to visualize with the aid of images already in our mind. Thus, in the American view of progress and success, there is a definite picture of human nature and of society. It is the kind of human nature and the kind of society which logically produce the kind of progress that is regarded as ideal. And then, when we seek to describe or explain actually successful men, and events that have really happened, we read back into them the qualities that are presupposed in the stereotypes. These qualities were standardized rather innocently by the older economists. They set out to describe the social system under which they lived, and found it too complicated for words. So they constructed what they sincerely hoped was a simplified diagram, not so different in principle and in veracity from the parallelogram with legs and head, in a child's drawing of a complicated cow. The scheme consisted of a capitalist who had diligently saved capital from his labor, an entrepreneur who conceived a socially useful demand and organized a factory, a collection of workmen who freely contracted, take it or leave it, for their labor, a landlord, and a group of consumers who bought in the cheapest market those goods which by the ready use of the pleasure pain calculus they knew would give them the most pleasure. The model worked. The kind of people which the model assumed living in the sort of world the model assumed invariably cooperated harmoniously in the books where the model was described. With modification and embroidery, this pure fiction, used by economists to simplify their thinking, was retailed and popularized until for large sections of the population it prevailed as the economic mythology of the day. It supplied a standard version of capitalist, promoter, worker and consumer in a society that was naturally more bent on achieving success than on explaining it. The buildings which rose and the bank accounts which accumulated were evidence that the stereotype of how the thing had been done was accurate. And those who benefited most by success came to believe they were the kind of men they were supposed to be. No wonder that the candid friends of successful men, when they read the official biography and the obituary, have to restrain themselves from asking whether this is indeed their friend. To the vanquished and the victims, the official portraiture was, of course, unrecognizable. For while those who exemplified progress did not often pause to inquire whether they had arrived according to the route laid down by the economists, or by some other just as credible, the unsuccessful people did inquire. Quote, no one, end quote, says William James, footnote, The Letters of William James, volume 1, page 65, quote, sees further into a generalization than his own knowledge of detail extends, end quote. The captains of industry saw in the great trusts monuments of their success, their defeated competitors saw the monuments of their failure, so the captains expounded the economies and virtues of big business, asked to be let alone, said they were the agents of prosperity and the developers of trade. The vanquished insisted upon the wastes and brutalities of the trusts, and called loudly upon the Department of Justice to free business from conspiracies. In the same situation one side saw progress, economy, and a splendid development, the other reaction, extravagance, and a restraint of trade. Volumes of Statistics anecdotes about the real truth and the inside truth, the deeper and the larger truth, were published to prove both sides of the argument. For when a system of stereotypes is well fixed, our attention is called to those facts which support it, and diverted from those which contradict. So perhaps it is because they are attuned to find it, that kindly people discover so much reason for kindness, malicious people so much malice. We speak quite accurately of seeing through rose-colored spectacles, or with a jaundiced eye. If, as Philip Little once wrote of a distinguished professor, we see life as through a class darkly, our stereotypes of what the best people and the lower classes are like will not be contaminated by understanding. What is alien will be rejected, what is different will fall upon unseeing eyes. We do not see what our eyes are not accustomed to take into account. Sometimes consciously, more often without knowing it, we are impressed by those facts which fit our philosophy. This philosophy is a more or less organized series of images for describing the unseen world. But not only for describing it, for judging it as well. And therefore, the stereotypes are loaded with preference, suffused with affection or dislike, attached to fears, lusts, strong wishes, pride, and hope. Whatever invokes the stereotype is judged with the appropriate sentiment. Except where we deliberately keep prejudice in suspense, 
we do not study a man and judge him to be bad. We see a bad man. We see a dewy morn, a blushing maiden, a sainted priest, a humorless Englishman, a dangerous red, a carefree Bohemian, a lazy Hindu, a wily Oriental, a dreaming Slav, a volatile Irishman, a greedy Jew, a 100% American. In the workday world that is often the real judgment, long in advance of the evidence, and it contains within itself the conclusion which the evidence is pretty certain to confirm. Neither justice, nor mercy, nor truth, enter into such a judgment, for the judgment has preceded the evidence. Yet a people without prejudices, a people with altogether neutral vision, is so unthinkable in any civilization of which it is useful to think, that no scheme of education could be based upon that ideal. Prejudice can be detected, discounted, and refined, but so long as finite men must compress into a short schooling, preparation for dealing with a vast civilization, they must carry pictures of it around with them, and have prejudices. The quality of their thinking and doing will depend on whether those prejudices are friendly, friendly to other people, to other ideas, whether they evoke love of what is felt to be positively good, rather than hatred of what is not contained in their version of the good. Morality, good taste, and good form first standardize and then emphasize certain of these underlying prejudices. As we adjust ourselves to our code, we adjust the facts we see to that code. Rationally, the facts are neutral to all our views of right and wrong. Actually, our canons determine greatly what we shall perceive and how. For a moral code is a scheme of conduct applied to a number of typical instances. To behave as the code directs is to serve whatever purpose the code pursues. It may be God's will, or the king's, individual salvation in a good, solid, three-dimensional paradise, success on earth, or the service of mankind. In any event, the makers of the code fix upon certain typical situations, and then by some form of reasoning or intuition, deduce the kind of behavior which would produce the aim they acknowledge. The rules apply where they apply. But in daily living how does a man know whether his predicament is the one the lawgiver had in mind? He is told not to kill, but if his children are attacked, may he kill to stop a killing? The Ten Commandments are silent on the point. Therefore, around every code there is a cloud of interpreters who deduce more specific cases. Suppose, then, that the doctors of the law decide that he may kill in self-defense. For the next man, the doubt is almost as great. How does he know that he is defining self-defense correctly, or that he has not misjudged the facts, imagined the attack, and is really the aggressor? Perhaps he has provoked the attack, but what is a provocation? Exactly these confusions infected the minds of most Germans in August 1914. Far more serious in the modern world than any difference of moral code, is the difference in the assumptions about facts to which the code is applied. Religious, moral, and political formula are nothing like so far apart as the facts assumed by their votaries. Useful discussion, then, instead of comparing ideals, re-examines the visions of the facts. Thus, the rule that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you rests on the belief that human nature is uniform. Mr. Bernard Shaw's statement that you should not do unto others what you would not have them do unto you, because their tastes may be different, rests on the belief that human nature is not uniform. The maxim that competition is the life of trade consists of a whole tome of assumptions about economic motives, industrial relations, and the working of a particular commercial system. The claim that America will never have a merchant marine, unless it is privately owned and managed, assumes a certain proved connection between a certain kind of profit-making and incentive. The justification by the Bolshevik propagandist of the dictatorship, espionage, and the terror, because, quote, every state is an apparatus of violence, end quote. Footnote, C. Two Years of Conflict on the Internal Front, published by the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic, Moscow, 1920. Translated by Malcolm W. Davis for the New York Evening Post, January 15, 1921, is a historical judgment, the truth of which is by no means self-evident to a non-communist. At the core of every moral code, there is a picture of human nature, a map of the universe, and a version of history. To human nature, of the sort conceived, in a universe of the kind imagined, after a history so understood, the rules of the code apply. 
So far as the facts of personality, of the environment and of memory are different, by so far the rules of the code are different to apply with success. Now, every moral code has to conceive human psychology, the material world, and tradition, some way or other. But in the codes that are under the influence of science, the conception is known to be a hypothesis, whereas in the codes that come unexamined from the past, or bubble up from the caverns of the mind, the conception is not taken as a hypothesis demanding proof or contradiction, but as a fiction accepted without question. In one case, man is humble about his beliefs, because he knows they are tentative and incomplete. In the other, he is dogmatic, because his belief is a completed myth. The moralist who submits to the scientific discipline knows that though he does not know everything, he is in the way of knowing something. The dogmatist, using a myth, believes himself to share part of the insight of omniscience, though he lacks the criteria by which to tell truth from error. For the distinguishing mark of a myth is that truth and error, fact and fable, report and fantasy, are all on the same plane of credibility. The myth is, then, not necessarily false. It might happen to be wholly true, it may happen to be partly true. If it has affected human conduct a long time, it is almost certain to contain much that is profoundly and importantly true. What a myth never contains is the critical power to separate its truths from its errors. For that power comes only by realizing that no human opinion, whatever its supposed origin, is too exalted for the test of evidence, that every opinion is only somebody's opinion. And if you ask why the test of evidence is preferable to any other, there is no answer unless you are willing to use the test in order to test it. The statement is, I think, susceptible of overwhelming proof that moral codes assume a particular view of the facts. Under the term moral codes, I include all kinds, personal, family, economic, professional, legal, patriotic, and international. At the center of each there is a pattern of stereotypes about psychology, sociology, and history. The same view of human nature, institutions, or tradition rarely persists through all our codes. Compare, for example, the economic and the patriotic codes. There is a war supposed to affect all alike. Two men are partners in business. One enlists, the other takes a war contract. The soldier sacrifices everything, perhaps even his life. He is paid a dollar a day, and no one says, no one believes, that you could make a better soldier out of him by any form of economic incentive. That motive disappears out of his human nature. The contractor sacrifices very little, is paid a handsome profit over costs, and few say or believe that he would produce the munitions if there was no economic incentive. That may be unfair to him. The point is that the accepted patriotic code assumes one kind of human nature, the commercial code, another. And the codes are probably founded on true expectations to this extent. When a man adopts a certain code, he tends to exhibit the kind of human nature which the code demands. That is one reason why it is so dangerous to generalize about human nature. A loving father can be a sour boss, an earnest municipal reformer, and a rapacious jingo abroad. His family life, his business career, his politics, and his foreign policy rest on totally different versions of what others are like, and of how he should act. These versions differ by codes in the same person. The codes differ somewhat among persons in the same social set, differ widely as between social sets, and between two nations, or two colors, may differ to the point where there is no common assumption whatever. That is why two people professing the same stock of religious beliefs can go to war. The element of their belief which determines conduct is that view of the facts which they assume. That is where codes enter so subtly and so pervasively into the making of public opinion. The orthodox theory holds that a public opinion constitutes a moral judgment on a group of facts. The theory I am suggesting is that, in the present state of education, a public opinion is primarily a moralized and codified version of the facts. I am arguing that the pattern of stereotypes at the center of our codes largely determines what group of facts we shall see and in what light we shall see them. That is why, with the best will in the world, the news policy of a journal tends to support its editorial policy, why a capitalist sees one set of facts and certain aspects of human nature, literally, sees them, his socialist opponent another set and other aspects, 
and why each regards the other as unreasonable or perverse, when the real difference between them is a difference of perception. That difference is imposed by the difference between the capitalist and socialist pattern of stereotypes. Quote, there are no classes in America, end quote, writes an American editor. Quote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, end quote, says the Communist Manifesto. If you have the editor's pattern in your mind, you will see vividly the facts that confirm it, vaguely and ineffectively those that contradict. If you have the communist pattern, you will not only look for different things, but you will see with a totally different emphasis what you and the editor happen to see in common. And since my moral system rests on my accepted version of the facts, he who denies either my moral judgment or my version of the facts is to me perverse, alien, and dangerous. How shall I account for him? The opponent has always to be explained, and the last explanation that we ever look for is that he sees a different set of facts. Such an explanation we avoid, because it saps the very foundation of our own assurance that we have seen life steadily and seen it whole. It is only when we are in the habit of recognizing our opinions as a partial experience seen through our stereotypes that we become truly tolerant of an opponent. Without that habit, we believe in the absolutism of our own vision, and consequently in the treacherous character of all opposition. For while men are willing to admit that there are two sides to a question, they do not believe that there are two sides to what they regard as a fact. And they never do believe it until after long critical education, they are fully conscious of how second-hand and subjective is their apprehension of their social data. So where two factions see vividly each its own aspect, and contrive their own explanations of what they see, it is almost impossible for them to credit each other with honesty. If the pattern fits their experience at a crucial point, they no longer look upon it as an interpretation. They look upon it as reality. It may not resemble the reality, except that it culminates in a conclusion which fits a real experience. I may represent my trip from New York to Boston by a straight line on a map, just as a man may regard his triumph as the end of a straight and narrow path. The road by which I actually went to Boston may have involved many detours, much turning and twisting, just as his road may have involved much besides pure enterprise, labor, and thrift. But provided I reach Boston and he succeeds, the airline and the straight path will serve as ready-made charts. Only when somebody tries to follow them, and does not arrive, do we have to answer objections. If we insist on our charts, and he insists on rejecting them, we soon tend to regard him as a dangerous fool, and he to regard us as liars and hypocrites. Thus, we gradually paint portraits of each other. For the opponent presents himself as the man who says, Evil, be thou my good. He is an annoyance who does not fit into the scheme of things. Nevertheless, he interferes. And since that scheme is based in our minds on incontrovertible fact fortified by irresistible logic, some place has to be found for him in the scheme. Rarely in politics or industrial disputes is a place made for him by the simple admission that he has looked upon the same reality and seen another aspect of it. That would shake the whole scheme. To the Italians in Paris, Fiuma was Italian. It was not merely a city that would be desirable to include within the Italian kingdom. It was Italian. They fixed their whole mind upon the Italian majority within the legal boundaries of the city itself. The American delegates, having seen more Italians in New York than there are in Fiuma, without regarding New York as Italian, fixed their eyes on Fiuma as a central European port of entry. They saw vividly the Yugoslavs in the suburbs and the non-Italian hinterland. Some of the Italians in Paris were therefore in need of a convincing explanation of the American perversity. They found it in a rumor which started, no one knows where, that an influential American diplomat was in the snares of a Yugoslav mistress. She had been seen, he had been seen, at Versailles just off the boulevard, the villa with the large trees. This is a rather common way of explaining away opposition. In their more libelous forms, such charges rarely reach the printed page, and a Roosevelt may have to wait years, or a Harding, months, before he can force an issue, and end a whispering campaign that has reached into every circle of talk. Public men have to endure a fearful amount of poisonous clubroom, dinner table, boudoir slander, 
repeated, elaborated, chuckled over, and regarded as delicious. While this sort of thing is, I believe, less prevalent in America than in Europe, yet rare is the American official about whom somebody is not repeating a scandal. Out of the opposition we make villains and conspiracies. If the prices go up unmercifully, the profiteers have conspired. If the newspapers misrepresent the news, there is a capitalist plot. If the rich are too rich, they have been stealing. If a closely fought election is lost, the electorate was corrupted. If a statesman does something of which you disapprove, he has been bought or influenced by some discreditable person. If working men are restless, they are the victims of agitators. If they are restless over wide areas, there is a conspiracy on foot. If you do not produce enough airplanes, it is the work of spies. If there is trouble in Ireland, it is German or Bolshevik gold. And if you go stark, staring mad, looking for plots, you will see all strikes, the plum plan, Irish rebellion, Islamic unrest, the restoration of King Constantine, the League of Nations, Mexican disorder, the movement to reduce armaments, Sunday movies, short skirts, evasion of the liquor laws, Negro self-assertion, as subplots under some grandiose plot engineered by either Moscow, Rome, the Freemasons, the Japanese, or the elders of Zion. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter Ten The Detection of Stereotypes. Skilled diplomatists, compelled to talk out loud to the warring peoples, learned how to use a large repertory of stereotypes. They were dealing with a precarious alliance of powers, each of which was maintaining its war unity only by the most careful leadership. The ordinary soldier and his wife, heroic and selfless beyond anything in the chronicles of courage, were still not heroic enough to face death gladly, for all the ideas which were said by the foreign offices of foreign powers to be essential to the future of civilization. There were ports, mines, rocky mountain passes, and villages, that few soldiers would willingly have crossed no man's land to obtain for their allies. Now it happened in one nation that the war party which was in control of the foreign office, the high command, and most of the press, had claims on the territory of several of its neighbors. These claims were called the Greater Ruritania by the cultivated classes who regarded Kipling, Treitschka, and Maurice Beres as 100% Ruritanian. But the grandiose idea aroused no enthusiasm abroad. So holding this finest flower of the Ruritanian genius, as their poet laureate said, to their hearts, Ruritania statesmen went forth to divide and conquer. They divided the claim into sectors. For each piece they invoked that stereotype which some one or more of their allies found it difficult to resist, because that ally had claims for which it hoped to find approval by the use of this same stereotype. The first sector happened to be a mountainous region inhabited by alien peasants. Ruritania demanded it to complete her natural geographical frontier. If you fixed your attention long enough on the ineffable value of what is natural, those alien peasants just dissolved into fog, and only the slope of the mountains was visible. The next sector was inhabited by Ruritanians, and on the principle that no people ought to live under alien rule, they were re-annexed. Then came a city of considerable commercial importance, not inhabited by Ruritanians. But until the 18th century it had been part of Ruritania, and on the principle of historic right it was annexed. Farther on, there was a splendid mineral deposit, owned by aliens and worked by aliens. On the principle of reparation for damage, it was annexed. Beyond this there was a territory inhabited 97% by aliens, constituting the natural geographical frontier of another nation, never historically a part of Ruritania. But one of the provinces which had been federated into Ruritania had formerly traded in those markets, and the upper-class culture was Ruritanian. On the principle of cultural superiority and the necessity of defending civilization, the lands were claimed. Finally, there was a port wholly disconnected from Ruritania geographically, ethnically, economically, historically, and traditionally. 
It was demanded on the ground that it was needed for national defense. In the treaties that concluded the Great War, you can multiply examples of this kind. Now, I do not wish to imply that I think it was possible to resettle Europe consistently on any one of these principles. I am certain that it was not. The very use of these principles, so pretentious and so absolute, meant that the spirit of accommodation did not prevail and that, therefore, the substance of peace was not there. For the moment you start to discuss factories, mines, mountains, or even political authority, as perfect examples of some eternal principle or other, you are not arguing, you are fighting. That eternal principle censors out all the objections, isolates the issue from its background and its context, and sets going in you some strong emotion, appropriate enough to the principle, highly inappropriate to the docks, warehouses, and real estate. And having started in that mood, you cannot stop. A real danger exists. To meet it, you have to invoke more absolute principles in order to defend what is open to attack. Then you have to defend the defenses, erect buffers, and buffers for the buffers, until the whole affair is so scrambled that it seems less dangerous to fight than to keep on talking. There are certain clues which often help in detecting the false absolutism of a stereotype. In the case of the Ruritanian propaganda, the principles blanketed each other so rapidly that one could readily see how the argument had been constructed. The series of contradictions showed that for each sector, that stereotype was employed which would obliterate all the facts that interfered with the claim. Contradiction of this sort is often a good clue. Inability to take account of space is another. In the spring of 1918, for example, large numbers of people, appalled by the withdrawal of Russia, demanded the, quote, re-establishment of an eastern front, end quote. The war, as they had conceived it, was on two fronts, and when one of them disappeared there was an instant demand that it be recreated. The unemployed Japanese army was to man the front, substituting for the Russian. But there was one insuperable obstacle. Between Vladivostok and the eastern battle line, there were 5,000 miles of country, spanned by one broken-down railway. Yet those 5,000 miles would not stay in the minds of the enthusiasts. So overwhelming was their conviction that an eastern front was needed, and so great their confidence in the valor of the Japanese army, that, mentally, they had projected that army from Vladivostok to Poland on a magic carpet. In vain, our military authorities argued that to land troops on the rim of Siberia had as little to do with reaching the Germans as climbing from the cellar to the roof of the Woolworth building had to do with reaching the moon. The stereotype in this instance was the war on two fronts. Ever since men had begun to imagine the Great War, they had conceived Germany between France and Russia. One generation of strategists, and perhaps two, had lived with that visual image as the starting point of all their calculations. For nearly four years every battle map they saw had deepened the impression that this was the war. When affairs took a new turn, it was not easy to see them as they were then. They were seen through the stereotype, and facts which conflicted with it, such as the distance from Japan to Poland, were incapable of coming vividly into consciousness. It is interesting to note that the American authorities dealt with the new facts more realistically than the French. In part, this was because, previous to 1914, they had no preconception of a war upon the continent, in part because the Americans, engrossed in the mobilization of their forces, had a vision of the Western Front which was itself a stereotype that excluded from their consciousness any very vivid sense of the other theaters of war. In the spring of 1918 this American view could not compete with the traditional French view, because while the Americans believed enormously in their own powers, the French at that time, before Contini and the Second Marne, had the gravest doubts. The American confidence suffusing the American stereotype gave it that power to possess consciousness, that liveliness and sensible pungency, that stimulating effect upon the will, that congruity with the activity in hand, which James notes as characteristic of what we regard as real. Footnote, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, page 300. The French, in despair, remained fixed on their accepted image. And when facts, gross geographical facts, would not fit in with the preconception, they were either censored out of mind, or the facts were themselves stretched out of shape. Thus, 
the difficulty of the Japanese reaching the Germans 5,000 miles away was, in measure, overcome by bringing the Germans more than halfway to meet them. Between March and June 1918, there was supposed to be a German army operating in eastern Siberia. This phantom army consisted of some German prisoners actually seen, more German prisoners thought about, and chiefly of the delusion that those 5,000 intervening miles did not really exist. Footnote. See in this connection Mr. Charles Grasty's interview with Marshall Folk, New York Times, January 26, 1918. Quote, Germany is walking through Russia. America and Japan, who are in a position to do so, should go to meet her in Siberia. End quote. See also the resolution by Senator King of Utah, June 10, 1918 and Mr. Taft's statement in the New York Times, June 11, 1918, and the appeal to America on May 5, 1918, by Mr. A.J. Sack, director of the Russian Information Bureau. Quote, If Germany were in the Allied place, she would have three million fighting on the East Front within a year. End quote. A true conception of space is not a simple matter. If I draw a straight line on a map between Bombay and Hong Kong and measure the distance, I have learned nothing whatever about the distance I should have to cover on a voyage. And even if I measure the actual distance that I must traverse, I still know very little until I know what ships are in the service, when they run, how fast they go, whether I can secure accommodation and afford to pay for it. In practical life, space is a matter of available transportation, not of geometrical planes, as the old railroad magnate knew when he threatened to make grass grow, in the streets of a city that had offended him. If I am motoring and ask how far it is to my destination, I curse as an unmitigated booby, the man who tells me it is three miles and does not mention a six-mile detour. It does me no good to be told that it is three miles if you walk. I might as well be told it is one mile as the crow flies. I do not fly like a crow, and I am not walking either. I must know that it is nine miles for a motor car, and also if that is the case, that six of them are ruts and puddles. I call the pedestrian a nuisance who tells me it is three miles, and think evil of the aviator who told me it was one mile. Both of them are talking about the space they have to cover, not the space I must cover. In the drawing of boundary lines, absurd complications have arisen through failure to conceive the practical geography of a region. Under some general formula like self-determination, Statesmen have at various times drawn lines on maps, which, when surveyed on the spot, ran through the middle of a factory, down the center of a village street, diagonally across the nave of a church, or between the kitchen and bedroom of a peasant's cottage. There have been frontiers in a grazing country which separated pasture from water, pasture from market, and in an industrial country, railheads from railroad. On the colored ethnic map the line was ethnically just, that is to say, just in the world of that ethnic map. But time, no less than space, fares badly. A common example is that of the man who tries by making an elaborate will to control his money long after his death. Quote, it had been the purpose of the first William James, end quote, writes his great-grandson Henry James, footnote, The Letters of William James, volume 1, page 6, quote, to provide that his children several of whom were under age when he died, should qualify themselves by industry and experience to enjoy the large patrimony which he expected to bequeath to them, and with that in view, he left a will which was a voluminous compound of restraints and instructions. He showed, thereby, how great were both his confidence in his own judgment and his solicitude for the moral welfare of his descendants. End quote. The courts upset the will. For the law, in its objection to perpetuities, recognizes that there are distinct limits to the usefulness of allowing anyone to impose his moral stencil upon an unknown future. But the desire to impose it is a very human trait, so human that the law permits it to operate for a limited time after death. The amending clause of any constitution is a good index of the confidence the authors entertained about the reach of their opinions in the succeeding generations. There are, I believe, American state constitutions which are almost incapable of amendment. The men who made them could have had but little sense of the flux of time. To them, the here and now was so brilliantly certain, the hereafter so vague or so terrifying, that they had the courage to say how life should run after they were gone. 
And then, because constitutions are difficult to amend, zealous people with a taste for Mortmain have loved to write on this imperishable brass all kinds of rules and restrictions that, given any decent humility about the future, ought to be no more permanent than an ordinary statute. A presumption about time enters widely into our opinions. To one person an institution which has existed for the whole of his conscious life is part of the permanent furniture of the universe. To another it is ephemeral. Geological time is very different from biological time. Social time is most complex. The statesman has to decide whether to calculate for the emergency or for the long run. Some decisions have to be made on the basis of what will happen in the next two hours, others on what will happen in a week, a month, a season, a decade, when the children have grown up, or their children's children. An important part of wisdom is the ability to distinguish the time conception that properly belongs to the thing in hand. The person who uses the wrong time conception ranges from the dreamer who ignores the present to the Philistine who can see nothing else. A true scale of values has a very acute sense of relative time. Distant time, past and future, has somehow to be conceived. But as James says, quote, of the longer duration, we have no direct realizing sense. End quote. Footnote. Principles of Psychology, Volume 1, page 638. The longest duration which we immediately feel is what is called the specious present. It endures, according to Tickner, for about six seconds. Footnote, cited by Warren, Human Psychology, page 255. Quote, All impressions within this period of time are present to us at once. This makes it possible for us to perceive changes and events, as well as stationary objects. The perceptual present is supplemented by the ideational present. Through the combination of perceptions with memory images, entire days, months, and even years of the past are brought together into the present. End quote. In this ideational present, vividness, as James said, is proportionate to the number of discriminations we perceive within it. Thus, a vacation in which we were bored with nothing to do passes slowly while we are in it, but seems very short in memory. Great activity kills time rapidly, but in memory its duration is long. On the relation between the amount we discriminate and our time perspective, James has an interesting passage, footnote, Principles of Psychology, Volume 1, page 639. Quote, We have every reason to think that creatures may possibly differ enormously, in the amounts of duration which they intuitively feel, and in the fineness of the events that may fill it. Von Baer has indulged in some interesting computations of the effect of such differences in changing the aspect of nature. Suppose we were able, within the length of a second, to note 10,000 events distinctly, instead of barely 10 as now. Footnote. In the moving picture this effect is admirably produced by the ultra-rapid camera. If our life were then destined to hold the same number of impressions, it might be 1,000 times as short. We should live less than a month, and personally know nothing of the change of seasons. If born in winter, we should believe in summer as we now believe in the heats of the Carboniferous era. The motions of organic beings would be so slow to our senses as to be inferred, not seen. The sun would stand still in the sky, the moon be almost free from change, and so on. But now reverse the hypothesis and suppose a being, to get only one one-thousandth part of the sensations we get in a given time, and consequently to live one thousand times as long. Winters and summers will be to him like quarters of an hour. Mushrooms and the swifter growing plants will shoot into being so rapidly as to appear instantaneous creations. Annual shrubs will rise and fall from the earth like restless boiling water springs. The motions of animals will be as invisible as are to us the movements of bullets and cannonballs. The sun will scour through the sky like a meteor, leaving a fiery trail behind him, etc. End quote. In his outline of history, Mr. Wells has made a gallant effort to visualize, quote, the true proportions of historical to geological time, end quote. Footnote, volume 2, page 605. See also, James Harvey Robinson, The New History, page 239. On a scale which represents the time from Columbus to ourselves by three inches of space, the reader would have to walk 55 feet to see the date of the painters of the Altamara Caves, 550 feet to see the earlier Neanderthalers, a mile or so to see the last of the dinosaurs. 
more or less precise chronology does not begin until after 1000 BC, and at that time, quote, Sargon I of the Akkadian Sumerian Empire was a remote memory, more remote than is Constantine the Great from the world of the present day. Hammurabi had been dead a thousand years. Stonehenge in England was already a thousand years old. End quote. Mr. Wells was writing with a purpose. Quote, in the brief period of ten thousand years, these units, into which men have combined, have grown from the small family tribe of the early Neolithic culture to the vast united realms, vast yet still too small and partial, of the present time. End quote. Mr. Wells hoped by changing the time perspective on our present problems to change the moral perspective. Yet the astronomical measure of time, the geological, the biological, any telescopic measure which minimizes the present is not, quote, more time than a microscopic. Mr. Simon Strunsky is right when he insists that, quote, if Mr. Wells is thinking of his subtitle, The Probable Future of Mankind, he is entitled to ask for any number of centuries to work out his solution. If he is thinking of the salvaging of this Western civilization, reeling under the effects of the Great War, he must think in decades and scores of years. End quote. Footnote. In a review of the salvaging of civilization, the literary review of the New York Evening Post, June 18, 1921, page 5. It all depends upon the practical purpose for which you adopt the measure. There are situations when the time perspective needs to be lengthened, and others when it needs to be shortened. The man who says that it does not matter if 15 million Chinese die of famine, because in two generations the birth rate will make up the loss, has used the time perspective to excuse his inertia. A person who pauperizes a healthy young man, because he is sentimentally overimpressed with an immediate difficulty, has lost sight of the duration of the beggar's life. The people who for the sake of an immediate peace are willing to buy off an aggressive empire by indulging its appetite, have allowed a specious present to interfere with the peace of their children. The people who will not be patient with the troublesome neighbor, who want to bring everything to a showdown, are no less the victims of a specious present. Into almost every social problem, the proper calculation of time enters. Suppose, for example, it is a question of timber. Some trees grow faster than others. Then, a sound forest policy is one in which the amount of each species, and of each age, cut in each season is made good by replanting. In so far as that calculation is correct, the truest economy has been reached. To cut less is waste, and to cut more is exploitation. But there may come an emergency, say, the need for airplane spruce in a war, when the year's allowance must be exceeded. An alert government will recognize that, and regard the restoration of the balance as a charge upon the future. Coal involves a different theory of time, because coal, unlike a tree, is produced on the scale of geological time. The supply is limited. Therefore, a correct social policy involves intricate computation of the available reserves of the world, the indicated possibilities, the present rate of use, the present economy of use, and the alternative fuels. But when that computation has been reached, it must finally be squared with an ideal standard involving time. Suppose, for example, that engineers conclude that the present fuels are being exhausted at a certain rate, that barring new discoveries, industry will have to enter a phase of contraction at some definite time in the future. We have then to determine how much thrift and self-denial we will use after all feasible economies have been exercised in order not to rob posterity. But what shall we consider posterity? Our grandchildren? Our great-grandchildren? Perhaps we shall decide to calculate on a hundred years, believing that to be ample time for the discovery of alternative fuels, if the necessity is made clear at once. The figures are, of course, hypothetical. But in calculating that way, we shall be employing what reason we have. We shall be giving social time its place in public opinion. Let us now imagine a somewhat different case, a contract between a city and a trolley car company. The company says that it will not invest its capital unless it is granted a monopoly of the main highway for 99 years. In the minds of the men who make that demand, 99 years is so long as to mean forever. But suppose there is reason to think that surface cars, run from a central power plant on tracks, are going out of fashion in 20 years. Then it is a most unwise contract to make, 
for you are virtually condemning a future generation to inferior transportation. In making such a contract, the city officials lack a realizing sense of 99 years. Far better to give the company a subsidy now, in order to attract capital, than to stimulate investment by indulging a fallacious sense of eternity. No city official and no company official has a sense of real time when he talks about 99 years. Popular history is a happy hunting ground of time confusions. To the average Englishman, for example, the behavior of Cromwell, the corruption of the Act of Union, the famine of 1847, are wrongs suffered by people long dead and done by actors long dead with whom no living person, Irish or English, has any real connection. But in the mind of a patriotic Irishman, these same events are almost contemporary. His memory is like one of those historical paintings where Virgil and Dante sit side by side conversing. These perspectives and four shortcomings are a great barrier between peoples. It is ever so difficult for a person of one tradition to remember what is contemporary in the tradition of another. Almost nothing that goes by the name of historic rights or historic wrongs can be called a truly objective view of the past. Take, for example, the Franco-German debate about Alsace-Lorraine. It all depends on the original date you select. If you start with the Rorachi and Sequani, the lands are historically part of ancient Gaul. If you prefer Henry I, they are historically a German territory. If you take 1273, they belong to the House of Austria. If you take 1648 and the Peace of Westphalia, most of them are French. If you take Louis XIV and the year 1688, they are almost all French. If you are using the argument from history, you are fairly certain to select those dates in the past which support your view of what should be done now. Arguments about races and nationalities often betray the same arbitrary view of time. During the war, under the influence of powerful feeling, the difference between Teutons on the one hand and Anglo-Saxons and French on the other was popularly believed to be an eternal difference. They had always been opposing races. Yet a generation ago, historians, like Freeman, were emphasizing the common Teutonic origin of the West European peoples, and ethnologists would certainly insist that the Germans, English, and the greater part of the French are branches of what was once a common stock. The general rule is, if you like a people today, you come down the branches to the trunk. If you dislike them, you insist that the separate branches are separate trunks. In one case, you fix your attention on the period before they were distinguishable. In the other, on the period after which they became distinct. And the view which fits the mood is taken as the truth. An amiable variation is the family tree. Usually one couple are appointed the original ancestors, if possible, a couple associated with an honorific event like the Norman conquest. That couple have no ancestors. They are not descendants. Yet they were the descendants of ancestors, and the expression that so-and-so was the founder of his house means not that he is the atom of his family, but that he is the particular ancestor from whom it is desirable to start, or perhaps the earliest ancestor of which there is a record. But genealogical tables exhibit a deeper prejudice. Unless the female line happens to be especially remarkable, descent is traced down through the males. The tree is male. At various moments, females accrue to it as itinerant bees light upon an ancient apple tree. But the future is the most elusive time of all. Our temptation here is to jump over necessary steps in the sequence, and as we are governed by hope or doubt, to exaggerate or to minimize the time required to complete various parts of the process. The discussion of the role to be exercised by wage earners in the management of industry is riddled with this difficulty. For management is a word that covers many functions. Footnote. Carter L. Goodrich, The Frontier of Control. Some of these require no training, some require a little training, others can be learned only in a lifetime. And the truly discriminating program of industrial democratization would be one based on the proper time sequence, so that the assumption of responsibility would run parallel to a complementary program of industrial training. The proposal for a sudden dictatorship of the proletariat is an attempt to do away with the intervening time of preparation, the resistance to all sharing of responsibility, an attempt to deny the alteration of human capacity in the course of time. Primitive notions of democracy, such as rotation in office and contempt for the expert, 
are really nothing but the old myth that the goddess of wisdom sprang mature and fully armed from the brow of Jove. They assume that what it takes years to learn need not be learned at all. Whenever the phrase, backward people, is used as the basis of a policy, the conception of time is a decisive element. The covenant of the League of Nations says, footnote, article 19, for example, that, quote, the character of the mandate must differ according to the stage of the development of the people, end quote, as well as on other grounds. Certain communities, it asserts, quote, have reached a stage of development, end quote, where their independence can be provisionally recognized, subject to advice and assistance, quote, until such time as they are able to stand alone, end quote. The way in which the mandatories and the mandated conceive that time will influence deeply their relations. Thus, in the case of Cuba, the judgment of the American government virtually coincided with that of the Cuban patriots, and though there has been trouble, there is no finer page in the history of how strong powers have dealt with the weak. Oftener in that history the estimates have not coincided. Where the imperial people, whatever its public expressions, has been deeply convinced that the backwardness of the backward was so hopeless as not to be worth remedying, or so profitable that it was not desirable to remedy it, the tie has festered and poisoned the peace of the world. There have been a few cases, very few, where backwardness has meant to the ruling power the need for a program of forwardness, a program with definite standards and definite estimates of time. Far more frequently, so frequently in fact as to seem the rule, backwardness has been conceived as an intrinsic and eternal mark of inferiority. And then, every attempt to be less backward has been frowned upon as the sedition, which, under these conditions, it undoubtedly is. In our own race wars we can see some of the results of the failure to realize that time would gradually obliterate the slave morality of the Negro, and that social adjustment based on this morality would begin to break down. It is not hard to picture the future as if it obeyed our present purposes, to annihilate whatever delays our desire, or immortalize whatever stands between us and our fears. In putting together our public opinions, not only do we have to picture more space than we can see with our eyes, and more time than we can feel, but we have to describe and generalize more people, more actions, more things than we could ever count, or vividly imagine. We have to summarize and generalize. We have to pick out samples, and treat them as typical. To pick a fairly good sample of a large class is not easy. The problem belongs to the science of statistics, and it is a most difficult affair for anyone whose mathematics is primitive, and mind remain azoic, in spite of the half-dozen manuals which I once devoutly imagined that I understood. All they have done for me is to make me a little more conscious of how hard it is to classify and to sample, how readily we spread a little butter over the whole universe. Some time ago, a group of social workers in Sheffield, England, started out to substitute an accurate picture of the mental equipment of the workers of that city for the impressionistic one they had. Footnote, the equipment of the worker. They wished to say, with some decent grounds for saying it, how the workers of Sheffield were equipped. They found, as we all find the moment we refused to let our first notion prevail, that they were beset with complications. Of the test they employed, nothing need be said here except that it was a large questionnaire. For the sake of the illustration, assume that the questions were a fair test of mental equipment for English city life. Theoretically, then, those questions should have been put to every member of the working class, but it is not so easy to know who are the working class. However, assume again that the census knows how to classify them. Then there were roughly 104,000 men and 107,000 women who ought to have been questioned. They possessed the answers which would justify or refute the casual phrase about the ignorant workers or the intelligent workers. But nobody could think of questioning the whole 200,000. So the social workers consulted an eminent statistician, Professor Bowley. He advised them that not less than 408 men and 408 women would prove to be a fair sample. According to mathematical calculation, this number would not show a greater deviation from the average than 1 in 22. They had, therefore, to question at least 816 people before they could pretend to talk about the average working man. But which 816 people should they approach? Quote, 
we might have gathered particulars concerning workers to whom one or another of us had a pre-inquiry access. We might have worked through philanthropic gentlemen and ladies who were in contact with certain sections of workers at a club, a mission, an infirmary, a place of worship, a settlement. But such a method of selection would produce entirely worthless results. The workers thus selected would not be in any sense representative of what is popularly called the average run of workers. They would represent nothing but the little coteries to which they belonged. Quote, the right way of securing victims, to which at immense cost of time and labor we rigidly adhered, is to get hold of your workers by some neutral or accidental or random method of approach. End quote. This they did, and after all these precautions, they came to no more definite conclusion than that on their classification and according to their questionnaire, among 200,000 Sheffield workers about one quarter were well equipped, approaching three quarters were inadequately equipped, and about one fifteenth were mal equipped. End quote. Compare this conscientious and almost pedantic method of arriving at an opinion with our usual judgments about masses of people about the volatile Irish, and the logical French, and the disciplined Germans, and the ignorant Slavs, and the honest Chinese, and the untrustworthy Japanese, and so on and so on. All these are generalizations drawn from samples, but the samples are selected by a method that statistically is wholly unsound. Thus, the employer will judge labor by the most troublesome employee, or the most docile that he knows, and many a radical group has imagined that it was a fair sample of the working class. How many women's views on the servant question are little more than the reflection of their own treatment of their servants? The tendency of the casual mind is to pick out or stumble upon a sample which supports or defies its prejudices, and then to make it the representative of a whole class. A great deal of confusion arises when people decline to classify themselves as we have classified them. Prophecy would be so much easier if only they would stay where we put them. But, as a matter of fact, a phrase like the working class will only cover some of the truth for part of the time. When you take all the people below a certain level of income and call them the working class, you cannot help assuming that the people so classified will behave in accordance with your stereotype. Just who those people are you are not quite certain. Factory hands and mine workers fit in more or less but farmhands, small farmers, peddlers, little shopkeepers, clerks, servants, soldiers, policemen, and firemen slip out of the net. The tendency, when you are appealing to the working class, is to fix your attention on two or three million more or less confirmed trade unionists and treat them as labor. The other 17 or 18 million who might qualify statistically are tacitly endowed with the point of view ascribed to the organized nucleus. How very misleading it was to impute to the British working class in 1918 to 1921 the point of view expressed in the resolutions of the Trades Union Congress or in the pamphlets written by intellectuals. The stereotype of labor as emancipator selects the evidence which supports itself and rejects the other. And so, parallel with the real movements of working men, there exists a fiction of the labor movement in which an idealized mass moves towards an ideal goal. The fiction deals with the future. In the future, possibilities are almost indistinguishable from probabilities, and probabilities from certainties. If the future is long enough, the human will might turn what is just conceivable into what is very likely, and what is likely into what is sure to happen. James called this the faith ladder, and said that, quote, It is a slope of good will, on which in the larger questions of life men habitually live. End quote. Footnote. William James. Some Problems of Philosophy, page 224. Quote, 1. There is nothing absurd in the certain view of the world being true, nothing contradictory. 2. It might have been true under certain conditions. 3. It may be true even now. 4. It is fit to be true. 5. It ought to be true. 6. It must be true. 7. It shall be true, at any rate true for me. End quote. And, as he added in another place, footnote, a pluralistic universe, page 329, quote, your acting, thus, may in certain special cases be a means of making it securely true in the end, end quote. Yet no one would have insisted more than he, that, so far as we know how, 
we must avoid substituting the goal for the starting point, must avoid reading back into the present what courage, effort, and skill might create in the future. Yet this truism is inordinately difficult to live by, because every one of us is so little trained in the selection of our samples. If we believe that a certain thing ought to be true, we can almost always find either an instance where it is true, or someone who believes it ought to be true. It is ever so hard when a concrete fact illustrates a hope to weigh that fact properly. When the first six people we meet agree with us, it is not easy to remember that they may have all read the same newspaper at breakfast. And yet we cannot send out a questionnaire to 816 random samples every time we wish to estimate a probability. In dealing with any large mass of facts, the presumption is against our having picked true samples if we are acting on a casual impression. And when we try to go one step further, in order to seek the causes and effects of unseen and complicated affairs, haphazard opinion is very tricky. There are few big issues in public life where cause and effect are obvious at once. They are not obvious to scholars who have devoted years, let us say, to studying business cycles, or price and wage movements, or the migration and the assimilation of peoples, or the diplomatic purposes of foreign powers. Yet somehow we are all supposed to have opinions on these matters, and it is not surprising that the commonest form of reasoning is the intuitive, post hoc, ergo propter hoc. The more untrained a mind, the more readily it works out a theory that two things which catch its attention at the same time are casually connected. We have already dwelt at some length on the way things reach our attention. We have seen that our access to information is obstructed and uncertain, and that our apprehension is deeply controlled by our stereotypes, that the evidence available to our reason is subject to illusions of defense, prestige, morality, space, time, and sampling. We must note now that with this initial taint, public opinions are still further beset, because in a series of events seen mostly through stereotypes, we readily accept sequence or parallelism as equivalent to cause and effect. This is most likely to happen when two ideas that come together arouse the same feeling. If they come together, they are likely to arouse the same feeling, and even when they do not arrive together, a powerful feeling attached to one is likely to suck out of all the corners of memory any idea that feels about the same. Thus, everything painful tends to collect into one system of cause and effect, and likewise everything pleasant. Quote, this day I hear that God has shot an arrow into the midst of this town. The smallpox is an ordinary ye sign of the swan. The ordinary keeper's name is Windsor. His daughter is sick of the disease. It is observable that this disease begins at an alehouse to testify God's displeasure at the sin of drunkenness and yet of multiplying alehouses. Footnote. The Heart of the Puritan, page 177 edited by Elizabeth Deering Hanscom. Thus, increase Mather, and thus, in the year 1919, a distinguished professor of celestial mechanics discussing the Einstein theory, quote, It may well be that Bolshevist uprisings are, in reality, the visible objects of some underlying, deep, mental disturbance, worldwide in character. This same spirit of unrest has invaded science, end quote. Footnote, cited in The New Republic. December 24th, 1919, page 120. In hating one thing violently, we readily associate with it as cause or effect most of the other things we hate or fear violently. They may have no more connection than smallpox and alehouses, or relativity and Bolshevism, but they are bound together in the same emotion. In a superstitious mind, like that of the professor of celestial mechanics, Emotion is a stream of molten lava which catches and embeds whatever it touches. When you excavate in it you find, as in a buried city, all sorts of objects ludicrously entangled in each other. Anything can be related to anything else, provided it feels like it. Nor has a mind in such a state any way of knowing how preposterous it is. Ancient fears, reinforced by more recent fears, coagulate into a snarl of fears where anything that is dreaded is the cause of anything else that is dreaded. Generally, it all culminates in the fabrication of a system of all evil, and of another which is the system of all good. Then, our love of the absolute shows itself, for we do not like qualifying adverbs. Footnote. See Freud's discussion of absolutism in dreams. Interpretation of dreams, chapter 6, 
especially page 288. They clutter up sentences and interfere with irresistible feeling. We prefer most to more, least to less. We dislike the words rather, perhaps, if, or, but, toward, not quite, almost, temporarily, and partly. Yet nearly every opinion about public affairs needs to be deflated by some word of this sort. But in our free moments, everything tends to behave absolutely, 100%, everywhere, forever. It is not enough to say that our side is more right than the enemy's, that our victory will help democracy more than his. One must insist that our victory will end war forever, and make the world safe for democracy. And when the war is over, though we have thwarted a greater evil than those which still afflict us, the relativity of the result fades out, the absoluteness of the present evil overcomes our spirit, and we feel that we are helpless because we have not been irresistible. Between omnipotence and impotence, the pendulum swings. Real space, real time, real numbers, real connections, and real weights are lost. The perspective and the background and the dimensions of action are clipped and frozen in the stereotype. End of chapter 10《Chapter 11 of Public Opinion》by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. — Public Opinion — Chapter 11 — The Enlisting of Interest But the human mind is not a film which registers once and for all each impression that comes through its shutters and lenses. The human mind is endlessly and persistently creative. The pictures fade or combine, are sharpened here, condensed there, as we make them more completely our own. They do not lie inert upon the surface of the mind, but are reworked by the poetic faculty into a personal expression of ourselves. We distribute the emphasis and participate in the action. In order to do this, we tend to personalize quantities and to dramatize relations. As some sort of allegory, except in acutely sophisticated minds, the affairs of the world are represented. Social movements, economic forces, national interests, and public opinion are treated as persons or persons like the Pope, the President, Lenin, Morgan, or the King become ideas and institutions. The deepest of all the stereotypes is the human stereotype, which imputes human nature to innate or collective things. The bewildering variety of our impressions even after they have been censored in all kinds of ways, tends to force us to adopt the greater economy of the allegory. So great is the multitude of things that we cannot keep them vividly in mind. Usually, then, we name them and let the name stand for the whole impression. But a name is porous. Old meanings slip out and new ones slip in, and the attempt to retain the full meaning of the name is almost as fatiguing as trying to recall the original impressions. Yet names are a poor currency for thought. They are too empty, too abstract, too inhuman. And so we begin to see the name through some personal stereotype, to read into it, finally to see it in the incarnation of some human quality. Yet human qualities are themselves vague and fluctuating. They are best remembered by a physical sign. And therefore, the human qualities we tend to ascribe to the names of our impressions themselves tend to be visualized in physical metaphors. The people of England, the history of England, condense into England, and England becomes John Bull, who is jovial and fat, not too clever, but well able to take care of himself. The migration of a people may appear to some as the meandering of a river, and to others like a devastating flood. The courage people display may be objectified as a rock, their purpose as a road, their doubts as forks of the road, their difficulties as ruts and rocks, their progress as a fertile valley. If they mobilize their dreadnoughts, they unsheathe a sword. If their army surrenders, they are thrown to earth. If they are oppressed, they are on the rack or under the harrow. When public affairs are popularized in speeches, headlines, plays, moving pictures, cartoons, novels, statues, or paintings, their transformation into a human interest requires first abstraction from the original and then animation of what has been abstracted. 
we cannot be much interested in, or moved by, the things we do not see. Of public affairs each of us sees very little, and therefore they remain dull and unappetizing until somebody with the makings of an artist has translated them into a moving picture. Thus the abstraction, imposed upon our knowledge of reality, by all the limitations of our access and of our prejudices, is compensated. Not being omnipresent and omniscient, we cannot see much of what we have to think and talk about. Being flesh and blood, we will not feed on words and names and gray theory. Being artists of a sort, we paint pictures, stage dramas, and draw cartoons out of the abstractions. Or, if possible, we find gifted men who can visualize for us. For people are not all endowed to the same degree with the pictorial faculty. Yet one may, I imagine, assert with Bergson that the practical intelligence is most closely adapted to spatial qualities. Footnote, Creative Evolution, Chapters 3 and 4. A clear thinker is almost always a good visualizer. But for that same reason, because he is cinematographic, he is often by that much external and insensitive. For the people who have intuition, which is probably another name for musical or muscular perception, often appreciate the quality of an event and the inwardness of an act far better than the visualizer. They have more understanding when the crucial element is a desire that is never crudely overt and appears on the surface only in a veiled gesture or in a rhythm of speech. Visualization may catch the stimulus and the result. But the immediate and internal is often as badly caricatured by a visualizer as is the invention of the composer by an enormous soprano in the sweet maiden's part. Nevertheless, though they have often a peculiar justice, intuitions remain highly private and largely incommunicable. But social intercourse depends on communication, and while a person can often steer his own life with the utmost grace by virtue of his intuitions, he usually has great difficulty in making them real to others. When he talks about them, they sound like a sheaf of mist. For while intuition does give a fairer perception of human feeling, the reason, with its spatial and tactile prejudice, can do little with that perception. Therefore, where action depends on whether a number of people are of one mind, it is probably true that in the first instance, no idea is lucid for practical decision until it has visual or tactile value. But it is also true that no visual idea is significant to us until it has enveloped some stress of our own personality, until it releases or resists, depresses or enhances, some craving of our own, it remains one of the objects which do not matter. Pictures have always been the surest way of conveying an idea, and next in order, words that call up pictures in memory. But the idea conveyed is not fully our own, until we have identified ourselves with some aspect of the picture. The identification, or what Vernon Lee has called empathy, footnote, beauty and ugliness, may be almost infinitely subtle and symbolic. The mimicry may be performed without our being aware of it, and sometimes in a way that would horrify those sections of our personality which support our self-respect. In sophisticated people, the participation may not be in the fate of the hero, but in the fate of the whole idea to which both hero and villain are essential. But these are refinements. In popular representation, the handles for identification are almost always marked. You know who the hero is at once. And no work promises to be easily popular, where the marking is not definite and the choice is clear. Footnote, a fact which bears heavily on the character of news. See footnote, part 8. But that is not enough. The audience must have something to do, and the contemplation of the true, the good, and the beautiful is not something to do. In order not to sit inertly in the presence of the picture, and this applies as much to newspaper stories as to fiction and the cinema, the audience must be exercised by the image. Now there are two forms of exercise which far transcend all others, both as to ease with which they are aroused, and eagerness with which stimuli for them are sought. They are sexual passion and fighting, and the two have so many associations with each other, blend into each other so intimately, that a fight about sex outranks every other theme in the breadth of its appeal. There is none so engrossing or so careless of all distinctions of culture and frontiers. The sexual motive figures hardly at all in American political imagery. 
except in certain minor ecstasies of war, in an occasional scandal, or in phases of the racial conflict with Negroes or Asiatics, to speak of it at all would seem far-fetched. Only in moving pictures, novels, and some magazine fiction are industrial relations, business competition, politics, and diplomacy tangled up with the girl and the other woman. But the fighting motive appears at every turn. Politics is interesting when there is a fight, or, as we say, an issue. And in order to make politics popular, issues have to be found, even when in truth and justice there are none, none in the sense that the differences of judgment, or principle, or fact, do not call for the enlistment of pugnacity. Footnote. See Francis Taylor Patterson, Cinema Craftsmanship, page 31 to 32. Quote, 3. If the plot lacks suspense, 1. Add an antagonist, 2. Add an obstacle, 3. Add a problem, 4. Emphasize one of the questions in the minds of the spectator. End quote. But where pugnacity is not enlisted, those of us who are not directly involved find it hard to keep up our interest. For those who are involved, the absorption may be real enough to hold them even when no issue is involved. They may be exercised by sheer joy in activity, or by subtle rivalry, or invention. But for those to whom the whole problem is external and distant, these other faculties do not easily come into play. In order that the faint image of the affair shall mean something to them, they must be allowed to exercise the love of struggle, suspense, and victory. Miss Patterson insists that, quote, suspense constitutes the difference between the masterpieces in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the pictures at the Rivoli or the Rialto theaters, end quote. Had she made it clear that the masterpieces lack either an easy mode of identification or a theme popular for this generation, she would be wholly right in saying that this, quote, explains why the people straggle into the Metropolitan by twos and threes and struggle into the Rialto and Rivoli by hundreds. The twos and threes look at a picture in the art museum for less than ten minutes, unless they chance to be art students, critics, or connoisseurs. The hundreds in the Rivoli or the Rialto look at the picture for more than an hour. As far as beauty is concerned, there can be no comparison of the merits of the two pictures. Yet the motion picture draws more people, and holds them at attention longer than do the masterpieces, not through any intrinsic merit of its own, but because it depicts unfolding events, the outcome of which the audience is breathlessly waiting. It possesses the element of struggle, which never fails to arouse suspense, end quote. In order, then, that the distant situation shall not be a gray flicker on the edge of attention, it should be capable of translation into pictures, in which the opportunity for identification is recognizable. Unless that happens, it will interest only a few for a little while. It will belong to the sight seen but not felt, to the sensations that beat on our sense organs, and are not acknowledged. We have to take sides. We have to be able to take sides. In the recesses of our being, we must step out of the audience, onto the stage, and wrestle as the hero for the victory of good over evil. We must breathe into the allegory the breath of our life. And so, in spite of the critics, a verdict is rendered in the old controversy about realism and romanticism. Our popular taste is to have the drama originate in a setting realistic enough to make identification plausible, and to have it terminate in a setting romantic enough to be desirable, but not so romantic as to be inconceivable. In between the beginning and the end the canons are liberal, but the true beginning and the happy ending are landmarks. The moving picture audience rejects fantasy logically developed, because in pure fantasy there is no familiar foothold in the age of machines. It rejects realism relentlessly pursued, because it does not enjoy defeat in a struggle that has become its own. What will be accepted as true, as realistic, as good, as evil, as desirable, is not eternally fixed. These are fixed by stereotypes, acquired from earlier experiences and carried over into judgment of later ones. And, therefore, if the financial investment in each film and in popular magazines were not so exorbitant as to require instant and widespread popularity, men of spirit and imagination would be able to use the screen and the periodical, as one might dream of their being used, to enlarge and to refine, to verify and criticize the repertory of images with which our imaginations work. But, given the present costs, 
the men who make moving pictures, like the church and the court painters of other ages, must adhere to the stereotypes that they find, or pay the price of frustrating expectation. The stereotypes can be altered, but not in time to guarantee success when the film is released six months from now. The men who do alter the stereotypes, the pioneering artists and critics, are naturally depressed and angered at managers and editors who protect their investments. They are risking everything, then why not the others? That is not quite fair, for in their righteous fury they have forgotten their own rewards, which are beyond any that their employers can hope to feel. They could not, and would not if they could, change places. And they have forgotten another thing in the unceasing war with Philistia. They have forgotten that they are measuring their own success by standards that artists and wise men of the past would never have dreamed of invoking. They are asking for circulations and audiences that were never considered by any artist until the last few generations. And when they do not get them, they are disappointed. Those who catch on, like Sinclair Lewis in Main Street, are men who have succeeded in projecting definitely what great numbers of other people were obscurely trying to say inside their heads. Quote, you have said it for me. End quote. They establish a new form which is then endlessly copied until it, too, becomes a stereotype of perception. The next pioneer finds it difficult to make the public see Main Street any other way. And he, like the forerunners of Sinclair Lewis, has a quarrel with the public. This quarrel is due not only to the conflict of stereotypes, but to the pioneering artist's reverence for his material. Whatever the plane he chooses, on that plane he remains. If he is dealing with the inwardness of an event, he follows it to its conclusion regardless of the pain it causes. He will not tag his fantasy to help anyone, or cry peace where there is no peace. There is his America. But big audiences have no stomach for such severity. They are more interested in themselves than in anything else in the world. The selves in which they are interested are the selves that have been revealed by schools and by tradition. They insist that a work of art shall be a vehicle with a step, where they can climb aboard, and that they shall ride, not according to the contours of the country, but to a land where for an hour there are no clocks to punch and no dishes to wash. To satisfy these demands, there exists an intermediate class of artists who are able and willing to confuse the planes, to piece together a realistic romantic compound out of the inventions of greater men, and, as Miss Patterson advises, give, quote, what real life so rarely does, the triumphant resolution of a set of difficulties, the anguish of virtue and the triumph of sin, changed to the glorifications of virtue and the eternal punishment of its enemy. End quote. Footnote. Cinema Craftsmanship, page 46. Quote, the hero and heroine must in general possess youth, beauty, goodness, exalted self-sacrifice, and unalterable constancy. End quote. The ideologies of politics obey these rules. The foothold of realism is always there. The picture of some real evil, such as the German threat or class conflict, is recognizable in the argument. There is a description of some aspect of the world which is convincing because it agrees with familiar ideas. But as the ideology deals with an unseen future, as well as with a tangible present, it soon crosses imperceptibly the frontier of verification. In describing the present, you are more or less tied down to common experience. In describing what nobody has experienced, you are bound to let go. You stand at Armageddon, more or less, but you battle for the Lord, perhaps, a true beginning, true according to the standards prevailing, and a happy ending. Every Marxist is hard as nails about the brutalities of the present, and mostly sunshine about the day after the dictatorship. So were the war propagandists, there was not a bestial quality in human nature they did not find everywhere east of the Rhine, or west of it, if they were Germans. The bestiality was there all right. But after the victory, eternal peace. Plenty of this is quite cynically deliberate. For the skillful propagandist knows that while you must start with a plausible analysis, you must not keep on analyzing, because the tedium of real political accomplishment will soon destroy interest. So the propagandist exhausts the interest in reality by a tolerably plausible beginning, and then stokes up energy for a long voyage by brandishing a passport to heaven. The formula works when the public fiction enmeshes itself with a private urgency. But once enmeshed, 
in the heat of battle, the original self and the original stereotype which affected the junction may be wholly lost to sight. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter Twelve. Self-Interest Reconsidered. Therefore, the identical story is not the same story to all who hear it. Each will enter it at a slightly different point, since no two experiences are exactly alike, he will reenact it in his own way and transfuse it with his own feelings. Sometimes, an artist of compelling skill will force us to enter into lives altogether unlike our own, lives that seem at first glance dull, repulsive, or eccentric. But that is rare. In almost every story that catches our attention, we become a character and act out the role with a pantomime of our own. The pantomime may be sublime or gross, may be sympathetic to the story, or only crudely analogous, but it will consist of those feelings which are aroused by our conception of the role. And so, the original theme as it circulates is stressed, twisted, and embroidered by all the minds through which it goes. It is as if a play of Shakespeare's were rewritten each time it is performed, with all the changes of emphasis and meaning that the actors and audience inspired. Something very like that seems to have happened to the stories in the sagas before they were definitively written down. In our time the printed record, such as it is, checks the exuberance of each individual's fancy. But against rumor there is little or no checks, and the original story, true or invented, grows wings and horns, hoofs and beaks, as the artist in each gossip works upon it. The first narrator's account does not keep its shape and proportions. It is edited and revised by all who played with it as they heard it, used it for daydreams, and passed it on. Footnote. For an interesting example, see the case described by C.J. Jung, translated by Constance Long, in Analytical Psychology, Chapter 4. Consequently, the more mixed the audience, the greater will be the variation in the response. For as the audience grows larger, the number of common words diminishes. Thus, the common factors in the story become more abstract. This story, lacking precise character of its own, is heard by people of highly varied character. They give it their own character. The character they give it varies not only with sex and age, race and religion and social position, but within these cruder classifications, according to the inherited and acquired constitution of the individual, his faculties, his career, the progress of his career, an emphasized aspect of his career, his moods and tenses, or his place on the board in any of the games of life that he is playing. What reaches him of public affairs, a few lines of print, some photographs, anecdotes, and some casual experience of his own, he conceives through his set patterns and recreates with his own emotions. He does not take his personal problems as partial samples of the greater environment. He takes his stories of the greater environment as a mimic enlargement of his life but not necessarily of that private life as he would describe it to himself. For in his private life, the choices are narrow, and much of himself is squeezed down and out of sight, where it cannot directly govern his outward behavior. And thus, beside the more average people, who project the happiness of their own lives into a general goodwill, or their unhappiness into suspicion and hate, there are the outwardly happy people, who are brutal everywhere but in their own circle, as well as the people who, the more they detest their families, their friends, their jobs, the more they overflow with love for mankind. As you descend from generalities to detail, it becomes more apparent that the character in which men deal with their affairs is not fixed. Possibly their different selves have a common stem and common qualities, but the branches and the twigs have many forms. Nobody confronts every situation with the same character. His character varies in some degree, through the sheer influence of time and accumulating memory, since he is not an automaton. His character varies, not only in time, but according to circumstance. The legend of the solitary Englishman in the South Seas, who invariably shaves and puts on a black tie for dinner, bears witness to his own intuitive and civilized fear of losing the character which he has acquired. 
so do diaries and albums and souvenirs, old letters and old clothes, and the love of unchanging routine, testify to our sense of how hard it is to step twice in the Heracliton River. There is no one self always at work. And therefore, it is of great importance in the formation of any public opinion what self is engaged. The Japanese asked the right to settle in California. Clearly, it makes a whole lot of difference whether you conceive the demand as a desire to grow fruit or to marry the white man's daughter. If two nations are disputing a piece of territory, it matters greatly whether the people regard the negotiations as a real estate deal, an attempt to humiliate them, or, in the excited and provocative language which usually enclouds these arguments, as a rape. For the self which takes charge of the instincts, when we are thinking about lemons or distant acres, is very different from the self which appears when we are thinking even potentially as the outraged head of a family. In one case, the private feeling which enters into the opinion is tepid, in the other, red-hot. And so while it is so true as to be mere tautology that self-interest determines opinion, the statement is not illuminating until we know which self out of many selects and directs the interest so conceived. Religious teaching and popular wisdom have always distinguished several personalities in each human being. They have been called the higher and lower, the spiritual and the material, the divine and the carnal, and although we may not wholly accept this classification, we cannot fail to observe that distinctions exist. Instead of two antithetic selves, a modern man would probably note a good many not so sharply separated. He would say that the distinction drawn by theologians was arbitrary and external, because many different selves were grouped together as higher, provided they fitted into the theologians' categories, but he would recognize nevertheless that here was an authentic clue to the variety of human nature. We have learned to note many selves, and to be a little less ready to issue judgment upon them. We understand that we see the same body, but often a different man, depending on whether he is dealing with a social equal, a social inferior, or a social superior, on whether he is making love to a woman he is eligible to marry, or to one whom he is not, on whether he is courting a woman, or whether he considers himself her proprietor, on whether he is dealing with his children, his partners, his most trusted subordinates, the boss who can make him or break him, on whether he is struggling for the necessities of life, or successful, on whether he is dealing with a friendly alien, or a despised one, on whether he is in great danger, or in perfect security, on whether he is alone in Paris, or among his family in Peoria. People differ widely, of course, in the consistency of their characters, so widely that they may cover the whole gamut of differences, between a split soul like Dr. Jekyll's and an utterly single-minded brand, Parsifal, or Don Quixote. If the selves are too unrelated, we distrust the man. If they are too inflexibly on one track, we find him arid, stubborn, or eccentric. In the repertory of characters, meager for the isolated and the self-sufficient, highly varied for the adaptable, there is a whole range of selves, from that one at the top which we should wish God to see, to those at the bottom that we ourselves do not dare to see. There may be octaves for the family, father, Jehovah, tyrant, husband, proprietor, male, lover, lecher, for the occupation, employer, master, exploiter, competitor, intriguer, enemy, subordinate, courtier, snob. Some never come out into public view. Others are called out only by exceptional circumstances. But the characters take their form from a man's conception of the situation in which he finds himself. If the environment to which he is sensitive happens to be the smart set, he will imitate the character he conceives to be appropriate. That character will tend to act as moderator of his bearing, his speech, his choice of subjects, his preferences. Much of the comedy of life lies here, in the way people imagine their characters for situations that are strange to them, the professor among promoters, the deacon at a poker game, the cockney in the country, the paste diamond among real diamonds. Into the making of a man's characters, there enters a variety of influences not easily separated. Footnote. For an interesting sketch of the more noteworthy early attempts to explain character, see the chapter called The Antecedents of the Study of Character and Temperament in Joseph Jastrow's The Psychology of Conviction. The analysis in its fundamentals is perhaps still as doubtful as it was in the 5th century B.C., when Hippocrates formulated the doctrine of the humors, distinguished the sanguine 
the melancholic, the choleric, and the phlegmatic dispositions, and describe them to the blood, the black bile, the yellow bile, and the phlegm. The latest theories, such as one finds them in canon, footnote, bodily changes in pleasure, pain, and anger. Adler, footnote, the neurotic constitution. Kempf, footnote, the automatic functions and the personality, psychopathology. Also, Lewis Berman, the glands regulating personality. Appear to follow much the same scent, from the outward behavior and the inner consciousness, to the physiology of the body. But in spite of an immensely improved technique, no one would be likely to claim that there are settled conclusions which enable us to set apart nature from nurture and abstract the native character from the acquired. It is only in what Joseph Jastrow has called the slums of psychology that the explanation of character is regarded as a fixed system to be applied by phrenologists, palmists, fortune tellers, mind readers, and a few political professors. There you will still find it asserted that, quote, the Chinese are fond of colors and have their eyebrows much vaulted, end quote, while, quote, the heads of the Kalmyks are depressed from above, but very large laterally, about the organ which gives the inclination to acquire, and this nation's propensity to steal, etc., is admitted, end quote. Footnote, Jastrow, previously cited, page 156. The modern psychologists are disposed to regard the outward behavior of an adult as an equation between a number of variables, such as the resistance of the environment, repressed cravings of several maturities, and the manifest personality. Footnote, formulated by Kempf, Psychopathology, page 74, as follows. Manifest wishes, over. Later repressed wishes, over. Opposed by the resistance of the adolescent repressed wishes. Environment equals behavior, over. Pre-adolescent repressed wishes. They permit us to suppose, though I have not seen the notion formulated, that the repression or control of cravings is fixed, not in relation to the whole person all the time, but more or less in respect to his various selves. There are things he will not do as a patriot, that he will do when he is not thinking of himself as a patriot. No doubt there are impulses, more or less incipient in childhood, that are never exercised again in the whole of a man's life, except as they enter obscurely and indirectly into combination with other impulses. But even that is not certain, since repression is not irretrievable. For just as psychoanalysis can bring to the surface a buried impulse, so can social situations. Footnote. See the very interesting book of Everett Dean Martin, The Behavior of Crowds. Also, Hobbes, Leviathan, Part 2, Chapter 25. Quote, For the passions of men, which asunder are moderate, as the heat of one brand, in an assembly are like many brands, that inflame one another, especially when they blow one another with orations. End quote. Liban, the crowd, elaborates this observation of Hobbes's. It is only when our surroundings remain normal and placid, when what is expected of us by those we meet is consistent, that we live without knowledge of many of our dispositions. When the unexpected occurs, we learn much about ourselves that we did not know. The selves, which we construct with the help of all who influence us, prescribe which impulses, how emphasized, how directed, are appropriate to certain typical situations for which we have learned prepared attitudes. For a recognizable type of experience, there is a character which controls the outward manifestations of our whole being. Murderous hate is, for example, controlled in civil life. Though you choke with rage, you must not display it as a parent, child, employer, politician. You would not wish to display a personality that exudes murderous hate. You frown upon it, and the people around you also frown. But if a war breaks out, the chances are that everybody you admire will begin to feel the justification of killing and hating. At first, the vent for these feelings is very narrow. The selves which come to the front are those which are attuned to a real love of country, the kind of feeling that you find in Rupert Brooke, and in Sir Edward Gray's speech on August 3, 1914, and in President Wilson's address to Congress on April 2, 1917. The reality of war is still abhorred, but what war actually means is learned but gradually. For previous wars are only transfigured memories. In that honeymoon phase, the realists of war rightly insist that the nation is not yet awake, and reassure each other by saying, quote, wait for the casualty lists, end quote. Gradually, 
the impulse to kill becomes the main business, and all those characters which might modify it disintegrate. The impulse becomes central, is sanctified, and gradually turns unmanageable. It seeks a vent, not alone on the idea of the enemy, which is all the enemy most people actually see during the war, but upon all the persons and objects and ideas that have always been hateful. Hatred of the enemy is legitimate. These other hatreds have themselves legitimized by the crudest analogy, and by what, once having cooled off, we recognize as the most far-fetched analogy. It takes a long time to subdue so powerful an impulse once it goes loose. And therefore, when the war is over in fact, it takes time and struggle to regain self-control, and to deal with the problems of peace in civilian character. Modern war, as Mr. Herbert Crawley has said, is inherent in the political structure of modern society, but outlawed by its ideals. For the civilian population, there exists no ideal code of conduct in war, such as the soldier still possesses, and chivalry once prescribed. The civilians are without standards, except those that the best of them manage to improvise. The only standards they possess make war an accursed thing. Yet though the war may be a necessary one, no moral training has prepared them for it. Only their higher selves have a code and patterns, and when they have to act, in what the higher regards as a lower character, profound disturbance results. The preparation of characters for all the situations in which men may find themselves is one function of a moral education. Clearly, then, it depends for its success upon the sincerity and knowledge with which the environment has been explored. For in a world falsely conceived, our own characters are falsely conceived, and we misbehave. So the moralist must choose. Either he must offer a pattern of conduct for every phase of life, however distasteful some of its phases may be, or he must guarantee that his pupils will never be confronted by the situations he disapproves. Either he must abolish war, or teach people how to wage it with the greatest psychic economy. Either he must abolish the economic life of man and feed him with stardust and dew, or he must investigate all the perplexities of economic life, and offer patterns of conduct which are applicable in a world where no man is self-supporting. But that is just what the prevailing moral culture so generally refuses to do. In its best aspects, it is diffident at the awful complication of the modern world. In its worst, it is just cowardly. Now whether the moralists study economics and politics and psychology, or whether the social scientists educate the moralists, is no great matter. Each generation will go unprepared into the modern world, unless it has been taught to conceive the kind of personality it will have to be, among the issues it will most likely meet. Most of this, the naive view of self-interest, leaves out of account. It forgets that self and interest are both conceived somehow, and that for the most part they are conventionally conceived. The ordinary doctrine of self-interest usually omits altogether the cognitive function. So insistent is it on the fact that human beings finally refer all things to themselves, that it does not stop to notice that men's ideas of all things and of themselves are not instinctive. They are acquired. Thus it may be true enough, as James Madison wrote in the tenth paper of The Federalist, that, quote, a landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with many lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations, and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views, end quote. But if you examine the context of Madison's paper, you discover something which I think throws light upon that view of instinctive fatalism, called sometimes the economic interpretation of history. Madison was arguing for the federal constitution and, quote, among the numerous advantages of the Union, end quote, he set forth, quote, its tendency to break and control the violence of faction, end quote. Faction was what worried Madison and the causes of faction he traced to, quote, the nature of man, end quote, where latent dispositions are, quote, brought into different degrees of activity, according to the different circumstances of civil society. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well of speculation as of practice, an attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power, or to persons of other descriptions, whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions, have, in turn, divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. 
So strong is this propensity of mankind to fall into mutual animosities, that where no substantial occasion presents itself, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions, and excite their most violent conflicts. But the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property." End quote. Madison's theory, therefore, is that the propensity to faction may be kindled by religious or political opinions, by leaders, but most commonly by the distribution of property. Yet note that Madison claims only that men are divided by their relation to property. He does not say that their property and their opinions are cause and effect, but that differences of property are the causes of differences of opinion. The pivotal word in Madison's argument is different. From the existence of differing economic situations you can tentatively infer a probable difference of opinions, but you cannot infer what those opinions will necessarily be. This reservation cuts radically into the claims of the theory, as that theory is usually held. That the reservation is necessary, the enormous contradiction between dogma and practice among orthodox socialists bears witness. They argue that the next stage in social evolution is the inevitable result of the present stage. But in order to produce that inevitable next stage, they organize and agitate to produce, quote, class consciousness, end quote. Why, one asks, does not the economic situation produce consciousness of class in everybody? It just doesn't, that is all. And therefore the proud claim will not stand that the socialist philosophy rests on prophetic insight into destiny. It rests on a hypothesis about human nature. Footnote. See Thorstein Veblen, quote, the Socialist Economics of Karl Marx and His Followers, end quote, in The Place of Science in Modern Civilization, especially pages 413 to 418. The socialist practice is based on a belief that if men are economically situated in different ways, they can then be induced to hold certain views. Undoubtedly, they often come to believe, or can be induced to believe different things, as they are, for example, landlords or tenants, employees or employers, skilled or unskilled laborers, wage workers or salaried men, buyers or sellers, farmers or middlemen, exporters or importers, creditors or debtors. Differences of income make a profound difference in contact and opportunity. Men who work at machines will tend, as Mr. Thorstein Veblen has so brilliantly demonstrated, footnote, the theory of business enterprise, to interpret experience differently from handicraftsmen or traders. If this were all that the materialistic conception of politics asserted, the theory would be an immensely valuable hypothesis that every interpreter of opinion would have to use. But he would often have to abandon the theory, and he would always have to be on guard. For in trying to explain a certain public opinion, it is rarely obvious which of a man's many social relations is affecting a particular opinion. Does Smith's opinion arise from his problems as a landlord, an importer, an owner of railway shares, or an employer? Does Jones's opinion, Jones being a weaver in a textile mill, come from the attitude of his boss, the competition of new immigrants, his wife's grocery bills, or the ever-present contract with the firm which is selling him a Ford car and a house and lot, on the installment plan? Without special inquiry you cannot tell. The economic determinist cannot tell. A man's various economic contacts limit or enlarge the range of his opinions. But which of the contacts, in what guise, on what theory, the materialistic conception of politics cannot predict? It can predict, with a high degree of probability, that if a man owns a factory, his ownership will figure in those opinions which seem to have some bearing on that factory. But how the function of being an owner will figure, no economic determinist as such can tell you. There is no fixed set of opinions on any question that go with being the owner of a factory, no views on labor, on property, on management, let alone views on less immediate matters. The determinist can predict that in 99 cases out of 100, the owner will resist attempts to deprive him of ownership, or that he will favor legislation which he thinks will increase his profits. But since there is no magic in ownership, which enables a businessman to know what laws will make him prosper, there is no chain of cause and effect described in economic materialism, which enables anyone to prophesy, whether the owner will take a long view or a short one, a competitive or a cooperative. Did the theory have the validity which is so often claimed for it, it would enable us to prophesy. We could analyze the economic interests of a people, and deduce what the people was bound to do. 
Marx tried that, and after a good guess about the trusts, went wholly wrong. The first socialist experiment came, not as he predicted, out of the culmination of capitalist development in the West, but out of the collapse of a pre-capitalist system in the East. Why did he go wrong? Why did his greatest disciple, Lenin, go wrong? Because the Marxians thought that men's economic position would irresistibly produce a clear conception of their economic interests. They thought they themselves possessed that clear conception, and that what they knew the rest of mankind would learn. The event has shown not only that a clear conception of interest does not arise automatically in everyone, but that it did not arise even in Marx and Lenin themselves. After all that Marx and Lenin have written, the social behavior of mankind is still obscure. It ought not to be, if economic position alone determined public opinion. Position ought, if their theory were correct, not only to divide mankind into classes, but to supply each class with a view of its interest, and a coherent policy for obtaining it. Yet nothing is more certain than that all classes of men are in constant perplexity as to what their interests are. Footnote. As a matter of fact, when it came to the test, Lenin completely abandoned the materialistic interpretation of politics. Had he held sincerely to the Marxian formula when he seized power in 1917, he would have said to himself, according to the teachings of Marx, socialism will develop out of a mature capitalism. Here I am, in control of a nation that is only entering upon a capitalist development. It is true that I am a socialist, but I am a scientific socialist. It follows that for the present, all idea of a socialist republic is out of the question. We must advance capitalism in order that the evolution which Marx predicted may take place. But Lenin did nothing of the sort. Instead of waiting for evolution to evolve, he tried by will, force, and education to defy the historical process which his philosophy assumed. Since this was written, Lenin has abandoned communism on the ground that Russia does not possess the necessary basis in a mature capitalism. He now says that Russia must create capitalism, which will create a proletariat, which will someday create communism. This is at least consistent with Marxist dogma. But it shows how little determinism there is in the opinions of a determinist. This dissolves the impact of economic determinism. For if our economic interests are made up of our variable concepts of those interests, then as the master key to social processes the theory fails. That theory assumes that men are capable of adopting only one version of their interest, and having adopted it, they move fatally to realize it. It assumes the existence of a specific class interest. That assumption is false. A class interest can be conceived largely or narrowly, selfishly or unselfishly, in the light of no facts, some facts, many facts, truth and error. And so collapses the Marxian remedy for class conflicts. That remedy assumes that if all property could be held in common, class differences would disappear. That assumption is false. Property might well be held in common, and yet not be conceived as a whole. The moment any group of people failed to see communism in a communist manner, they would divide into classes on the basis of what they saw. In respect to the existing social order, Marxian socialism emphasizes property conflict as the maker of opinion, in respect to the loosely defined working class, it ignores property conflict as the basis of agitation. In respect to the future, it imagines a society without property conflict, and, therefore, without conflict of opinion. Now in the existing social order, there may be more instances where one man must lose if another is to gain, than there would be under socialism, but for every case where one must lose for another to gain, there are endless cases where men simply imagine the conflict because they are uneducated. And under socialism, though you removed every instance of absolute conflict, the partial access of each man to the whole range of facts would nevertheless create conflict. A socialist state will not be able to dispense with education, morality, or liberal science, though on strict materialistic grounds, the communal ownership of properties ought to make them superfluous. The communists in Russia would not propagate their faith with such unflagging zeal, if economic determinism were alone determining the opinion of the Russian people. The socialist theory of human nature is, like the hedonistic calculus, an example of false determinism. Both assume that the unlearned dispositions fatally but intelligently produce a certain type of behavior. 
The socialist believes that the dispositions pursue the economic interest of a class. The hedonist believes that they pursue pleasure and avoid pain. Both theories rest on a naive view of instinct, a view defined by James. Footnote, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, page 383. Though radically qualified by him as, quote, the faculty of acting in such a way as to produce certain ends, without foresight of the ends, and without previous education in the performance. End quote. It is doubtful whether instinctive action of this sort figures at all in the social life of mankind. For as James pointed out, footnote, Principles of Psychology, Volume 2, page 390, quote, Every instinctive act in an animal with memory must cease to be blind after being once repeated. End quote. Whatever the equipment at birth, the innate dispositions are from earliest infancy immersed in experience, which determines what shall excite them as stimulus. Quote, they become capable, as Mr. McDougall says, footnote, Introduction to Social Psychology, 4th edition, page 31 and 32, quote, of being initiated, not only by the perception of objects, of the kind which directly excite the innate disposition, the natural or native excitants of the instinct, but also by ideas of such objects, and by perceptions, and by ideas of objects of other kinds. End quote. Footnote. Quote, Most definitions of instincts and instinctive actions take account only of their conative aspects, and it is a common mistake to ignore the cognitive and affective aspects of the instinctive mental process. End quote. Footnote. Social Psychology, 4th edition, page 29. It is only the, quote, central part of the disposition, end quote, footnote, page 34, says Mr. McDougall further, quote, that retains its specific character and remains common to all individuals and all situations in which the instinct is excited, end quote. The cognitive processes and the actual bodily movements by which the instinct achieves its end may be indefinitely complicated. In other words, man has an instinct of fear, but what he will fear and how he will try to escape is determined not by birth, but by experience. If it were not for this variability, it would be difficult to conceive the inordinate variety of human nature. But when you consider that all the important tendencies of the creature, his appetites, his loves, his hates, his curiosity, his sexual cravings, his fears, and pugnacity, are freely attachable to all sorts of objects as stimulus, and to all kinds of objects as gratification, the complexity of human nature is not so inconceivable. And when you think that each new generation is the casual victim of a way a previous generation was conditioned, as well as the inheritor of the environment that resulted, the possible combinations and permutations are enormous. There is no prima facie case, then, for supposing that because persons crave some particular thing, or behave in some particular way, human nature is fatally constituted to crave that, and act thus. The craving and the action are both learned, and in another generation might be learned differently. Analytic psychology and social history unite in supporting this conclusion. Psychology indicates how essentially casual is the nexus between the particular stimulus and the particular response. Anthropology in the widest sense reinforces the view by demonstrating that the things which have excited men's passions, and the means by which they have used to realize them, differ endlessly from age to age and from place to place. Men pursue their interest. But how they shall pursue it is not fatally determined, and, therefore, within whatever limits of time this planet will continue to support human life, man can set no term upon the creative energies of men. He can issue no doom of automatism. He can say, if he must, that for his life there will be no changes which he can recognize as good. But in saying that he will be confining his life to what he can see with his eye, rejecting what he might see with his mind, he will be taking as the measure of good a measure which is only the one he happens to possess. He can find no ground for abandoning his highest hopes and relaxing his conscious effort unless he chooses to regard the unknown as the unknowable unless he elects to believe that what no one knows, no one will know, and that what someone has not yet learned, no one will ever be able to teach. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Public Opinion » by Walter Lippmann This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 13. The Transfer of Interest. This goes to show that there are many variables in each man's impressions of the invisible world. The points of contact vary, the stereotyped expectations vary, the interest enlisted varies most subtly of all. The living impressions of a large number of people are, to an immeasurable degree, personal in each of them and unmanageably complex in the mass. How, then, is any practical relationship established between what is in people's heads and what is out there beyond their ken in the environment? How, in the language of democratic theory, do great numbers of people feeling each, so privately about so abstract a picture, develop any common will? How does a simple and constant idea emerge from this complex of variables? How are those things, known as the will of the people, or the national purpose, or public opinion, crystallized out of such fleeting and casual imagery? That there is a real difficulty here was shown by the angry tilt in the spring of 1921 between the American ambassador to England and a very large number of other Americans. Mr. Harvey, speaking at a British dinner table, had assured the world without the least sign of hesitancy what were the motives of Americans in 1917. Footnote, New York Times, May 20th, 1921. As he described them, they were not the motives which President Wilson had insisted upon when he enunciated the American mind. Now, of course, neither Mr. Harvey nor Mr. Wilson, nor the critics and friends of either, nor anyone else, can know quantitatively and qualitatively what went on in thirty or forty million adult minds. But what everybody knows is that a war was fought and won, by a multitude of efforts, stimulated, no one knows in what proportion, by the motives of Wilson and the motives of Harvey, and all kinds of hybrids of the two. People enlisted and fought, worked, paid taxes, sacrificed to a common end, and yet no one can begin to say exactly what moved each person to do each thing that he did. It is no use, then, Mr. Harvey telling a soldier who thought that this was a war to end war, that the soldier did not think any such thing. The soldier who thought that, thought that, and Mr. Harvey, who thought something else, thought something else. In the same speech, Mr. Harvey formulated with equal clarity what the voters of 1920 had in their minds. That is a rash thing to do, and if you simply assume that all who voted your ticket voted as you did, then it is a disingenuous thing to do. The count shows that 16 millions voted Republican, and 9 millions voted Democratic. They voted, says Mr. Harvey, for and against the League of Nations, and in support of this claim, he can point to Mr. Wilson's request for a referendum, and to the undeniable fact that the Democratic Party and Mr. Cox insisted that the League was the issue. But then, saying that the League was the issue did not make the League the issue, and by counting the votes on Election Day, you do not know the real division of opinion about the League. There were, for example, nine million Democrats. Are you entitled to believe that all of them are staunch supporters of the League? Certainly you are not. For your knowledge of American politics tells you that many of the millions voted, as they always do, to maintain the existing social system in the South, and that whatever their views on the League, they did not vote to express their views. Those who wanted the League were no doubt pleased that the Democratic Party wanted it too. Those who disliked the League may have held their noses as they voted. But both groups of Southerners voted the same ticket. Were the Republicans more unanimous? Anybody can pick Republican voters enough out of his circle of friends to cover the whole gamut of opinion from the irreconcilability of Senators Johnson and Knox to the advocacy of Secretary Hoover and Chief Justice Taft. No one can say definitely how many people felt, in any particular way, about the League, nor how many people let their feelings on the subject determine their vote. When there are only two ways of expressing a hundred varieties of feeling, there is no certain way of knowing what the decisive combination was. Senator Bora found in the Republican ticket a reason for voting Republican, but so did President Lowell. The Republican majority was composed of men and women, who thought a Republican victory would kill the League, plus those who thought it was the most practical way to secure the League, plus those who thought it was the surest way offered to obtain an amended League. All these voters were inextricably entangled with their own desire, 
or the desire of other voters to improve business, or to put labor in its place, or to punish the Democrats for going to war, or to punish them for not having gone sooner, or to get rid of Mr. Burleson, or to improve the price of wheat, or to lower taxes, or to stop Mr. Daniels from outbuilding the world, or to help Mr. Harding do the same thing. And yet, a sort of decision emerged. Mr. Harding moved into the White House. For the least common denominator of all the votes was that the Democrats should go and the Republicans come in. That was the only factor remaining after all the contradictions had canceled each other out. But that factor was not enough to alter policy for four years. The precise reasons why change was desired on that November day in 1920 are not recorded, not even in the memories of the individual voters. The reasons are not fixed. They grow and change and melt into other reasons, so that the public opinions Mr. Harding has to deal with are not the opinions that elected him. That there is no inevitable connection between an assortment of opinions and a particular line of action, everyone saw in 1916. Elected apparently on the cry that he kept us out of war, Mr. Wilson within five months led the country into war. The working of the popular will, therefore, has always called for explanation. Those who have been most impressed by its erratic working have found a prophet in M. Laban, and have welcomed generalizations about what Sir Robert Peel called, quote, the great compound of folly, weakness, prejudice, wrong-feeling, right-feeling, obstinacy, and newspaper paragraphs, which is called public opinion, end quote. Others have concluded that since out of drift and incoherence, settled aims do appear, there must be a mysterious contrivance at work, somewhere, over and above the inhabitants of a nation. They invoke a collective soul, a national mind, a spirit of the age which imposes order upon random opinion. An oversoul seems to be needed, for the emotions and ideas in the members of a group do not disclose anything so simple and so crystalline as the formula which those same individuals will accept as a true statement of their public opinion. But the facts can, I think, be explained more convincingly, without the help of the oversoul in any of its disguises. After all, the art of inducing all sorts of people who think differently to vote alike is practiced in every political campaign. In 1916, for example, the Republican candidate had to produce Republican votes out of many different kinds of Republicans. Let us look at Mr. Hughes' first speech after accepting the nomination. Footnote, delivered at Carnegie Hall, New York City, July 31, 1916. The context is still clear enough in our minds to obviate much explanation, yet the issues are no longer contentious. The candidate was a man of unusually plain speech, who had been out of politics for several years, and was not personally committed on the issues of the recent past. He had, moreover, none of that wizardry which popular leaders like Roosevelt, Wilson, or Lloyd George possess, none of that histrionic gift by which such men impersonate the feelings of their followers. From that aspect of politics, he was by temperament and by training, remote. But yet he knew by calculation what the politician's technique is. He was one of those people who know just how to do a thing, but who cannot quite do it themselves. There are often better teachers than the virtuoso, to whom the art is so much second nature, that he himself does not know how he does it. The statement that those who can, do, those who cannot, teach, is not nearly so much of a reflection on the teacher as it sounds. Mr. Hughes knew the occasion was momentous, and he had prepared his manuscript carefully. In a box sat Theodore Roosevelt, just back from Missouri. All over the house sat the veterans of Armageddon, in various stages of doubt and dismay. On the platform and in the other boxes, the ex-whited sepulchres and ex-second-story men of 1912 were to be seen, obviously in the best of health and in a melting mood. Out beyond the hall there were powerful pro-Germans and powerful pro-allies, a war party in the east and in the big cities, a peace party in the middle and far west. There was strong feeling about Mexico. Mr. Hughes had to form a majority against the Democrats, out of people divided into all sorts of combinations, on Taft versus Roosevelt, pro-Germans versus pro-allies, war versus neutrality, Mexican intervention versus non-intervention. About the morality or the wisdom of the affair we are, of course, not concerned here. Our only interest is in the method by which a leader of heterogeneous opinion 
goes about the business of securing a homogeneous vote. Quote, this representative gathering is a happy augury. It means the strength of reunion. It means that the party of Lincoln is restored. End quote. The italicized words are binders. Lincoln in such a speech has, of course, no relation to Abraham Lincoln. It is merely a stereotype by which the piety which surrounds that name can be transferred to the Republican candidate who now stands in his shoes. Lincoln reminds the Republicans, Bull Moose and Old Guard, that before the schism they had a common history. About the schism no one can afford to speak, but it is there, as yet unhealed. The speaker must heal it. Now the schism of 1912 had arisen over domestic questions. The reunion of 1916 was, as Mr. Roosevelt had declared, to be based on a common indignation against Mr. Wilson's conduct of international affairs. But international affairs were also a dangerous source of conflict. It was necessary to find an opening subject which would not only ignore 1912, but would avoid also the explosive conflicts of 1916. The speaker skillfully selected the spoil system in diplomatic appointments. Deserving Democrats was a discrediting phrase, and Mr. Hughes at once evokes it. The record being indefensible, there is no hesitation in the vigor of the attack. Logically, it was an ideal introduction to a common mood. Mr. Hughes then turns to Mexico, beginning with a historical view. He had to consider the general sentiment that affairs were going badly in Mexico, also a no less general sentiment that war should be avoided, and two powerful currents of opinion, one which said President Wilson was right in not recognizing Huerta, the other which preferred Huerta to Carranza, an intervention to both. Quote, he was certainly in fact the head of the government in Mexico, end quote. But the moralists who regarded Huerta as a drunken murderer had to be placated. Quote, Whether or not he should be recognized was a question to be determined in the exercise of a sound discretion, but according to correct principles. End quote. So instead of saying that Huerta should be recognized, the candidate says the correct principles ought to be applied. Everybody believes in correct principles, and everybody, of course, believes he possesses them. To blur the issue still further, President Wilson's policy is described as intervention. It was that in law, perhaps, but not in the sense then currently meant by the word. By stretching the word to cover what Mr. Wilson had done, as well as what the real interventionists wanted, the issue between the two factions was to be repressed. Having got by the two explosive points, huerta and intervention, by letting the words mean all things to all men, the speech passes for a while to safer ground. The candidate tells the story of Tampico, Veracruz, Villa, Santa Isabel, Columbus, and Carrizal. Mr. Hughes is specific, either because the facts as known from the newspapers are irritating, or because the true explanation is, as for example in regard to Tampico, too complicated. No contrary passions could be aroused by such a record. But at the end, the candidate had to take a position. His audience expected it. The indictment was Mr. Roosevelt's. Would Mr. Hughes adopt his remedy, intervention? Quote, the nation has no policy of aggression towards Mexico. We have no desire for any part of her territory. We wish her to have peace, stability, and prosperity. We should be ready to aid her in binding up her wounds, in relieving her from starvation and distress, in giving her every practicable way the benefits of our disinterested friendship. The conduct of this administration has created difficulties which we shall have to surmount. We shall have to adopt a new policy, a policy of firmness and consistency, through which alone we can promote an enduring friendship. End quote. The theme, friendship, is for the non-interventionists. The theme, new policy, and firmness, is for the interventionists. On the non-contentious record, the detail is overwhelming. On the issue, everything is cloudy. Concerning the European war, Mr. Hughes employed an ingenious formula. Quote, I stand for the unflinching maintenance of all American rights on land and sea. End quote. In order to understand the force of that statement at the time it was spoken, we must remember how each faction during that period of neutrality believed that the nations it opposed in Europe were alone violating American rights. Mr. Hughes seemed to say to the pro-allies, I would have coerced Germany but the pro-Germans had been insisting 
that British sea power was violating most of our rights. The formula covers two diametrically opposed purposes by the symbolic phrase, American rights. But there was the Lusitania. Like the 1912 schism, it was an invincible obstacle to harmony. Quote, I am confident that there would have been no destruction of American lives by the sinking of the Lusitania. End quote. Thus, what cannot be comprehended must be obliterated, when there is a question on which we cannot all hope to get together, let us pretend that it does not exist. About the future of American relations with Europe, Mr. Hughes was silent. Nothing he could say would possibly please the two irreconcilable factions, for whose support he was bidding. It is hardly necessary to say that Mr. Hughes did not invent this technique, and did not employ it with the utmost success. But he illustrated how a public opinion, constituted out of divergent opinions, is clouded, how its meaning approaches the neutral tint formed out of the blending of many colors. Where superficial harmony is the aim, and conflict is the fact, obscuritanism in a public appeal is the usual result. Almost always, vagueness at a crucial point in public debate is a symptom of cross-purposes. But how is it that a vague idea so often has the power to unite deeply felt opinions? These opinions, we recall, however deeply they may be felt, are not in continual and pungent contact with the facts they profess to treat. On the unseen environment, Mexico, the European war, our grip is slight, though our feeling may be intense. The original pictures and words which aroused it have not anything like the force of the feeling itself. The account of what has happened, out of sight and hearing, in a place where we have never been, has not and never can have, except briefly as in a dream or fantasy, all the dimensions of reality. But it can arouse all, and sometimes even more emotion than the reality, for the trigger can be pulled by more than one stimulus. The stimulus which originally pulled the trigger may have been a series of pictures in the mind aroused by printed or spoken words. These pictures fade and are hard to keep steady, their contours and their pulse fluctuate. Gradually the process sets in of knowing what you feel, without being entirely certain why you feel it. The fading pictures are displaced by other pictures, and then by names or symbols. But the emotion goes on, capable now of being aroused by the substituted images and names. Even in severe thinking these substitutions take place, for if a man is trying to compare two complicated situations, he soon finds exhausting the attempt to hold both fully in mind in all their detail. He employs a shorthand of names and signs and samples. He has to do this if he is to advance at all, because he cannot carry the whole baggage in every phrase, through every step he takes. But if he forgets that he has substituted and simplified, he soon lapses into verbalism, and begins to talk about names regardless of objects. And then, he has no way of knowing when the name divorced from its first thing is carrying on a misalliance with some other thing. It is more difficult still to guard against changelings in casual politics. For by what is known to psychologists as conditioned response, an emotion is not attached merely to one idea. There are no end of things which can arouse the emotion, and no end of things which can satisfy it. This is particularly true, where the stimulus is only dimly and indirectly perceived, and where the objective is likewise indirect. For you can associate an emotion, say, fear, first with something immediately dangerous, then with the idea of that thing, then with something similar to that idea, and so on and on. The whole structure of human culture is, in one respect, an elaboration of the stimuli and responses, of which the original emotional capacities remain a fairly fixed center. No doubt the quality of emotion has changed in the course of history, but with nothing like the speed, or elaboration, that has characterized the conditioning of it. People differ widely in their susceptibility to ideas. There are some in whom the idea of a starving child in Russia is practically as vivid as a starving child within sight. There are others who are almost incapable of being excited by a distant idea. There are many graduations between, and there are people who are insensitive to facts and aroused only by ideas. But though the emotion is aroused by the idea, we are unable to satisfy the emotion by acting ourselves upon the scene itself. The idea of the starving Russian child evokes a desire to feed the child. 
but the person so aroused cannot feed it. He can only give money to an impersonal organization, or to a personification which he calls Mr. Hoover. His money does not reach that child, it goes into a general pool from which a mass of children are fed. And so, just as the idea is second-hand, so are the effects of the action second-hand. The cognition is indirect, the conation is indirect, only the effect is immediate. Of the three parts of the process, the stimulus comes from somewhere out of sight, the response reaches somewhere out of sight, only the emotion exists entirely within the person. Of the child's hunger, he has only an idea. Of the child's relief, he has only an idea. But of his own desire to help, he has a real experience. It is the central fact of the business, the emotion within himself, which is first-hand. Within limits that vary, the emotion is transferable both as regards stimulus and response. Therefore, if among a number of people, possessing various tendencies to respond, you can find a stimulus which will arouse the same emotion in many of them, you can substitute it for the original stimuli. If, for example, one man dislikes the league, another hates Mr. Wilson, and a third fears labor, you may be able to unite them if you can find some symbol which is the antithesis of what they all hate. Suppose that symbol is Americanism. The first man may read it as meaning the preservation of American isolation, or, as he may call it, independence, the second as the rejection of a politician who clashes with his idea of what an American president should be, the third as a call to resist revolution. The symbol in itself signifies literally no one thing in particular, but it can be associated with almost anything. And because of that, it can become the common bond of common feelings, even though those feelings were originally attached to disparate ideas. When political parties or newspapers declare for Americanism, progressivism, law and order, justice, humanity, they hope to amalgamate the emotion of conflicting factions which would surely divide if, instead of these symbols, they were invited to discuss a specific program. For when a coalition around a symbol has been affected, feeling flows towards conformity under the symbol, rather than towards critical scrutiny of the measures. It is, I think, convenient and technically correct to call multiple phrases like these symbolic. They do not stand for specific ideas, but for a sort of truce or junction between ideas. They are like a strategic railroad center where many roads converge, regardless of their ultimate origin or their ultimate destination. But he who captures the symbols by which public feeling is for the moment contained, controls by that much the approaches of public policy. And as long as a particular symbol has the power of coalition, ambitious factions will fight for possession. Think, for example, of Lincoln's name or of Roosevelt's. A leader or an interest that can make itself master of current symbols is master of the current situation. There are limits, of course. Too violent abuse of the actualities which groups of people think the symbol represents, or too great resistance in the name of that symbol to new purposes, will, so to speak, burst the symbol. In this manner, during the year 1917, the imposing symbol of Holy Russia and the Little Father burst under the impact of suffering and defeat. The tremendous consequences of Russia's collapse were felt on all the fronts and among all the peoples. They led directly to a striking experiment in the crystallization of a common opinion, out of the varieties of opinion turned up by the war. The fourteen points were addressed to all the governments, allied, enemy, neutral, and to all the peoples. They were an attempt to knit together the chief imponderables of a world war. Necessarily, this was a new departure, because this was the first great war in which all the deciding elements of mankind could be brought to think about the same ideas, or at least about the same names for ideas, simultaneously. Without cable, radio, telegraph, and daily press, the experiment of the 14 points would have been impossible. It was an attempt to exploit the modern machinery of communication, to start the return to a common consciousness throughout the world. But first we must examine some of the circumstances as they presented themselves at the end of 1917. For in the form which the document finally assumed, all these considerations are somehow represented. During the summer and autumn, a series of events had occurred which profoundly affected the temper of the people and the course of the war. In July the Russians had made a last offensive, 
had been disastrously beaten, and the process of demoralization which led to the Bolshevik Revolution of November had begun. Somewhat earlier, the French had suffered a severe and almost disastrous defeat in Champagne, which produced mutinies in the army and a defeatist agitation among the civilians. England was suffering from the effects of the submarine raids, from the terrible losses of the Flanders battles, and in November at Cambrai, the British armies met a reverse that appalled the troops at the front and the leaders at home. Extreme war weariness pervaded the whole of Western Europe. In effect, the agony and disappointment had jarred loose men's concentration on the accepted version of the war. Their interests were no longer held by the ordinary official pronouncements, and their attention began to wander, fixing now upon their own suffering, now upon their party and class purposes, now upon general resentments against the governments. That more or less perfect organization of perception by official propaganda, of interest and attention by the stimuli of hope, fear, and hatred, which is called morale, was by way of breaking down. The minds of men everywhere began to search for new attachments that promised relief. Suddenly they beheld a tremendous drama. On the eastern front there was a Christmas truce, an end of slaughter, an end of noise, a promise of peace. At brest litovsk the dream of all simple people had come to life. It was possible to negotiate. There was some other way to end the ordeal than by matching lives with the enemy. Timidly, but with rapt attention, people began to turn to the east. Why not? they asked. What is it all for? Do the politicians know what they are doing? Are we really fighting for what they say? Is it possible, perhaps, to secure it without fighting? Under the ban of the censorship, little of this was allowed to show itself in print, but, when Lord Lansdowne spoke, there was a response from the heart. The earlier symbols of the war had become hackneyed and had lost their power to unify. Beneath the surface a wide schism was opening up in each allied country. Something similar was happening in Central Europe. There, too, the original impulse of the war was weakened, the Union Sacre was broken. The vertical cleavages along the battlefront were cut across by horizontal divisions running in all kinds of unforeseeable ways. The moral crisis of the war had arrived before the military decision was in sight. All this President Wilson and his advisers realized. They had not, of course, a perfect knowledge of the situation, but what I have sketched they knew. They knew, also, that the Allied governments were bound by a series of engagements that in letter and in spirit ran counter to the popular conception of what the war was about. The resolutions of the Paris Economic Conference were, of course, public property, and the network of secret treaties had been published by the Bolsheviks in November of 1917. Footnote. President Wilson stated at his conference with the senators that he had never heard of these treaties until he reached Paris. That statement is perplexing. The fourteen points, as the text shows, could not have been formulated without a knowledge of the secret treaties. The substance of those treaties was before the President, when he and Colonel House prepared the final published text of the fourteen points, and footnote. Their terms were only vaguely known to the peoples, but it was definitely believed that they did not comport with the idealistic slogan of self-determination, no annexations, and no indemnities. Popular questioning took the form of asking how many thousand English lives Alsace-Lorraine or Dalmatia were worth, how many French lives Poland or Mesopotamia were worth. Nor was such questioning entirely unknown in America. The whole Allied cause had been put on the defensive by the refusal to participate at Brest-Litovsk. Here was a highly sensitive state of mind which no competent leader could fail to consider. The ideal response would have been joint action by the Allies. That was found to be impossible when it was considered at the Inter-Allied Conference of October. But by December the pressure had become so great that Mr. George and Mr. Wilson were moved independently to make some response. The form selected by the President was a statement of peace terms under 14 heads. The numbering of them was an artifice to secure precision and to create at once the impression that here was a business-like document. The idea of stating peace terms instead of war aims arose from the necessity of establishing a genuine alternative to the brest litovs negotiations. They were intended to compete for attention by substituting for the spectacle of Russo-German parleys the much grander spectacle of a public worldwide debate. 
Having enlisted the interest of the world, it was necessary to hold that interest unified and flexible for all the different possibilities which the situation contained. The terms had to be such that the majority among the Allies would regard them as worthwhile. They had to meet the national aspirations of each people, and yet limit those aspirations, so that no one nation would regard itself as a cat's paw for another. The terms had to satisfy official interests, so as to not provoke official disunion, and yet they had to meet popular conceptions, so as to prevent the spread of demoralization. They had, in short, to preserve and confirm Allied unity in case the war was to go on. But they had also to be the terms of a possible peace, so that in case the German center and left were ripe for agitation, they would have a text with which to smite the governing class. The terms had, therefore, to push the Allied governors nearer to their people, drive the German governors away from their people, and establish a line of common understanding between the Allies, the non-official Germans, and the subject peoples of Austria-Hungary. The fourteen points were a daring attempt to raise a standard to which almost everyone might repair. If a sufficient number of the enemy people were ready, there would be peace. If not, then the Allies would be better prepared to sustain the shock of war. All these considerations entered into the making of the fourteen points. No one man may have had them all in mind, but all the men concerned had some of them in mind. Against this background, let us examine certain aspects of the document. The first five points and the fourteenth deal with open diplomacy, freedom of the seas, equal trade opportunities, reduction of armaments, no imperialist annexation of colonies, and the League of Nations. They might be described as a statement of the popular generalizations in which everyone at the time professed to believe. But number three is more specific. It was aimed consciously and directly at the resolutions of the Paris Economic Conference and was meant to relieve the German people of their fear of suffocation. Number six is the first point dealing with a particular nation. It was intended as a reply to Russian suspicion of the Allies, and the eloquence of its promises was attuned to the drama of Brest-Litovsk. Number seven deals with Belgium, and is as unqualified in form and purpose as was the conviction of practically the whole world, including very large sections of Central Europe. Over number eight we must pause. It begins with an absolute demand for evacuation and restoration of French territory, and then passes on to the question of Alsace-Lorraine. The phrasing of this clause most perfectly illustrates the character of a public statement which must condense a vast complex of interests in a few words. Quote, and the wrong done to France by Prussia in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine, which has unsettled the peace of the world for nearly fifty years, should be righted. End quote. Every word here was chosen with meticulous care. The wrong done should be righted. Why not say that Alsace-Lorraine should be restored? It was not said, because it was not certain that all the French at that time would fight on indefinitely for re-annexation if they were offered a plebiscite, and because it was even less certain whether the English and Italians would fight on. The formula had, therefore, to cover both contingencies. The word righted guaranteed satisfaction to France, but did not read as a commitment to simple annexation. But why speak of the wrong done by Prussia in 1871? The word Prussia was, of course, intended to remind the South Germans that Alsace-Lorraine belonged not to them, but to Prussia. Why speak of peace unsettled for fifty years, and why the use of 1871? In the first place, what the French and the rest of the world remembered was 1871. That was the nodal point of their grievance. But the formulators of the fourteen points knew that French officialdom planned for more than the Alsace-Lorraine of 1871. The secret memoranda that had passed between the Tsar's ministers and French officials in 1916 covered the annexation of the Saar Valley and some sort of dismemberment of the Rhineland. It was planned to include the Saar Valley under the term Alsace-Lorraine because it had been part of Alsace-Lorraine in 1814, although it had been detached in 1815 and was no part of the territory at the close of the Franco-Prussian War. The official French formula for annexing the Tsar was to subsume it under Alsace-Lorraine, meaning the Alsace-Lorraine of 1814 and 1815. By insistence on 1871, the President was really defining the ultimate boundary between Germany and France, was adverting to the secret treaty, 
and was casting it aside. Number nine, a little less subtly, does the same thing in respect to Italy. Quote, clearly recognizable lines of nationality, end quote, are exactly what the lines of the Treaty of London were not. Those lines were partly strategic, partly economic, partly imperialistic, and partly ethnic. The only part of them that could possibly procure Allied sympathy was that which would recover the genuine Italia Irredenta. All the rest, as everyone who was informed knew, merely delayed the impending Yugoslav revolt. It would be a mistake to suppose that the apparently unanimous enthusiasm which greeted the 14 points represented agreement on a program. Everyone seemed to find something that he liked and stressed this aspect and that detail, but no one risked a discussion. The phrases, so pregnant with the underlying conflicts of the civilized world, were accepted. They stood for opposing ideas, but they evoked a common emotion. And to that extent they played a part in rallying the Western peoples, for the desperate ten months of war which they had still to endure. As long as the fourteen points dealt with that hazy and happy future, when the agony was to be over, the real conflicts of interpretation were not made manifest. They were plans for the settlement of a wholly invisible environment, and because these plans inspired all groups each with its own private hope, all hopes ran together as a public hope. For harmonization, as we saw in Mr. Hughes' speech, is a hierarchy of symbols. As you ascend the hierarchy, in order to include more and more factions, you may for a time preserve the emotional connection, though you lose the intellectual. But even the emotion becomes thinner. As you go further away from experience, you go higher into generalization or subtlety. As you go up in the balloon, you throw more and more concrete objects overboard, and when you have reached the top with some phrase like the rights of humanity, or the world made safe for democracy, you see far and wide, but you see very little. Yet the people whose emotions are entrained do not remain passive. As the public appeal becomes more and more all things to all men, as the emotion is stirred while the meaning is dispersed, their very private meanings are given a universal application. Whatever you want badly is the rights of humanity. For the phrase, ever more vacant, capable of meaning almost anything, soon comes to mean pretty nearly everything. Mr. Wilson's phrases were understood in endlessly different ways, in every corner of the earth. No document negotiated and made public record existed to correct the confusion. Footnote. The American interpretation of the 14 points was explained to the Allied statesmen just before the armistice. And so, when the day of settlement came, everybody expected everything. The European authors of the treaty had a large choice, and they chose to realize those expectations which were held by those of their countrymen who wielded the most power at home. They came down the hierarchy from the rights of humanity to the rights of France, Britain, and Italy. They did not abandon the use of symbols. They abandoned only those which, after the war, had no permanent roots in the imagination of their constituents. They preserved the unity of France by the use of symbolism, but they would not risk anything for the unity of Europe. The symbol France was deeply attached. The symbol Europe had only a recent history. Nevertheless, the distinction between an omnibus like Europe and a symbol like France is not sharp. The history of states and empires reveals times when the scope of the unifying idea increases, and also times when it shrinks. One cannot say that men have moved consistently from smaller loyalties to larger ones, because the facts will not bear out the claim. The Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire bellied out further than those national unifications in the 19th century, from which believers in a world state argue by analogy. Nevertheless, it is probably true that the real integration has increased, regardless of the temporary inflation and deflation of empires. Such a real integration has undoubtedly occurred in American history. In the decade before 1789 most men, it seems, felt that their state and their community were real, but that the confederation of states was unreal. The idea that their state, its flag, its most conspicuous leaders, or whatever it was that represented Massachusetts or Virginia, were genuine symbols. That is to say, they were fed by actual experiences from childhood, occupation, residence, and the like. The span of men's experience had rarely traversed the imaginary boundaries of their states. 
The word Virginian was related to pretty nearly everything that most Virginians had ever known or felt. It was the most extensive political idea which had genuine contact with their experience. Their experience, not their needs. For their needs arose out of their real environment, which in those days was at least as large as the thirteen colonies. They needed a common defense. They needed a financial and economic regime as extensive as the Confederation, but as long as the pseudo environment of the state encompassed them, the state symbols exhausted their political interest. An interstate idea, like the Confederation, represented a powerless abstraction. It was an omnibus, rather than a symbol, and the harmony among divergent groups, which the omnibus creates, is transient. I have said that the idea of Confederation was a powerless abstraction. Yet the need of unity existed in the decade before the Constitution was adopted. The need existed, in the sense that affairs were askew unless the need of unity was taken into account. Gradually certain classes in each colony began to break through the state experience. Their personal interests led across the state lines to interstate experiences, and gradually there was constructed in their minds a picture of the American environment which was truly national in scope. For them the idea of federation became a true symbol, and ceased to be an omnibus. The most imaginative of these men was Alexander Hamilton. It happened that he had no primitive attachment to any one state, for he was born in the West Indies, and had, from the very beginning of his act of life, been associated with the common interests of all the states. Thus, to most men of the time, the question of whether the capital would be in Virginia or in Philadelphia was of enormous importance, because they were locally minded. To Hamilton this question was of no emotional consequence. What he wanted was the assumption of the state debts, because they would further nationalize the proposed union. So he gladly traded the site of the capital for two necessary votes, from men who represented the Potomac district. To Hamilton, the union was a symbol that represented all his interests and his whole experience. To White and Lee from the Potomac, the symbol of their province was the highest political entity they served, and they served it though they hated to pay the price. They agreed, says Jefferson, to change their votes, quote, white with a revulsion of stomach almost convulsive, end quote. Footnote, works, volume 9, page 87, cited by Beard, Economic Origins of Jeffersonian Democracy, page 172. In the crystallizing of a common will, there is always an Alexander Hamilton at work. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 14 Yes or No Symbols are often so useful and so mysteriously powerful that the word itself exhales a magical glamour. In thinking about symbols, it is tempting to treat them as if they possessed independent energy. Yet no end of symbols, which once provoked ecstasy, have quite ceased to affect anybody. The museums and the books of folklore are full of dead emblems and incantations, since there is no power in the symbol, except that which it acquires by association in the human mind. The symbols that have lost their power, and the symbols incessantly suggested which fail to take root, remind us that if we were patient enough to study in detail the circulation of a symbol, we should behold an entirely secular history. In the Hughes campaign speech, in the 14 points, in Hamilton's project, symbols are employed. But they are employed by somebody at a particular moment. The words themselves do not crystallize random feeling. The words must be spoken by people who are strategically placed, and they must be spoken at the opportune moment. Otherwise they are mere wind. The symbols must be earmarked, for in themselves they mean nothing, and the choice of possible symbols is always so great that we should, like the donkey who stood equidistant between two bales of hay, perish from sheer indecision among the symbols that compete for our attention. Here, for example, are the reasons for their vote as stated by certain private citizens to a newspaper just before the election of 1920. For Harding, quote, the patriotic men and women of today, 
who cast their ballots for Harding and Coolidge, will be held by posterity to have signed our second declaration of independence. End quote. Mr. Wilmot, inventor. Quote, he will see to it that the United States does not enter into entangling alliances. Washington as a city will benefit by changing the control of the government from the Democrats to the Republicans. End quote. Mr. Clarence, salesman. For Cox, quote, the people of the United States realize that it is our duty pledged on the fields of France to join the League of Nations. We must shoulder our share of the burden of enforcing peace throughout the world. End quote. Miss Marie, stenographer. Quote, we should lose our own respect and the respect of other nations were we to refuse to enter the League of Nations in obtaining international peace. End quote. Mr. Spencer, statistician. The two sets of phrases are equally noble equally true, and almost reversible. Would Clarence and Wilmot have admitted for an instant that they intended to default in our duty pledged on the fields of France, or that they did not desire international peace? Certainly not. Would Marie and Spencer have admitted that they were in favor of entangling alliances, or the surrender of American independence? They would have argued with you that the League was, as President Wilson called it, a disentangling alliance, as well as a declaration of independence for all the world, plus a Monroe Doctrine for the planet. Since the offering of symbols is so generous, and the meaning that can be imputed is so elastic, how does any particular symbol take root in any particular person's mind? It is planted there by another human being, whom we recognize as authoritative. If it is planted deeply enough, it may be that later we shall call the person authoritative who waves that symbol at us. But in the first instance, symbols are made congenial and important because they are introduced to us by congenial and important people. For we are not born out of an egg at the age of 18 with a realistic imagination. We are still, as Mr. Shaw recalls, in the era of Berg and Lubin, where in infancy we are dependent upon older beings for our contacts. And so we make our connections with the outer world through certain beloved and authoritative persons. They are the first bridge to the invisible world. And though we may gradually master for ourselves many phases of that larger environment, there always remains a vaster one that is unknown. To that we still relate ourselves through authorities. Where all the facts are out of sight, a true report and a plausible error read alike, sound alike, feel alike. Except on a few subjects where our own knowledge is great, we cannot choose between true and false accounts. So we choose between trustworthy and untrustworthy reporters. Footnote. See an interesting, rather quaint old book. George Cornwall Lewis, an essay on the influence of authority in matters of opinion. Theoretically, we ought to choose the most expert on each subject. But the choice of the expert, though a good deal easier than the choice of truth, is still too difficult and often impracticable. The experts themselves are not in the least certain who among them is the most expert. And at that, the expert, even when we can identify him, is, likely as not, too busy to be consulted or impossible to get at. But there are people whom we can identify easily enough, because they are the people who are at the head of affairs. Parents, teachers, and masterful friends are the first people of this sort we encounter. Into the difficult question of why children trust one parent rather than another, the history teacher rather than the Sunday school teacher, we need not try to enter nor how trust gradually spreads through a newspaper or an acquaintance who is interested in public affairs to public personages. The literature of psychoanalysis is rich in suggestive hypothesis. At any rate, we do find ourselves trusting certain people who constitute our means of junction with pretty nearly the whole realm of unknown things. Strangely enough, this fact is sometimes regarded as inherently undignified as evidence of our sheep-like, ape-like nature. But complete independence in the universe is simply unthinkable. If we could not take practically everything for granted, we should spend our lives in utter triviality. The nearest thing to a wholly independent adult is a hermit, and the range of a hermit's action is very short. Acting entirely for himself, he can act only within a tiny radius and for simple ends. If he has time to think great thoughts, we can be certain that he has accepted without question before he went in for being a hermit, 
a whole repertory of painfully acquired information about how to keep warm and how to keep from being hungry, and also about what the great questions are. On all but a very few matters for short stretches in our lives, the utmost independence that we can exercise is to multiply the authorities to whom we give a friendly hearing. As congenital amateurs, our quest for truth consists in stirring up the experts and forcing them to answer any heresy that has the accent of conviction. In such a debate, we can often judge who has won the dialectical victory, but we are virtually defenseless against a false premise that none of the debaters has challenged, or a neglected aspect that none of them has brought into the argument. We shall see later how the democratic theory proceeds on the opposite assumption, and assumes for the purposes of government an unlimited supply of self-sufficient individuals. The people on whom we depend for contact with the outer world are those who seem to be running it. Footnote, Bryce, Modern Democracies, Volume 2, pages 544 and 545. They may be running only a very small part of the world. The nurse feeds the child, bathes it, and puts it to bed. That does not constitute the nurse, an authority on physics, zoology, and the higher criticism. Mr. Smith runs, or at least hires the man who runs the factory. That does not make him an authority on the Constitution of the United States, nor on the effects of the Fordney Tariff. Mr. Smoot runs the Republican Party in the state of Utah. That in itself does not prove he is the best man to consult about taxation. But the nurse may, nevertheless, determine for a while what zoology the child shall learn. Mr. Smith will have much to say on what the Constitution shall mean to his wife, his secretary, and perhaps even to his parson, and who shall define the limits of Senator Smoot's authority. The priest, the lord of the manor, the captains and the kings, the party leaders, the merchant, the boss, however these men are chosen, whether by birth, inheritance, conquest or election, they and their organized following administer human affairs. They are the officers, and although the same man may be field marshal at home, second lieutenant at the office, and scrub private in politics, although in many institutions the hierarchy of rank is vague or concealed, yet in every institution that requires the cooperation of many persons, some such hierarchy exists. Footnote. See M. Ostrogorsky, Democracy and the Organization of Political Parties, throughout. R. Michaels, Political Parties, throughout. And Bryce, Modern Democracies, particularly Chapter 75, also Ross, Principles of Psychology, Chapters 22 to 24. In American politics, we call it a machine, or the organization. There are a number of important distinctions between the members of the machine and the rank and file. The leaders, the steering committee, and the inner circle are in direct contact with their environment. They may, to be sure, have a very limited notion of what they ought to define as the environment, but they are not dealing almost wholly with abstractions. There are particular men they hope to see elected, particular balance sheets they wish to see improved, concrete objectives that must be attained. I do not mean that they escape the human propensity to stereotyped vision. Their stereotypes often make them absurd routineers. But whatever their limitations, the chiefs are in actual contact with some crucial part of that larger environment. They decide. They give orders. They bargain. And something definite, perhaps not at all what they imagined, actually happens. Their subordinates are not tied to them by a common conviction. That is to say, the lesser members of a machine do not dispose their loyalty according to independent judgment about the wisdom of the leaders. In the hierarchy, each is dependent upon a superior and is in turn superior to some class of his dependents. What holds the machine together is a system of privileges. These may vary according to the opportunities and the tastes of those who seek them, from nepotism and patronage in all their aspects to clannishness, hero worship, or a fixed idea. They vary from military rank in armies, through land and services in a feudal system, to jobs and publicity in a modern democracy. That is why you can break up a particular machine by abolishing its privileges. But the machine in every coherent group is, I believe, certain to reappear. For privilege is entirely relative, and uniformity is impossible. Imagine the most absolute communism of which your mind is capable, where no one possessed any object that everyone else did not possess, and still, if the communist group had to take any action whatever, 
the mere pleasure of being the friend of the man who was going to make the speech that secured the most votes would, I am convinced, be enough to crystallize an organization of insiders around him. It is not necessary, then, to invent a collective intelligence in order to explain why the judgments of a group are usually more coherent and often more true to form than the remarks of the man on the street. One mind, or a few, can pursue a train of thought, but a group trying to think in concert can, as a group, do little more than assent or dissent. The members of a hierarchy can have a corporate tradition. As apprentices they learn the trade from the masters, who in turn learned it when they were apprentices, and in any enduring society, the change of personnel within the governing hierarchies is slow enough to permit the transmission of certain great stereotypes and patterns of behavior. From father to son, from prelate to novice, from veteran to cadet, certain ways of seeing and doing are taught. These ways become familiar and are recognized as such by the mass of outsiders. Distance alone lends enchantment to the view that masses of human beings ever cooperate in any complex affair without a central machine managed by a very few people. Quote, no one, says Bryce, footnote, cited above, volume 2, page 542, quote, can have had some years' experience of the conduct of affairs in a legislature or an administration without observing how extremely small is the number of persons by whom the world is governed, end quote. He is referring, of course, to affairs of state. To be sure, if you consider all the affairs of mankind, the number of people who govern is considerable, but if you take any particular institution, be it a legislature, a party, a trade union, a nationalist movement, a factory, or a club, the number of those who govern is a very small percentage of those who are theoretically supposed to govern. Landslides can turn one machine out and put another in. Revolutions sometimes abolish a particular machine altogether. The democratic revolution set up two alternating machines, each of which in the course of a few years reaps the advantage from the mistakes of the other. But nowhere does the machine disappear. Nowhere is the idyllic theory of democracy realized. Certainly not in trades unions, nor in socialist parties, nor in communist governments. There is an inner circle, surrounded by concentric circles, which fade out gradually into the disinterested or uninterested rank and file. Democrats have never come to terms with this commonplace of group life. They have invariably regarded it as perverse. For there are two visions of democracy. One presupposes the self-sufficient individual, the other an oversoul regulating everything. Of the two, the oversoul has some advantage, because it does at least recognize that the mass makes decisions that are not spontaneously born in the breast of every member. But the oversoul as presiding genius in corporate behavior is a superfluous mystery if we fix our attention upon the machine. The machine is a quite prosaic reality. It consists of human beings who wear clothes and live in houses, and can be named and described. They perform all the duties usually assigned to the oversoul. The reason for the machine is not the perversity of human nature. It is that out of the private notions of any group, no common idea emerges by itself. For the number of ways is limited, in which a multitude of people can act directly upon a situation beyond their reach. Some of them can migrate, in one form or another, they can strike or boycott, they can applaud or hiss. They can, by these means, occasionally resist what they do not like, or coerce those who obstruct what they desire. But by mass action nothing can be constructed, devised, negotiated, or administered. A public as such, without an organized hierarchy around which it can gather, may refuse to buy if the prices are too high, or refuse to work if wages are too low. A trade union can, by mass action, in a strike, break an opposition, so that the union officials can negotiate an agreement. It may win, for example, the right to joint control. But it cannot exercise the right except through an organization. A nation can clamor for war, but when it goes to war it must put itself under orders from a general staff. The limit of direct action is, for all practical purposes, the power to say yes or no on an issue presented to the mass, Footnote, see James, Some Problems of Philosophy, page 227. Quote, but for most of our emergencies, fractional solutions are impossible. Seldom can we act fractionally. End quote. See Lowell, 
Public Opinion and Popular Government, pages 91 and 92. For only in the very simplest cases does an issue present itself in the same form spontaneously and approximately, at the same time to all the members of a public. There are unorganized strikes and boycotts, not merely industrial ones, where the grievance is so plain that virtually without leadership the same reaction takes place in many people. But even in these rudimentary cases, there are persons who know what they want to do more quickly than the rest, and who become impromptu ringleaders. Where they do not appear, a crowd will mill about aimlessly beset by all its private aims, or stand by fatalistically, as did a crowd of fifty persons the other day, and watch a man commit suicide. For what we make out of most of the impressions that come to us from the invisible world is a kind of pantomime, played out in reverie. The number of times is small that we consciously decide anything about events beyond our sight, and each man's opinion of what he could accomplish if he tried is slight. There is rarely a practical issue, and therefore no great habit of decision. This would be more evident, were it not that most information when it reaches us carries with it an aura of suggestion as to how we ought to feel about the news. That suggestion we need, and if we do not find it in the news, we turn to the editorials or a trusted adviser. The reverie, if we feel ourselves implicated, is uncomfortable until we know where we stand, that is, until the facts have been formulated, so that we can feel yes or no in regard to them. When a number of people all say yes, they may have all kinds of reasons for saying it. They generally do, for the pictures in their minds are, as we have already noted, varied in subtle and intimate ways. But this subtlety remains within their minds. It becomes represented publicly by a number of symbolic phrases which carry the individual emotion after evacuating most of the intention. The hierarchy, or, if it is a contest, then the two hierarchies, associate the symbols with a definite action, a vote of yes or no, the attitude pro or con. Then Smith, who is against the League, and Jones, who is against Article X, and Brown, who is against Mr. Wilson and all his works, each for his own reason, all in the name of more or less the same symbolic phrase, register a vote against the Democrats by voting for the Republicans. A common will has been expressed. A concrete choice had to be presented, the choice had to be connected, by the transfer of interest through the symbols, with individual opinion. The professional politicians learned this long before the Democratic philosophers. And so they organized the caucus, the nominating convention, and the steering committee as the means for formulating a definite choice. Everyone who wishes to accomplish anything that requires the cooperation of a large number of people follows their example. Sometimes it is done rather brutally, as when the peace conference reduced itself to the Council of Ten, and the Council of Ten to the Big Three or Four, and wrote a treaty which the minor allies, their own constituents, and the enemy, were permitted to take or leave. More consultation than that is generally possible and desirable. But the essential fact remains that a small number of heads present a choice to a large group. The abuses of the steering committee have led to various proposals such as the initiative, referendum, and the direct primary. But these merely postponed or obscured the need for a machine by complicating the elections, or as H.G. Wells once said with scrupulous accuracy, the selections. For no amount of balloting can obviate the need for creating an issue, be it a measure or a candidate, on which the voters can say yes or no. There is, in fact, no such thing as direct legislation. For what happens where it is supposed to exist? The citizen goes to the polls, receives a ballot on which a number of measures are printed, almost always in abbreviated form, and, if he says anything at all, he says yes or no. The most brilliant amendment in the world may occur to him. He votes yes or no on that bill and no other. You have to commit violence against the English language to call that legislation. I do not argue, of course, that there are no benefits, whatever you call the process. I think that for certain kinds of issues there are distinct benefits. But the necessary simplicity of any mass decision is a very important fact in view of the inevitable complexity of the world in which those decisions operate. The most complicated form of voting that anyone proposes is, I suppose, the preferential ballot. Among a number of candidates presented to the voter under that system, instead of saying yes to one candidate and no to all the others, states the order of his choice. 
But even here, immensely more flexible though it is, the action of the mass depends upon the quality of the choices presented. Footnote. See Harold J. Lasky, Foundations of Sovereignty, page 224. Quote, Proportional representation, by leading as it seems to lead, to the group system, may deprive the electors of their choice of leaders. End quote. The group system undoubtedly lends, as Mr. Lasky says, to make the selection of the executive more indirect, but there is no doubt also that it tends to produce legislative assemblies in which currents of opinion are more fully represented. Whether that is good or bad cannot be determined a priori. But one can say that successful cooperation and responsibility in a more accurately representative assembly require a higher organization of political intelligence and political habit than a rigid two-party house. It is a more complex political form and may therefore work less well. And those choices are presented by the energetic coteries who hustle about with petitions and round up the delegates. The many can elect after the few have nominated. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Public Opinion by Walter Littman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 15. Leaders and the Rank and File. Because of their transcendent practical importance, no successful leader has ever been too busy to cultivate the symbols which organize his following. What privileges do within the hierarchy, symbols do for the rank and file. They can serve unity. From the totem pole to the national flag, from the wooden idol to God the invisible king, from the magic word to some diluted version of Adam Smith or Bentham, symbols have been cherished by leaders, many of whom were themselves unbelievers, because they were focal points where differences merged. The detached observer may scorn the star-spangled ritual which hedges the symbol, perhaps as much as the king who told himself that Paris was worth a few masses. But the leader knows by experience that only when symbols have done their work is there a handle he can use to move a crowd. In the symbol, emotion is discharged at a common target, and the idiosyncrasy of real ideas blotted out. No wonder he hates what he calls destructive criticism, sometimes called by free spirits the elimination of buncombe. Quote, Above all things, says Badgett, our royalty is to be reverenced, and if you begin to poke about it, you cannot reverence it. End quote. Footnote, The English Constitution, page 127, D. Appleton and Company, 1914. For poking about with clear definitions and candid statements serves all high purposes known to man except the easy conservation of a common will. Poking about, as every responsible leader suspects, tends to break the transference of emotion from the individual mind to the institutional symbol. And the first result of that is, as he rightly says, a chaos of individualism and warring sects. The disintegration of a symbol, like Holy Russia, or the Iron Diaz, is always the beginning of a long upheaval. These great symbols possess by transference all the minute and detailed loyalties of an ancient and stereotyped society. They evoke the feeling that each individual has for the landscape, the furniture, the faces, the memories that are his first, and in a static society, his only reality. That core of images and devotions, without which he is unthinkable to himself, is nationality. These great symbols take up these devotions and can arouse them without calling forth the primitive images. The lesser symbols of public debate, the more casual chatter of politics, are always referred back to these proto-symbols, and if possible, associated with them. The question of a proper fare on a municipal subway is symbolized as an issue between the people and the interests, and then, the people, is inserted in the symbol, American, so that finally in the heat of a campaign, an eight-cent fare becomes un-American. The revolutionary fathers died to prevent it. Lincoln suffered that it might not come to pass. Resistance to it was implied in the death of those who sleep in France. Because of its power to siphon emotion out of distinct ideas, the symbol is both a mechanism of solidarity and a mechanism of exploitation. 
It enables people to work for a common end, but just because the few who are strategically placed must choose the concrete objectives, the symbol is also an instrument by which a few can fatten on many, deflect criticism, and seduce men into facing agony for objects they do not understand. Many aspects of our subjection to symbols are not flattering, if we choose to think of ourselves as realistic, self-sufficient, and self-governing personalities. Yet it is impossible to conclude that symbols are altogether instruments of the devil. In the realm of science and contemplation, they are undoubtedly the tempter himself. But in the world of action they may be beneficent, and are sometimes a necessity. The necessity is often imagined, the peril manufactured. But when quick results are imperative, the manipulation of masses through symbols may be the only quick way of having a critical thing done. It is often more important to act than to understand. It is sometimes true that the action would fail if everyone understood it. There are many affairs which cannot wait for a referendum or endure publicity, and there are times, during war for example, when a nation, an army, and even its commanders, must trust strategy to a very few minds, when two conflicting opinions, though one happens to be right, are more perilous than one opinion which is wrong. The wrong opinion may have bad results, but the two opinions may entail disaster by dissolving unity. Footnote. Captain Peter S. Wright, Assistant Secretary of the Supreme War Council, his, at the Supreme War Council, is well worth careful reading on secrecy and unity of command, even though, in respect to the Allied leaders, he wages a passionate polemic. Thus, Foch and Sir Henry Wilson, who foresaw the impending disaster to Koff's army, as a consequence of the divided and scattered reserves, nevertheless kept their opinions well within a small circle, knowing that even the risk of a smashing defeat was less certainly destructive than would have been an excited debate in the newspapers. For what matters most under the kind of tension which prevailed in March, 1918, is less the rightness of a particular move than the unbroken expectation as to the source of command. Had Foch gone to the people, he might have won the debate, but long before he could have won it, the armies which he was to command would have dissolved. For the spectacle of a row on Olympus is diverting and destructive. But so also is a conspiracy of silence. Says Captain Wright, quote, It is in the high command and not in the line, that the art of camouflage is most practiced, and reaches to highest flights. All chiefs everywhere are now kept painted, by the busy work of numberless publicists, so as to be mistaken for Napoleons, at a distance. It becomes almost impossible to displace these Napoleons, whatever their incompetence, because of the enormous public support created by hiding or glossing failure, and exaggerating or inventing success. But the most insidious and worst effect of this so highly organized falsity is on the generals themselves, modest and patriotic as they mostly are, and as most men must be to take up and follow the noble profession of arms, they themselves are ultimately affected by these universal illusions, and reading it every morning in the paper, they also grow persuaded that they are thunderbolts of war and infallible, however much they fail, and that their maintenance and command is an end so sacred that it justifies the use of any means. These various conditions, of which this great deceit is the greatest, at last emancipate all general staffs from all control. They no longer live for the nation. The nation lives, or rather dies, for them. Victory or defeat ceases to be the prime interest. What matters to these semi-sovereign corporations is whether dear old Willie or poor old Harry is going to be at their head or at the Chantilly party prevail over the Boulevard des Invalides party, end quote. Footnote, cited above, pages 98 and 101 through 105. Yet Captain Wright, who can be so eloquent and so discerning about the dangers of silence, is forced nevertheless to approve the silence of Foch in not publicly destroying the illusions. There is here a complicated paradox, arising as we shall see more fully later on, because the traditional democratic view of life is conceived, not for emergencies and dangers, but for tranquility and harmony. And so, where masses of people must cooperate in an uncertain and eruptive environment, it is usually necessary to secure unity and flexibility without real consent. The symbol does that. It obscures personal intention, neutralizes discrimination, and obfuscates individual purpose. It immobilizes personality, yet at the same time it enormously sharpens the intention of the group and welds that group, 
as nothing else in a crisis can weld it, to purposeful action. It renders the mass mobile, though it immobilizes personality. The symbol is the instrument by which, in the short run, the mass escapes from its own inertia, the inertia of indecision, or the inertia of headlong movement, and is rendered capable of being led along the zigzag of a complex situation. But in the longer run, the give and take increases between the leaders and the led. The word most often used to describe the state of mind in the rank and file about its leaders is morale. That is said to be good when the individuals do the part allotted to them with all their energy, when each man's whole strength is evoked by the command from above. It follows that every leader must plan his policy with this in mind. He must consider his decision not only on the merits, but also in its effect on any part of his following, whose continued support he requires. If he is a general planning an attack, he knows that his organized military units will scatter into mobs if the percentage of casualties rises too high. In the Great War, previous calculations were upset to an extraordinary degree, for, quote, out of every nine men who went to France, five became casualties, end quote. Footnote, cited above, page 37. Figures taken by Captain Wright from the statistical abstract of the war in the archives of the War Office. The figures refer apparently to the English losses alone, possibly to the English and French. The limit of endurance was far greater than anyone had supposed. But there was a limit somewhere. And so, partly because of its effect on the enemy, and also in great measure because of its effect on the troops and their families, no command in this war dared to publish a candid statement of its losses. In France, the casualty lists were never published. In England, America, and Germany, publication of the losses of a big battle were spread out over long periods, so as to destroy a unified impression of the total. Only the insiders knew until long afterwards what the sum had cost, or the Flanders battles, footnote, cited above, page 34, the sum cost nearly 500,000 casualties, the Arras and Flanders offensives of 1917 cost 650,000 British casualties. And Ludendorff, undoubtedly, had a very much more accurate idea of these casualties than any private person in London, Paris, or Chicago. All the leaders in every camp did their best to limit the amount of actual war which any one soldier or civilian could vividly conceive. But, of course, among old veterans like the French troops of 1917, a great deal more is known about war than ever reaches the public. Such an army begins to judge its commanders in terms of its own suffering. And then, when another extravagant promise of victory turns out to be the customary bloody defeat, you may find that a mutiny breaks out over some comparatively minor blunder. Footnote. The Allies suffered many bloodier defeats than that on the Chemin de Dem. Like Nivelle's offensive of 1917, because it is a cumulative blunder. Revolutions and mutinies generally follow a small sample of a big series of evils. Footnote. See Pierre Fou's account, cited above, on the causes of the Suessons' mutinies and the method adopted by Pétain to deal with them. Volume 1, Part 3, and the following. The incidence of policy determines the relation between leader and following. If those whom he needs in his plan are remote from the place where the action takes place, if the results are hidden or postponed, if the individual obligations are indirect or not yet due, above all, if assent is an exercise of some pleasurable emotion, the leader is likely to have a free hand. Those programs are immediately most popular, like prohibition among teetotalers, which do not at once impinge upon the private habits of the followers. That is one great reason why governments have such a free hand in foreign affairs. Most of the frictions between two states involve a series of obscure and long-winded contentions, occasionally on the frontier, but far more often in regions about which school geographies have supplied no precise ideas. In Czechoslovakia, America is regarded as the liberator. In American newspaper paragraphs and musical comedy, in American conversation by and large, it has never been finally settled whether the country we liberated is Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia. In foreign affairs, the incidence of policy is for a very long time confined to an unseen environment. Nothing that happens out there is felt to be wholly real. And so, because in the antebellum period, nobody has to fight and nobody has to pay, governments go along according to their lights without much reference to their people. 
In local affairs the cost of a policy is more easily visible. And therefore, all but the most exceptional leaders prefer policies in which the costs are as far as possible indirect. They do not like direct taxation. They do not like pay as they go. They like long-term debts. They like to have the voters believe that the foreigner will pay. They have always been compelled to calculate prosperity in terms of the producer rather than in terms of the consumer because the incidence on the consumer is distributed over so many trivial items. Labor leaders have always preferred an increase of money wages to a decrease in prices. There has always been more popular interest in the profits of millionaires, which are visible but comparatively unimportant, than in the wastes of the industrial system, which are huge but elusive. A legislature dealing with a shortage of houses, such as exists when this is written, illustrates this rule, first by doing nothing to increase the number of houses, second by smiting the greedy landlord on the hip, third by investigating the profiteering builders and working men. A constructive policy deals with remote and uninteresting factors, while a greedy landlord or a profiteering plumber is visible and immediate. But while people will readily believe that in an unimagined future and in unseen places, a certain policy will benefit them, the actual working out of policy follows a different logic from their opinions. A nation may be induced to believe that jacking up the freight rates will make the railroads prosperous. But that belief will not make the roads prosperous if the impact of those rates on farmers and shippers is such as to produce a commodity price beyond what the consumer can pay. Whether the consumer will pay the price depends not upon whether he nodded his head nine months previously at the proposal to raise rates and save business, but on whether he now wants a new hat or a new automobile enough to pay for them. Leaders often pretend that they have merely uncovered a program which existed in the minds of their public. When they believe it, they are usually deceiving themselves. Programs do not invent themselves synchronously in a multitude of minds. That is not because a multitude of minds is necessarily inferior to that of the leaders, but because thought is the function of an organism, and a mass is not an organism. This fact is obscured because the mass is constantly exposed to suggestion. It reads not the news, but the news with an aura of suggestion about it, indicating the line of action to be taken. It hears reports, not objective as the facts are, but already stereotyped to a certain pattern of behavior. Thus, the ostensible leader often finds that the real leader is a powerful newspaper proprietor. But if, as in a laboratory, one could remove all suggestion and leading from the experience of a multitude, one would, I think, find something like this. A mass exposed to the same stimuli would develop responses, that could theoretically be charted in a polygon of error. There would be a certain group that felt sufficiently alike to be classified together. There would be variants of feeling at both ends. These classifications would tend to harden, as individuals in each of the classifications made their reactions vocal. That is to say, when the vague feelings of those who felt vaguely had been put into words, they would know more definitely what they felt, and would then feel it more definitely. Leaders in touch with popular feeling are quickly conscious of these reactions. They know that high prices are pressing upon the mass, or that certain classes of individuals are becoming unpopular, or that feeling towards another nation is friendly or hostile. But, always barring the effect of suggestion, which is merely the assumption of leadership by the reporter, there would be nothing in the feeling of the mass that fatally determine the choice of any particular policy. All that the feeling of the mass demands is that policy as it is developed and exposed shall be, if not logically, then by analogy and association, connected with the original feeling. So when a new policy is to be launched, there is a preliminary bid for community of feeling, as in Mark Antony's speech to the followers of Brutus, footnote, excellently analyzed in Martin, The Behavior of Crowds, pages 130 through 132. In the first phase, the leader vocalizes the prevalent opinion of the mass. He identifies himself with the familiar attitudes of his audience, sometimes by telling a good story, sometimes by brandishing his patriotism, often by pinching a grievance. Finding that he is trustworthy, the multitude milling hither and thither may turn in towards him. He will then be expected to set forth a plan of campaign. But he will not find that plan in the slogans which convey the feelings of the mass. 
it will not even always be indicated by them. Where the incidence of policy is remote, all that is essential is that the program shall be verbally and emotionally connected at the start with what has become vocal in the multitude. Trusted men in a familiar role, subscribing to the accepted symbols, can go a very long way on their own initiative without explaining the substance of their programs. But wise leaders are not content to do that. Provided they think publicity will not strengthen opposition too much, and that debate will not delay action too long, they seek a certain measure of consent. They take, if not the whole mass, then the subordinates of the hierarchy sufficiently into their confidence to prepare them for what might happen, and to make them feel that they have freely willed the result. But however sincere the leader may be, there is always, when the facts are very complicated, a certain amount of illusion in these consultations. For it is impossible that all the contingencies shall be as vivid to the whole public as they are to the more experienced and the more imaginative. A fairly large percentage are bound to agree without having taken the time, or without possessing the background, for appreciating the choices which the leader presents to them. No one, however, can ask for more, and only theorists do. If we have had our day in court, if what we had to say was heard, and then if what is done comes out well, most of us do not stop to consider how much our opinion affected the business in hand. And therefore, if the established powers are sensitive and well-informed, if they are visibly trying to meet popular feeling, and actually removing some of the causes of dissatisfaction, no matter how slowly they proceed, provided they are seen to be proceeding, then they have little to fear. It takes stupendous and persistent blundering plus almost infinite tactlessness to start a revolution from below. Palace revolutions and interdepartmental revolutions are a different matter. So, too, is demagogy. That stops at relieving the tension by expressing the feeling. But the statesman knows that such relief is temporary, and if indulged too often, unsanitary. Therefore, he sees to it that he arouses no feeling which he cannot sluice into a program that deals with the facts to which the feelings refer. But all leaders are not statesmen, all leaders hate to resign, and most leaders find it hard to believe that as bad as things are, the other fellow would not make them worse. They do not passively wait for the public to feel the incidence of policy, because the incidence of that discovery is generally upon their own heads. They are, therefore, intermittently engaged in mending their own fences and consolidating their position. The mending of fences consists in offering an occasional scapegoat, in redressing a minor grievance affecting a powerful individual or faction, rearranging certain jobs, placating a group of people who want an arsenal in their hometown, or a law to stop somebody's vices. Study the daily activity of any public official who depends on election, and you can enlarge this list. There are congressmen elected year after year who never think of dissipating their energy on public affairs. They prefer to do a little service for a lot of people on a lot of little subjects, rather than to engage in trying to do a big service out there in the void. But the number of people to whom any organization can be a successful valet is limited, and shrewd politicians take care to attend either the influential, or somebody so blatantly uninfluential that to pay any attention to him is a mark of sensational magnanimity. The far greater number who cannot be held by favors, the anonymous multitude, receive propaganda. The established leaders of any organization have great natural advantages. They are believed to have better sources of information. The books and papers are in their offices. They took part in the important conferences, met the important people, and have responsibility. It is, therefore, easier for them to secure attention and to speak in a convincing tone. But also, they have a very great deal of control over the access to the facts. Every official is in some degree a censor, and since no one can suppress information, either by concealing it or forgetting to mention it, without some notion of what he wishes the public to know, every leader is in some degree a propagandist. Strategically placed and compelled often to choose, even at the best, between the equally cogent though conflicting ideals of safety for the institution and candor to his public, the official finds himself deciding more and more consciously what facts, in what setting, in what guise, he shall permit the public to know. That the manufacture of consent is capable of great refinements no one, I think, denies. The process by which public opinions arise 
is certainly no less intricate than it has appeared in these pages, and the opportunities for manipulation open to anyone who understands the process are plain enough. The creation of consent is not a new art. It is a very old one, which was supposed to have died out with the appearance of democracy. But it has not died out, and has, in fact, improved enormously in technique, because it is now based on analysis rather than on rule of thumb. And so, as a result of psychological research, coupled with the modern means of communication, the practice of democracy has turned a corner. A revolution is taking place, infinitely more significant than any shifting of economic power. Within the life of the generation now in control of affairs, persuasion has become a self-conscious art and a regular organ of popular government. None of us begins to understand the consequences, but it is no daring prophecy to say that the knowledge of how to create consent will alter every political calculation and modify every political premise. Under the impact of propaganda, not necessarily in the sinister meaning of the word alone, the old constants of our thinking have become variables. It is no longer possible, for example, to believe in the original dogma of democracy, that the knowledge needed for the management of human affairs comes up spontaneously from the human heart. Where we act on that theory, we expose ourselves to self-deception and to forms of persuasion that we cannot verify. It has been demonstrated that we cannot rely upon intuition, conscience, or the accidents of casual opinion if we are to deal with the world beyond our reach. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter 16. The Self-Centered Man. Since public opinion is supposed to be the prime mover in democracies, one might reasonably expect to find a vast literature. One does not find it. There are excellent books on government and parties, that is, on the machinery which in theory registers public opinions after they are formed. But on the sources of which these public opinions arise, on the processes by which they are derived, there is relatively little. The existence of a force called public opinion is, in the main, taken for granted, and American political writers have been most interested either in finding out how to make government express the common will, or in how to prevent the common will from subverting the purposes for which they believe the government exists. According to their traditions, they have wished either to tame opinion or to obey it. Thus, the editor of a notable series of textbooks writes that, quote, the most difficult and most momentous question of government is how to transmit the force of individual opinion into public action, end quote. Footnote, Albert Bushnell Hart in the introductory note to A. Lawrence Lowell's Public Opinion and Popular Government. But surely there is a still more momentous question, the question of how to validate our private versions of the political scene. There is, as I shall try to indicate further on, the prospect of radical improvement by the development of principles already in operation. But this development will depend on how well we learn to use knowledge of the way opinions are put together, to watch over our own opinions when they are being put together. For casual opinion, being the product of partial contact, of tradition, and personal interests, cannot, in the nature of things, take kindly to a method of political thought which is based on exact record, measurement, analysis, and comparison. Just those qualities of the mind which determine what shall seem interesting, important, familiar, personal, and dramatic, are the qualities which in the first instance realistic opinion frustrates. Therefore, unless there is in the community at large a growing conviction that prejudice and intuition are not enough, the working out of realistic opinion, which takes time, money, labor, conscious effort, patience, and equanimity, will not find enough support. That conviction grows as self-criticism increases and makes us conscious of bunkum, contemptuous of ourselves when we employ it, and on guard to detect it. Without an ingrained habit of analyzing opinion when we read, talk, and decide, most of us would hardly suspect the need of better ideas, nor be interested in them when they appear, nor be able to prevent the new technique of political intelligence from being manipulated. Yet democracies, if we are to judge by the oldest and most powerful of them, 
have made a mystery out of public opinion. There have been skilled organizers of opinion who understood the mystery well enough to create majorities on election day. But these organizers have been regarded by political science as low fellows, or as problems, not as possessors of the most effective knowledge there was on how to create and operate public opinion. The tendency of the people who have voiced the ideas of democracy, even when they have not managed its action, the tendency of students, orators, editors, has been to look upon public opinion as men in other societies looked upon the uncanny forces to which they ascribed the last word in the direction of events. For in almost every political theory, there is an inscrutable element which in the heyday of that theory goes unexamined. Behind the appearances there is a fate, there are guardian spirits, or mandates to a chosen people, a divine monarchy, a vice-regent of heaven, or a class of the better born. The more obvious angels, demons, and kings are gone out of democratic thinking, but the need for believing that there are reserve powers of guidance persists. It persisted for those thinkers of the 18th century who designed the matrix of democracy. They had a pale god, but warm hearts, and in the doctrine of popular sovereignty, they found the answer to their need of an infallible origin for the new social order. There was the mystery, and only enemies of the people touched it with profane and curious hands. They did not remove the veil because they were practical politicians in a bitter and uncertain struggle. They had, themselves, felt the aspiration of democracy, which is ever so much deeper, more intimate, and more important than any theory of government. They were engaged, as against the prejudice of ages, in the assertion of human dignity. What possessed them was not whether John Smith had sound views on any public question, but that John Smith, scion of a stock that had always been considered inferior, would now bend his knee to no other man. It was this spectacle that made it bliss, quote, in that dawn to be alive, end quote. But every analyst seems to degrade that dignity, to deny that all men are reasonable all the time, or educated, or informed, to note that people are fooled, that they do not always know their own interests, and that all men are not equally fitted to govern. The critics were about as welcome as a small boy with a drum. Every one of these observations on the fallibility of man was being exploited ad nauseum. Had Democrats admitted there was truth in any of the aristocratic arguments, they would have opened a breach in the defenses. And so just as Aristotle had to insist that the slave was a slave by nature, the Democrats had to insist that the free man was a legislator and administrator by nature. They could not stop to explain that a human soul might not yet have, or indeed might never have, this technical equipment, and that nevertheless it had an inalienable right not to be used as the unwilling instrument of other men. The superior people were still too strong and too unscrupulous to have refrained from capitalizing so candid a statement. So the early Democrats insisted that a reason righteousness welled up spontaneously out of the mass of men. All of them hoped that it would, many of them believed that it did, although the cleverest, like Thomas Jefferson, had all sorts of private reservations. But one thing was certain, if public opinion did not come forth spontaneously, nobody in that age believed it would come forth at all. For in one fundamental respect, the political science on which democracy was based was the same science that Aristotle formulated. It was the same science for Democrat and Aristocrat, Royalist and Republican, in that its major premise assumed the art of government to be a natural endowment. Men differed radically when they tried to name the men so endowed, but they agreed in thinking that the greatest question of all was to find those in whom political wisdom was innate. Royalists were sure that kings were born to govern. Alexander Hamilton thought that while, quote, there are strong minds in every walk of life, the representative body, with too few exceptions to have any influence on the spirit of the government, will be composed of landholders, merchants, and men of the learned professions, end quote. Footnote, the Federalist, numbers 35 and 36. Also, comment by Henry Jones Ford in his Rise and Growth of American Politics, Chapter 5. Jefferson thought the political faculties were deposited by God in farmers and planters, and sometimes spoke as if they were found in all the people. Footnote, see below, page 268. The main premise was the same. To govern was an instinct that appeared, according to your social preferences, in one man or a chosen few, in all males, or only in males who were white and twenty-one, perhaps even in all men and all women. 
In deciding who was most fit to govern, knowledge of the world was taken for granted. The aristocrat believed that those who dealt with large affairs possessed the instinct. The democrats asserted that all men possessed the instinct and could therefore deal with large affairs. It was no part of political science in either case to think out how knowledge of the world could be brought to the ruler. If you were for the people, you did not try to work out the question of how to keep the voter informed. By the age of 21 he had his political faculties. What counted was a good heart, a reasoning mind, a balanced judgment. These would ripen with age, but it was not necessary to consider how to inform the heart and feed the reason. Men took in their facts as they took in their breath. But the facts men could come to possess in this effortless way were limited. They could know the customs and more obvious character of the place where they lived and worked. But the outer world they had to conceive, and they did not conceive it instinctively, nor absorb trustworthy knowledge of it just by living. Therefore, the only environment in which spontaneous politics were possible was one confined within the range of the ruler's direct and certain knowledge. There is no escaping this conclusion, wherever you found government on the natural range of men's faculties. If, as Aristotle said, Footnote, Politics, Book 7, Chapter 4. Quote, the citizens of a state are to judge and distribute offices according to merit, then they must know each other's characters. Where they do not possess this knowledge, both the election to offices and the decision of lawsuits will go wrong. End quote. Obviously, this maxim was binding upon every school of political thought. But it presented peculiar difficulties to the Democrats. Those who believed in class government could fairly claim that, in the court of the king, or in the country houses of the gentry, men did know each other's characters, and as long as the rest of mankind was passive, the only characters one needed to know were the characters of men in the ruling class. But the Democrats, who wanted to raise the dignity of all men, were immediately involved by the immense size and confusion of their ruling class, the male electorate. Their science told them that politics was an instinct, and that the instinct worked in a limited environment. Their hopes made them insist that all men in a very large environment could govern. In this deadly conflict between their ideals and their science, the only way out was to assume without much discussion that the voice of the people was the voice of God. The paradox was too great, the stakes too big, their ideal too precious for critical examination. They could not show how a citizen of Boston was to stay in Boston and conceive the views of a Virginian, how a Virginian in Virginia could have real opinions about the government at Washington, how congressmen in Washington could have opinions about China or Mexico. For in that day it was not possible for many men to have an unseen environment brought into the field of their judgment. There had been some advances, to be sure, since Aristotle. There were a few newspapers, and there were books, better roads perhaps, and better ships. But there was no great advance, and the political assumptions of the 18th century had essentially to be those that had prevailed in political science for 2,000 years. The pioneer Democrats did not possess the material for resolving the conflict between the known range of man's attention and their illimitable faith in his dignity. Their assumptions antedated not only the modern newspaper, the worldwide press services, photography and moving pictures, but what is really more significant, they antedated measurement and record, quantitative and comparative analysis, the canons of evidence, and the ability of psychological analysis to correct and discount the prejudices of the witness. I do not mean to say that our records are satisfactory, our analysis on bias, our measurements sound. I do mean to say that the key inventions have been made for bringing the unseen world into the field of judgment. They had not been made in the time of Aristotle, and they were not yet important enough to be visible for political theory in the age of Rousseau, Montesquieu, or Thomas Jefferson. In a later chapter, I think we shall see that even in the latest theory of human reconstruction, that of the English Guild Socialists, all the deeper premises have been taken over from this older system of political thought. That system, whenever it was competent and honest, had to assume that no man could have more than a very partial experience of public affairs. In the sense that he can give only a little time to them, that assumption is still true, and of the utmost consequence. But ancient theory was compelled to assume, not only that men could give little attention to public questions, but that the attention available would have to be confined to matters close at hand. It would have been visionary to suppose that a time would come, 
when distant and complicated events could conceivably be reported, analyzed, and presented in such a form that a really valuable choice could be made by an amateur. That time is now in sight. There is no longer any doubt that the continuous reporting of an unseen environment is feasible. It is often done badly, but the fact that it is done at all shows that it can be done, and the fact that we begin to know how badly it is often done shows that it can be done better. With varying degrees of skill and honesty, distant complexities are reported every day by engineers and accountants for businessmen, by secretaries and civil servants for officials, by intelligence officers for the general staff, by some journalists for some readers. These are crude beginnings, but radical, far more radical in the literal meaning of that word than the repetition of wars, revolutions, abdications, and restorations, as radical as the change in the scale of human life, which has made it possible for Mr. Lloyd George to discuss Welsh coal mining after breakfast in London and the fate of the Arabs before dinner in Paris. For the possibility of bringing any aspect of human affairs within the range of judgment breaks the spell which has been laid upon political ideas. There have, of course, been plenty of men who did not realize that the range of attention was the main premise of political science. They have built on sand. They have demonstrated in their own persons the effects of a very limited and self-centered knowledge of the world. But for the political thinkers who have counted, from Plato and Aristotle through Machiavelli and Hobbes, to the democratic theorists, speculation has revolved around the self-centered man who had to see the whole world by means of a few pictures in his head. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Public Opinion by Walter Littman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by the Progressing America Project. Public Opinion, Chapter Seventeen. The Self-Contained Community. That groups of self-centered people would engage in a struggle for existence if they rubbed against each other has always been evident. This much truth there is, at any rate, in that famous passage in the Leviathan where Hobbes says that, quote, though there had never been any time, where in particular men were in a condition of war against one another, yet at all times kings and persons of sovereign authority, because of their independency, are in continual jealousies and in the state and posture of gladiators, having their weapons pointing and their eyes fixed on one another, end quote. Footnote, Leviathan, chapter 13 of the natural condition of mankind as concerning their felicity and misery. To circumvent this conclusion, one great branch of human thought, which had and has many schools, proceeded in this fashion. It conceived an ideally just pattern of human relations in which each person had well-defined functions and rights. If he conscientiously filled the role allotted to him, it did not matter whether his opinions were right or wrong. He did his duty, the next man did his, and all the dutiful people together made a harmonious world. Every castle system illustrates this principle. You find it in Plato's Republic and in Aristotle, in the feudal idea, in the circles of Dante's paradise, in the bureaucratic type of socialism, and in laissez-faire, to an amazing degree in syndicalism, guild socialism, anarchism, and in the system of international law idealized by Mr. Robert Lansing. All of them assume a pre-established harmony, inspired, imposed, or innate, by which the self-opinionated person, class, or community is orchestrated with the rest of mankind. The more authoritarian imagine a conductor for the symphony, who sees to it that each man plays his part, the anarchistic are inclined to think that a more divine concord would be heard if each player improvised as he went along. But there have also been philosophers who were bored by these schemes of rights and duties, took conflict for granted, and tried to see how their side might come out on top. They have always seemed more realistic, even when they seemed alarming, because all they had to do was generalize the experience that nobody could escape. Machiavelli is the classic of this school, a man most mercilessly maligned, because he happened to be the first naturalist who used plain language, in a field hitherto preempted by supernaturalists. Footnote, F. S. Oliver, in his Alexander Hamilton, says of Machiavelli, page 174, Quote, assuming the conditions which exist, the nature of man and of things, to be unchangeable, he proceeds in a calm, unmoral way, like a lecturer on frogs, to show how a valiant and sagacious ruler 
can best turn events to his own advantage and the security of his dynasty. End quote. He has a worse name and more disciples than any political thinker who ever lived. He truly described the technique of existence for the self-contained state. That is why he has the disciples. He has the bad name chiefly because he cocked his eye at the Medici family, dreamed in his study at night where he wore his noble court dress, that Machiavelli was himself the prince, and turned a pungent description of the way things are done into a eulogy on that way of doing them. In his most infamous chapter, footnote, The Prince, chapter 18, concerning the way in which princes should keep faith, translation by W. K. Marriott, he wrote that, quote, a prince ought to take care that he never lets anything slip from his lips, that is not replete with the above-named five qualities, that he may appear to him who hears and sees him altogether merciful, faithful, humane, upright, and religious. There is nothing more necessary to appear to have than this last quality, inasmuch as men judge generally more by the eye than by the hand, because it belongs to everybody to see you, too few to come in touch with you. Everyone sees what you appear to be, few really know what you are, and those few dare not oppose themselves to the opinion of the many, who have the majesty of the state to defend them, and in the actions of all men, and especially of princes, which is not prudent to challenge, one judges by the result. One prince of the present time, whom it is not well to name, never preaches anything else but peace and good faith, and to both he is most hostile, and either, if he had kept it, would have deprived him of reputation and kingdom many a time. End quote. That is cynical, but it is the cynicism of a man who saw truly, without knowing quite why he saw what he saw. Machiavelli is thinking of the run of men and princes, quote, who judge generally more by the eye than by the hand, end quote, which is his way of saying that their judgments are subjective. He was too close to earth to pretend that the Italians of his day saw the world steadily and saw it whole. He would not indulge in fantasies, and he had not the materials for imagining a race of men that had learned how to correct their vision. The world, as he found it, was composed of people whose vision could rarely be corrected, and Machiavelli knew that such people, since they see all public relations in a private way, are involved in perpetual strife. What they see is their own personal, class, dynastic, or municipal version of affairs, that in reality extend far beyond the boundaries of their vision. They see their aspect, they see it as right, but they cross other people who are similarly self-centered. Then their very existence is endangered, or at least what they, for unsuspected private reasons, regard as their existence and take to be a danger. The end, which is impregnably based on a real though private experience, justifies the means. They will sacrifice any one of these ideals to save all of them. One judges by the result. These elemental truths confronted the democratic philosophers. Consciously or otherwise, they knew that the range of political knowledge was limited, that the area of self-government would have to be limited, and that self-contained states, when they rubbed against each other, were in the posture of gladiators. But they knew, just as certainly, that there was in men a will to decide their own fate, and to find a peace that was not imposed by force. How could they reconcile the wish and the fact? They looked about them. In the city-states of Greece and Italy they found a chronicle of corruption, intrigue, and war. Footnote. Quote, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. End quote. Madison, Federalist Number 10. In their own cities they saw faction, artificiality, fever. This was no environment in which the democratic ideal could prosper, no place where a group of independent and equally competent people managed their own affairs spontaneously. They looked further, guided somewhat perhaps by John Jack Rousseau, to remote, unspoiled country villages. They saw enough to convince themselves that there the ideal was at home. Jefferson in particular felt this, and Jefferson more than any other man formulated the American image of democracy. From the townships had come the power that had carried the American Revolution to victory. From the townships were to come the votes that carried Jefferson's party to power. Out there in the farming communities of Massachusetts and Virginia, if you wore glasses that obliterated the slaves, you could see with your mind's eye the image of what democracy was to be. Quote, the American Revolution broke out, end quote, says de Tocqueville, footnote, Democracy in America, volume 1, page 51, third edition. Quote, and the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people 
which had been nurtured in the townships, took possession of the state. End quote. It certainly took possession of the minds of those men who formulated and popularized the stereotypes of democracy. Quote, the cherishment of the people was our principle, wrote Jefferson, footnote, cited in Charles Beard, Economic Origins of Jeffersonian Democracy, Chapter 14. But the people he cherished almost exclusively were the small landowning farmers. Quote, Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire, which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. Corruption of morals in the mass of cultivators is a phenomenon of which no age nor nation has furnished an example. End quote. However much of the romantic return to nature may have entered into this exclamation, there was also an element of solid sense. Jefferson was right in thinking that a group of independent farmers comes nearer to fulfilling the requirements of spontaneous democracy than any other human society. But if you are to preserve the ideal, you must fence off these ideal communities from the abominations of the world. If the farmers are to manage their own affairs, they must confine affairs to those they are accustomed to managing. Jefferson drew all these logical conclusions. He disapproved of manufacture, of foreign commerce, and a navy, of intangible forms of property, and in theory of any form of government that was not centered in the small self-governing group. He had critics in his day. One of them remarked that, quote, wrapped up in the fullness of self-consequence and strong enough, in reality, to defend ourselves against every invader, we might enjoy an eternal rusticity and live, forever, thus apathized and vulgar under the shelter of a selfish, satisfied indifference, end quote. Footnote, cited above, page 426. The democratic ideal, as Jefferson molded it, consisted of an ideal environment and a selected class, did not conflict with the political science of his time. It did conflict with the realities. And when the ideal was stated in absolute terms, partly through exuberance and partly for campaign purposes, it was soon forgotten that the theory was originally devised for very special conditions. It became the political gospel, and supplied the stereotypes through which Americans of all parties have looked at politics. That gospel was fixed by the necessity that in Jefferson's time, no one could have conceived public opinions that were not spontaneous and subjective. The democratic tradition is therefore always trying to see a world where people are exclusively concerned with affairs of which the causes and effects all operate within the region they inhabit. Never has democratic theory been able to conceive itself in the context of a wide and unpredictable environment. The mirror is concave. And although Democrats recognize that they are in contact with external affairs, they see quite surely that every contact outside that self-contained group is a threat to democracy as originally conceived. That is a wise fear. If democracy is to be spontaneous, the interests of democracy must remain simple, intelligible, and easily managed. Conditions must approximate those of the isolated rural township if the supply of information is to be left to casual experience. The environment must be confined within the range of every man's direct and certain knowledge. The Democrat has understood what an analysis of public opinion seems to demonstrate, that in dealing with an unseen environment decisions, quote, are manifestly settled at haphazard, which clearly they ought not to be, end quote. Footnote Aristotle Politics, Book 7, Chapter 4. So he has always tried, in one way or another, to minimize the importance of that unseen environment. He feared foreign trade because trade involves foreign connections. He distrusted manufacturers because they produced big cities and collected crowds. If he had nevertheless to have manufacturers, he wanted protection in the interest of self-sufficiency. When he could not find these conditions in the real world, he went passionately into the wilderness and founded utopian communities far from foreign contacts. His slogans reveal his prejudice. He is for self-government, self-determination, independence. Not one of these ideas carries with it any notion of consent or community beyond the frontiers of the self-governing groups. The field of democratic action is a circumscribed area. Within protected boundaries, the aim has been to achieve self-sufficiency and avoid entanglement. This rule is not confined to foreign policy, but it is plainly evident there, because life outside the national boundaries is more distinctly alien than any life within. 
And as history shows, democracies in their foreign policy have had generally to choose between splendid isolation and a diplomacy that violated their ideals. The most successful democracies, in fact, Switzerland, Denmark, Australia, New Zealand, and America until recently, have had no foreign policy in the European sense of that phrase. Even a rule like the Monroe Doctrine arose from the desire to supplement the two oceans by a glacis of states that were sufficiently republican to have no foreign policy. Whereas danger is a great, perhaps an indispensable condition of autocracy, footnote, Fisher Ames, frightened by the democratic revolution of 1800, wrote to Rufus King in 1802, quote, We need, as all nations do, the compression on the outside of our circle of a formidable neighbor, whose presence shall at all times excite stronger fears than demagogues can inspire the people with towards their government. End quote. Footnote, cited by Ford, Rise and Growth of American Politics, page 69. Security was seen to be a necessity if democracy was to work. There must be as little disturbance as possible of the premise of a self-contained community. Insecurity involves surprises. It means that there are people acting upon your life, over whom you have no control, with whom you cannot consult. It means that forces are at large which disturb the familiar routine, and present novel problems about which quick and unusual decisions are required. Every Democrat feels in his bones that dangerous crises are incompatible with democracy, because he knows that the inertia of masses is such, that to act quickly a very few must decide and the rest follow rather blindly. This has not made non-resistance out of Democrats, but it has resulted in all democratic wars being fought for pacifist aims. Even when the wars are in fact wars of conquest, they are sincerely believed to be wars in defense of civilization. These various attempts to enclose a part of the Earth's surface were not inspired by cowardice, apathy, or what one of Jefferson's critics called a willingness to live under monkish discipline. The Democrats had caught sight of a dazzling possibility that every human being should rise to his full stature, freed from man-made limitations. With what they knew of the art of government, they could, no more than Aristotle before them, conceive a society of autonomous individuals except an enclosed and simple one. They could, then, select no other premise if they were to reach the conclusion that all the people could spontaneously manage their public affairs. Having adopted the premise because it was necessary to their keenest hope, they drew other conclusions as well. Since in order to have spontaneous self-government, you had to have a simple self-contained community, they took it for granted that one man was as competent as the next to manage these simple and self-contained affairs. Where the wish is father to the thought, such logic is convincing. Moreover, the doctrine of the omnipotent citizen is for most practical purposes true in the rural township. Everybody in a village sooner or later tries his hand at everything the village does. There is rotation in office by men who are jacks of all trades. There was no serious trouble with the doctrine of the omnipotent citizen until the democratic stereotype was universally applied, so that men looked at a complicated civilization and saw an enclosed village. Not only was the individual citizen fitted to deal with all public affairs, but he was consistently public-spirited and endowed with unflagging interest. He was public-spirited enough in the township where he knew everybody and was interested in everybody's business. The idea of enough for the township turned easily into the idea of enough for any purpose, for as we have noted, quantitative thinking does not suit a stereotype. But there was another turn to the circle. Since everybody was assumed to be interested enough in important affairs, only those affairs came to seem important in which everybody was interested. This meant that men formed their picture of the world outside, from the unchallenged pictures in their heads. These pictures came to them well stereotyped by their parents and teachers, and were little corrected by their own experience. Only a few men had affairs that took them across state lines, even fewer had reason to go abroad. Most voters lived their whole lives in one environment, and with nothing but a few feeble newspapers, some pamphlets, political speeches, their religious training, and rumor to go on, they had to conceive that larger environment of commerce and finance, of war and peace. The number of public opinions based on any objective report was very small, in proportion to those based on casual fancy. And for so many different reasons, self-sufficiency was a spiritual idea in the formative period. The physical isolation of the township, the loneliness of the pioneer, the theory of democracy, 
the Protestant tradition, and the limitations of political science all converged, to make men believe that out of their own consciences they must extricate political wisdom. It is not strange that the deduction of laws from absolute principles should have usurped so much of their free energy. The American political mind had to live on its capital. In legalism, it found a tested body of rules from which new rules could be spun, without the labor of earning new truths from experience. The formula became so curiously sacred that every good foreign observer has been amazed at the contrast between the dynamic practical energy of the American people and the static theorism of their public life. That steadfast love of fixed principles was simply the only way known of achieving self-sufficiency. But it meant that the public opinions of any one community about the outer world consisted chiefly of a few stereotyped images arranged in a pattern, deduced from their legal and their moral codes, and animated by the feeling aroused by local experiences. Thus democratic theory, starting from its fine vision of ultimate human dignity, was forced by lack of the instruments of knowledge for reporting its environment, to fall back upon the wisdom and experience which happened to have accumulated in the voter. God had, in the words of Jefferson, made men's breasts, quote, his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue, end quote. These chosen people in their self-contained environment had all the facts before them. The environment was so familiar that one could take it for granted that men were talking about substantially the same things. The only real disagreements, therefore, would be in judgments about the same facts. There was no need to guarantee the sources of information. They were obvious and equally accessible to all men. Nor was there need to trouble about the ultimate criteria. In the self-contained community one could assume, or at least did assume, a homogeneous code of morals. The only place, therefore, for differences of opinion was in the logical application of accepted standards to accepted facts. And since the reasoning faculty was also well standardized, an error in reasoning would be quickly exposed in a free discussion. It followed that truth could be obtained by liberty within these limits. The community could take its supply of information for granted, its codes it passed on through the school, church, and family, and the power to draw deductions from a premise, rather than the ability to find the premise, was regarded as the chief end of intellectual training. End of chapter 17